The Hungry Moon by Ramsey Campbell. Copyright 1986 by Ramsey Campbell. Narrated by Madeline Bazard. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Annotation A Tale of Horror and the Supernatural set in the small, bleak town of Moonwell in northern England. A band of druids provoke an evangelical crusade that rouses the druid's moon god to rise from his cave toward a modern missile base. From there, the druids plan to wreak havoc on the human race. Some strong language and some descriptions of sex. 1986 From the Book Jacket On the bleak moors of northern England, in the shadow of a modern missile base, the town of Moonwell falls victim to its bloody druid legacy. When American-born Diana Kramer comes to Moonwell to teach at the local village school, it's just a sleepy tourist town. But as quickly as the mist rolls in from the moors above the town, the arrival of Godwin Mann, a charismatic evangelist, transforms peaceful Moonwell into a camp divided. As neighbor turns against neighbor, the evil druid moon god, trapped in a cave on the moors, grows in strength, waiting to reap its revenge upon mankind. Are the townspeople mesmerized with religious fervor, basking in the light of God, or are they dwelling in the shadow of evil? Ramsey Campbell, master of spine-tingling horror, stamps your passport for a journey into the frightening primeval world of the human imagination. Here, evil, both natural and supernatural, peoples the landscape. Even in the light of day, Campbell's skillfully crafted thriller proves that the darker side of human nature can be just as horrifying as the terrors that call to us from our nightmares. About the author, Ramsey Campbell is the author of the highly acclaimed novels Obsession and Incarnate, as well as the short story collection Dark Companions. He has won more awards for horror fiction than any other writer living today. His home is in England. Other books by Ramsey Campbell. Novels. The Nameless. The Parasite. The Doll Who Ate His Mother. The Face That Must Die. Short Stories. The Inhabitant of the Lake. Demons by Daylight. The Height of the Scream. Cold Print. Anthologies. Super Horror. The Far Reaches of Fear. New Terrors. New Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos. The Gruesome Book Dedication For Stephen Joe, Stalwarts of Fantasy Acknowledgements As usual, I owe most to my wife, Jenny, who helped the book take shape as I wrote it and kept an eye on the continuity. Jean Hill accompanied me to a Billy Graham rally in Liverpool, but I proved to be in no danger of succumbing. Indeed, the unexpectedly low-key preaching was received with a good deal of Liverpudlian skepticism by the congregation. Stan Ambrose of BBC Radio Merseyside's folk scene authenticated Harry Mooney, a song that appears to conflate several different Peak District folk traditions. And I mustn't forget Phil Booth, who sent me a jigsaw to keep me occupied while I searched for words, and the inventor, inventors of the compact disc, whose music helps me not to stray from my desk. The human race has a terminal disease called sin. Billy Graham Go down, Harry Mooney, harry us no more. We flowers to please you, to leave at your door. Old Derbyshire Street Song Sustolere monstra, quibus hominum oxudere religiosissimum, erat. Mondi vero etiam saluberimum, the elder Pliny on the Druids. To fear the moon, to feed her as she must be fed, and never to look upon her feeding. Druidic triad quoted by Posidonius. 1. Nick Reed stepped out of the newspaper building into the deserted Manchester street and wondered what the silence reminded him of. He took a cool breath of early morning air and stretched, wincing at the bruises he'd brought back with his report from the picketing. An unanswered phone rang in an office on Deansgate. A single car cruised past the department stores on Piccadilly, sending pigeons up from the roadway to wheel above the gable windows. 
It ran his fingers through his crinkly hair and tried to let the silence be itself. It couldn't be important to remember. He just wanted to wake up so as to drive home and sleep. He glanced up as sunlight snatched at the steep roofs through a gap in the clouds that were rushing a storm toward the peaks. Memory seized him then. It felt as though by the scruff of his aching neck. Diana, he gasped, and then he realized what else was wrong. He limped into the building, across the lobby that turned his footsteps high-pitched, up the stairs to the library. The blank gray screens of microfilm readers gleamed dully under the tubular lighting of the small white room. He ought to call Diana. He couldn't even remember how long it had been, but surely there was no need to wake her up. He began to leaf through the file of the last few weeks' issues, looking for the article about the peaks. He found it in last Monday's issue, one of Charlie Nesbitt's pleas to the readers not to take their holidays abroad when Britain had so much to offer. It read as Charlie sounded in the pub at lunchtime, poking the stem of his pipe at his listeners or puffing at it whenever he made a point he regarded as unanswerable. The Peak District is our oldest landscape, God's gift to walkers but still unspoiled by tourism. Nick scanned the paragraphs that listed places to visit, then reread the article slowly, hoping he was wrong. But he hadn't missed anything. There was no mention of Moonwell. He made himself remember his first sight of the small town, the empty streets, the singing on the moors above. He was tired. That was why he was having trouble remembering. But had Charlie been tired, too? Unless he came in unusually early, Nick wouldn't know for hours. He had to know. He limped back to the office next to the library, through the maze of glass cubicles, to wait at his desk. An office boy dropped the morning edition on the desk and woke Nick from dozing. His report had been edited, even though he hadn't said that the police had seemed to resent his presence as much as the pickets had. Some of the feature writers were at their desks now, but there was still no sign of Charlie Nesbitt. He was probably at breakfast, Nick thought, and grabbed the phone. Charlie's wife answered. Just a minute, she said curtly, and stifled the receiver with her hand. Beyond it, Nick heard her complaining. That's the sort of thing I mean. And then the receiver fell on wood. There was a muffled argument before Charlie demanded, Well, what's so important that it can't wait until I've finished eating? Charlie, it's Nick Reed. Sorry for interrupting. Glad you did, to tell you the truth. What can I do for you? For a moment, Nick didn't know. And remembering felt like starting awake. This may seem an odd question, but was the article you wrote about the peaks subbed at all? Not anywhere it mattered, no. He sounded amused. Why, have they been toning you down again? Not more than usual. No, I was asking because you didn't mention Moonwell. Where? Moonwell. You know, the place where I ran into all that religious hysteria. Even you thought they were going a bit far when I told you about it. Good God, son, are you still riding that hobby horse? Can't you leave people's beliefs alone? There's few enough beliefs around these days. It isn't up to us to shatter them. He snorted and went on. Anyway, we've got a bad line here. It sounds as if you keep saying moon well. That's right. It used to be the old Roman lead mine where they decorate the cave every year, or they did until this year. Come on, Charlie, you must remember that. I'll tell you what, Sonny. I've been at the paper a good few years longer than you, and it's been a bloody long time since anyone's accused me of not doing it properly, or had reason to. Now, I don't know what bee you've got in your bonnet this time, but you've caught me in the middle of an argument, and I'm not about to get into another. Just take it from me. There's never been a place called Moonwell in the peaks. There is. I've been there, Nick wanted to shout, but Charlie had cut him off. Nick replaced the receiver, trying to stay calm, and reached in his jacket for his address book. Had he called Charlie in order to postpone calling Diana? What was he afraid to hear? Perhaps only the sound that greeted him when he dialed her number— the dull, high-pitched tone that meant it was unobtainable. The exchange could be busy, he told himself, and called the operator. Moonwell, he said, and when she came back to check, Moonwell and Derbyshire. Finally, he spelled the name for her. I'm sorry, sir, she said, 
There's nowhere of that name. Nick stared at the Moonwell number written in Diana's handwriting, saw the notebook tremble as his arm propped on its elbow wavered. All right, he said, feeling oddly calm, as if now that his unstated fears were realized, he would know what to do. It wasn't until he reached the stairs that he began to run. Rain speckled the pavements and showered his face lightly as he ran to the car park. When he climbed into the Citroën, he felt as if he'd gone past needing sleep, though his glimpse of himself as he adjusted the driving mirror didn't look entirely convinced. His large, dark, humorous eyes gazing out of his round face with its prominent cheekbones, broad nose and mouth, squarish chin that never seemed to have been shaved quite closely enough. He started the car and drove toward the edge of Manchester. The Stockport Road was full of lorries heading for the peaks. Once a Boy Scout band held up the traffic for five minutes, and Nick lost count of the number of traffic lights that turned red just as he was approaching. Outside Stockport and the Manchester boundary, the small towns began, narrow, winding streets, terraces crammed with houses. Here and there, one side of the street was occupied by a factory to let, the long, blank limestone wall yellow as clay in the rain. Old folk in dusty cars pottered along the middle of the road, slowing for pedestrian crossings even when nobody was near, and Nick felt as if he would never reach the peaks that rose above the slate roofs. Then the road straightened and widened for a few yards at the edge of a town, and he trod hard on the pedal. Overtaking four slow cars, he raced toward the moors. The gentle slopes glowed half a dozen shades of patchy green beneath the glum sky. Heather flared purple. Limestone edges tore through the green. Spiky dry stone walls divided the rounded slopes like old diagrams of the human cranium. As the narrowing road wound higher, shrinking to a car's width wherever it crossed a river, the walls beside the verges fell away. A car had crashed through an arrowed barrier at a sharp bend and was rusting fifty feet below the road. Soon the barriers gave out, and only ditches separated the road from the steepening uplands, where sheep ripped up the tussocky grass and stared yellow-eyed at Nick's car. He hadn't seen a house or a signpost for miles when he realized that he no longer knew where he was going. He stopped the car on a level stretch of road and switched off the engine. The side windows were printed with dots and dashes of rain, which smudged the peaks ahead. The windscreen wipers thumped and squeaked repetitively as he reached for the AA book and turned to the Peak District road map. Eventually, he closed the book on his forefinger and turned, frowning, to the index. Mooncoin, moon, moonsy, he read, and searched up and down the column in case the name was out of order. It was there, he told himself fiercely, opening the book again at the map. He could locate himself, roughly on the page, where the main roads were fewest and farthest apart. The green blotch beside the Sheffield Road must be the forested slopes ahead. He swiveled the book and moved his head as if he could rid himself of the blind spot that way. A sense that the name was there on the page, if only he could see it, made him want to cry out, lash out, anything to break the spell. He closed his eyes, in case relaxing was the answer. Suddenly... He didn't even know what he'd been looking for. He lashed out blindly and punched the horn, which blared thinly at the deserted road. Diana, he shouted, his voice flat and trapped in the car. Diana from Moonwell, and remembered her long black hair whipping in the wind across the moors, her pale tapering face, wide greenish eyes. The memory broadened for an instant, and he recalled the day he'd met her remembered driving away from Moonwell through the old forest beyond the pines. Yes, he breathed. He started the car and drove into the rain that pelted the roof and blotted out the peaks. He had to trust his feeling that the forest ahead was the one he remembered, had to trust that his instincts had guided him right so far. The pines rose above him until the slope to which they clung in their thousands was almost vertical, and he thought of a green army giant arrows in the quiver of the limestone, green missiles. He almost drove past the road that plunged into the forest through a stony gap, its steepy, mossy walls streaming. The trees closed overhead and cut off the sound of rain, as if he'd driven into a tunnel. He switched off the wipers and was alone with the hum of the engine. 
Now and then a garbage of rain slipped through the branches overhead and spattered the windscreen, though he couldn't see the sky. Relaxation and the green dimness must be lulling him, for he didn't notice when the pines gave way to oak and ash. The road, having sloped down into the woods, was rising as the trees crowded closer. Either clouds or branches were massing overhead. The road had grown so dim that he switched on his headlights. The ranks of trees beyond the beams made him think of cave walls, their trunks, stone ridges, dripping. He kept his gaze ahead, watching for the sky. He'd be out of the forest any moment now, if it was the right forest. Surely it was. Exhaustion must be stretching time for him. He trod harder on the accelerator, gripped the wheel, eyes burning as he kept his gaze from straying to the moist, dark walls. Trees, really. Suddenly they fell away and he was out beneath the tattered racing sky. The unfenced road led up toward a skyline strewn with rocks, a backbone spiky as a dinosaur's. Beyond it, he remembered now, the land fell steeply on the left toward overgrown chunks of rock, large as cars. Once he reached the crest, he would be able to see Moonwell above the dry valley, the single road beyond the town leading up to the moor. Yet he lifted his foot from the accelerator as the car surged forward, for he had an unsettling impression that the rushing clouds had come to a standstill overhead. He ought to get to Moonwell before his exhaustion played any more tricks, if that was what was happening. Above all, he wanted to see Diana, make sure she was safe. Fast, but not too fast, he told himself, and pressed the pedal gently. There was no sound of traffic ahead. He'd switched off the headlights and was pressing the pedal more confidently at the moment when both car and landscape vanished into the blind dark. earlier that year. Two. As soon as Diana's class were together on the moor, they began to clamor to go to the cave. Now that they were out of sight of the school, they obviously felt freer to be themselves. Red-haired Thomas telling feeble jokes to make his cronies giggle, Sally pushing her taped spectacles higher on her nose and blinking like a grandmother, advising her friend Jane to keep hold of her hand. Ronnie even slipped a catapult out of the pocket of the baggy trousers he'd inherited from his brother, until Diana gave him a warning glance. We'll have to see if we've time for the cave, she told the forty-three of them. Now remember, we want to see lots of work in your workbooks. So Mr. and Mrs. Scragg will know we've been working, Jane said, so they can see what a good class you are. Maybe they were as streetwise in their way as the kids she'd taught in New York. They'd need to be when they went up to Mrs. Scragg's class, quite a few of them after the summer vacation. Kids were tough, she told herself, but when she thought of putting any child into Mrs. Scragg's hands for three years, sometimes she wanted to weep. The sky was clearing. The burst of May sunlight seemed to rearrange the landscape, opened out the moors and underlined the dry stone walls with shadow tinged clouds on the horizon green to show that they were peaks threaded with glinting streams. The sounds of the town had already fallen behind, and the two main Manchester-Sheffield roads, between which Moonwell was the only town for miles, were out of sight as well as hearing. Diana stood for a moment, her hands in the pockets of her zippered cardigan, the sun on her face. The silent brightening of the landscape felt like her first sight of Moonwell, her sense of having come home. When clouds hid the sun, her hands wanted to pull the overcast apart, but she held them out to the children instead. Who remembers what I told you about sunshine? Dozens of hands went up with cries of, Miss me, miss! She was hoping Andrew Bevan might respond, but he was hiding behind Sally's and Jane's mothers, who were helping supervise the outing. Is that hand up or down, Sally? Diana said. Up, miss, Sally protested, sounding hurt, and had to grab her precarious spectacles. Miss, you said there's less sunshine here than anywhere else in England. Right, because of the clouds and the mists, and that's why you must never— Come on now, you all know this. Go on the moors without a grown-up, they said in a ragged chorus. You said it. Remember, people have got lost on the moors for days. Now, let's find somewhere you can sit and work, and we'll see how the afternoon goes. 
She led them up the grassy path to a bank where they could sit in groups in the midst of the heather. She chatted to the mothers and unobtrusively watched the children work. The landscape kept drawing her gaze. The miles of heather and bunched grass, the unearthly sameness, broken only by an infrequent dry stone wall or a dried-up stream bed, the color and cracked texture of burnt cork. The lonely whisper of grass, the flight of a single bird. The path would lead you downward so imperceptibly that you mightn't notice when the peak sank out of sight, leaving you only the horizon of the moor. The slopes brightened again, and Diana felt as if she'd made that happen by watching. Perhaps she felt so much at home because her family had originally come from the peak district, though now she had no family at all. Soon all the children had filled a page or more with writing and drawing. Andrew's picture of a bunch of heather was out of proportion but colorful. That's good, Andrew, she said, to stop him from scribbling it out, and praised the others wherever she could. She smiled then at all their eager faces. Okay, now I want you all to stay behind me and hold your partner's hand. As she led them to where the path forked, slopes raised themselves ahead like giants awakening. One branch of the path led up over the moors. The other followed the edge above Moonwell, past the cave that apparently had given the town its name. For hundreds of yards around the bowl of barren land that sloped down to the cave, the moors were threadbare, grass and heather giving way to bare gritstone. She went up to the edge of the bowl and held up one hand to stay the children. This is as far as we go. Two hundred yards away, at the center of the stony bowl, the cave gaped. Presumably, someone had once thought it looked wide or deep enough to lose the moon in. It was really a pothole fifty feet wide at the mouth and surrounded by a dry stone wall. The first time she'd come here, she had stepped over the wall, only to discover that even at high noon in summer you couldn't see bottom. Walls that looked smooth and slippery as tallow plunged straight into darkness, whose chill seemed to reach out of the bowl to where she stood now. Though she understood that eventually the shaft bent, as far as her emotions were concerned, it might as well go straight down forever— even though the children were safe beyond the edge of the bowl, she couldn't help wishing she hadn't brought them there. Never go any farther than this, okay, she said, and waited until they all promised. They started shouting then, trying to make the cave echo. Some voices made a noise down there, not all. Diana assumed it had to do with pitch. She watched Ronnie wondering if he could get away with a shot from his catapult, and she was about to wag a finger at him when Sally's mother cried, Andrew! Diana swung round, fearing the worst. But Andrew had only strayed back toward the path, and was stooping over something that had crawled away from the bowl. Children crowded round him. Yuck! It's a lizard! Sally squeaked. Jane stepped back with a cry of disgust. It hasn't got any eyes! As Diana hurried after the rest of her class to see, Andrew stepped forward and trod heavily on the creature, ground his heel into it, and looked round as if he hoped the other children would be impressed but they shuddered away from him. It must have come out of the cave, Diana said, glancing at the mess of white skin and innards. A pity you trod on it, Andrew. It's very unusual for anything like that to come into the open. Never mind, she said quickly, for the boy's mouth was trembling. While we're here, you can tell us how you helped to dress the cave. His small, thin, pale face with its hint of eyebrows looked resentful. I make a bit of a picture with flowers, he muttered, as if he hoped nobody would hear. You use petals, don't you? And then your piece and all the others fit together like a jigsaw. Throughout the peaks, towns decorated wells with pictures made of flowers and vegetation, a tradition that combined paganism and Christianity in thanksgiving for the water that had stayed fresh during the plague and the Black Death. Watching the townsfolk carrying floral panels big as doors up from Moonwell to fit together at the cave last Midsummer Eve, Diana had felt as if she'd stepped back in time, into a calm that the world was losing. But Thomas was whispering, Petals, nudging his friends and sniggering, and Diana found that she didn't feel calm so close to the gaping cave. I think it's time we headed back, she said. Tense all round, Andrew muttered, and pretended he hadn't spoken. 
He was right, Diana saw. The tents on the slopes above and below Moonwell made a ring around the cave and the town. Campers and walkers kept Moonwell going now that the lead mines were exhausted, concrete lids covering the abandoned shafts on the moor. The path led back to the edge of the moor, and suddenly there was the town between a chapel and a church, tiers of limestone terraces like one side of an amphitheater, the murmur of small-town traffic. Diana led her class down the nearest zigzag path and along the high street, past townsfolk gossiping on street corners, greeting her and the children. Her class fell silent as they reached the stony schoolyard with a few minutes to spare before the final bell. Mr. Scragg was in his office, caning a boy taller than he was. Some of Diana's class tittered nervously at the sight of the headmaster standing on a chair. Sally's and Jane's mothers stayed outside the gates and looked away. Diana herded the children to her classroom just as the bell rang. Hush now until you're out of the building, she told them, and headed for the staff room. The air in the small, dingy room was laden with stale smoke from Mrs. Scragg's cigarettes. Mrs. Scragg was sitting in her armchair, which looked too small for her large bones. She thrust her broad red face, whose upper lip was even redder from plucking a mustache, at Diana in her pugilistic way that often reduced children to tears. Found your way back safe, did you, Miss Kramer? Here's someone you ought to remember. I hope Miss Kramer's pupils aren't getting used to having everything their own way, said the woman in the other armchair, tipping a bottle into a baby's mouth. Now I'm not here to deal with them. I'm sure Miss Kramer knows what we expect by now, Mrs. Hallowell. You can bet on that, Diana said sweetly, and went to her locker. Childbirth hadn't improved Mrs. Hallowell's view of children, it seemed. Best to leave before she had to bite her tongue, Diana thought, and was closing her locker when Mr. Scragg came in. His face looked flushed from the caning. He kicked the door shut with his heel and brandished a magazine at the women, glaring at it from beneath his bristling gray eyebrows. Look at this muck I found in Cox's desk. He won't be holding anything before he goes to bed tonight, I promise you. From that bookshop, I suppose, Mrs. Scragg said without looking. What else can you expect from people who'd sell books in a church? A pity the town didn't listen to me while they could. There's a good few regret letting them move in there now that it's too late. Too many strangers moving in, if you ask me, Mrs. Hallowell complained, and Diana felt her glare on the back of her neck. No wonder there's so much vandalism and theft all of a sudden, and those hippies squatting in the holiday cottages, filthy creatures. God forgive me, but I wouldn't have minded if they'd poisoned themselves to death with their drugs. I wouldn't have taken you for a native with that Irish accent of yours, Diana thought of saying to Mrs. Scragg. Modern times get in everywhere, she said, meaning to joke. Not in this town, they don't. They're far enough away that we can see them coming. Here, I'll show you what we think of them. Mrs. Scragg took the magazine from her husband as if she were holding a soiled diaper. It was a Wonder Woman, Diana saw, just like the comics she'd read in her childhood, metal bra and all. Mrs. Scragg ground her cigarette into the face of the woman on the cover, dragged the red-hot tip over the glossy paper until the scandally-clad figure was crossed out. Clear enough? You can tell your friends at the bookshop that's what we think of anyone who sells muck to innocents. I don't think the booths even sell comics, Diana said, but she might as well not have spoken. Excuse me now, would you? She hurried out of the stale room along the shiny, bilious corridor past her empty classroom. All she could do was as much as she could, she told herself, not just educate the children, but strengthen their resilience, prepare them for years alone with the Scrags. Except how could she prepare children like Andrew? She stepped out of the school and lifted her face to the sun. More and more, since she'd come to Moonwell, she felt there was something else she could do— if she could only think what it was. Three. Business was slack at Booth's books, despite all the unfamiliar faces the summer had brought to the town, and so Geraldine strolled along to the Bevan's shop. June Bevan was vacuuming the display of rucksacks and primus stoves and climbing gear, her long brownish hair with its hints of gray swinging lankly beside her face. She straightened up, 
round-shouldered still. Jerry, tell me you've just come for a chat. You mustn't let Andrew take advantage of you. I'm going past the school anyway, Geraldine lied. It's no trouble. Well, it's very kind of you to say so. We do appreciate you and your husband taking so much interest in him. I hope he says so if he ever speaks up for himself. He's quite chatty when you get to know him. Really? I mustn't know him very well, then. June's small, crowded face with its prominent cheekbones went blank. Anyway, I better hadn't keep you or we'll have him hanging round outside the school making people think nobody wants him. Somebody does, Geraldine thought, and you should, but she shouldn't be so quick to judge. The Bevans had befriended her and Jeremy when Mrs. Scragg at the school was trying to turn people against them, circulating a petition against letting the deconsecrated chapel be used as a bookshop. Some of those who hadn't signed seemed to feel guilty now, even if they didn't go to church, especially those who had children in Mrs. Scragg's class. Geraldine was tempted to have a showdown with a woman, but not now, not in front of Andrew. She made her way to the school along the high street, past shops displaying clothes and wool and local artists' paintings and fossils gathered on the peaks. Andrew was lurking behind the stone gatepost, chewing his nails to clean them. He stuffed his hands into the pockets of his long gray flannel shorts and looked away from Geraldine in order to smile at her. "'You look good and grubby,' she said. He glanced down at his grimy legs and fallen socks, and seemed to shrink into himself. Don't worry, you'll wash, she said, taking his hand. Any eight-year-old should be dirty and untidy and tired by the end of the day. Jonathan would have been. But it was wrong to think about him while she was with Andrew. Aren't you talking to me today, she said. Yes, he said with a shaky laugh, but that was all until they came in sight of his parents' shop. His thin, pale face kept glancing at her when he thought she wasn't looking, and he didn't notice the horse's turd at the edge of the pavement until he trod in it. Fucking bother, he muttered, and flinched automatically. Geraldine managed to keep her face straight and look as if she'd heard nothing special. She held his elbow while he scraped his sole on the curb. As she let go, he blurted, I like being in Miss Kramer's class. I wish I could be forever. I'm sure she'd like you to be, Andrew, Geraldine said, and couldn't think what else to say. She opened the door of Bevan's for him, to June's cry of, Just look at you! Where on earth have you been? She gave June a placatory look and went on to the bookshop. The seventeenth-century nonconformist chapel had fallen out of use twenty years ago, but had only recently been deconsecrated. It had seemed a perfect setting for the bookshop she and Jeremy had had to move from Sheffield when the mounting rates had forced them out, especially since living quarters were already built onto the chapel. But as if the undercurrent of righteousness among the townsfolk hadn't been enough, Geraldine thought wryly, they'd had to employ Benedict Eddings to help them convert the chapel. Jeremy was failing to reach Benedict by phone as Geraldine went in. You might tell him the alarm went off again at three o'clock this morning, he said, tugging at the black beard that covered his face from his cheekbones down. I really would be grateful if he'd give us a call as soon as he gets in. He put down the receiver and beamed at Geraldine, crinkles spreading from his large blue eyes across his square face under his high, balding forehead. No need for me to give his wife a hard time on his behalf. He gave her a tame bear hug and said, almost too gently and casually, How was Andrew? Better than sometimes. I should have brought him to choose another book. She disengaged herself eventually, feeling somewhat overwhelmed by Jeremy's hidden concern for her. If she were going to break, she would have done so years ago. Jonathan was somewhere. That was all that mattered, perhaps only in her imagination or somewhere like an endless dream. Come on, let's fix that shelf, she said. When they'd secured the bookcase that had begun to sag away from the wall the day after Eddings had built it, she replaced the books while Jeremy made dinner. Halfway through dinner, in the small white dining room with its view of the heathery slopes, they heard the Bevans come home. June was still scolding Andrew. Just you get upstairs and make sure the water's hot. What must Geraldine have thought of you, looking like a little tramp? 
Have some thought for me if you've none for yourself. I won't be used like that, Geraldine said with an edge to her voice. But telling June so might make it worse for Andrew. She put on a tape of Sibelius instead, music bleak as bare mountains, to blot out June's continued scolding. The tape hadn't been playing ten minutes when June rang the doorbell. Could you turn the music down a little? Not that we don't appreciate good music, but the boy's just gone to bed. The sooner he's asleep, the sooner we'll have some peace, God willing. Presumably he'd been sent to bed with no dinner. Send him over here if it's peace you want, Geraldine suggested, but June was already marching away to her house. Geraldine turned down the volume and finished her meal, though her stomach felt tight. She was helping Jeremy clear up when the bell rang again. It was June's husband, Brian. Is he in? Not interrupting anything, am I? he said, and stepped over the threshold without waiting for Geraldine to invite him in. He had a soft, round face with a jutting jaw that she thought he thrust forward deliberately. Sallow skin tinged bluish under his eyes, curly sideburns that trailed down to the hinges of his jaw. He went into the kitchen and found Jeremy washing the dishes. Got you doing her jobs, has she? Listen, I hope mine didn't offend you before. You're... Oh, you mean June. It was Geraldine she spoke to, actually. You know how she gets when she's on edge. Andrew was being stupid, contradicting her. Hadn't even the sense to keep his mouth shut. Anyway, listen, I wanted to ask if you were going out tonight. We weren't planning to. Why, Geraldine said. Would you like us to keep an eye on Andrew? I should think you'd had enough of him for one day. No, if you're not going out, come round for a drink. We're hoping to have the alarm fixed, Jeremy said. You'll hear Eddings from our house if he ever turns up. Say you'll come or she'll think she offended you. Besides, Brian said, as if this left them no option, we want to talk to you about Andrew. When he'd gone, Jeremy called Eddings, only to learn that he was still out patching up his handiwork. Let's brave the hospitality, Jeremy said with a grimace. A vacuum cleaner was bumbling about the Bevan's entrance hall. You'd think he could have wiped his feet after coming round to see you, June said by way of explanation, and ushered them into the front room. Porcelain was everywhere, shepherdesses on the mantelpiece above the gray brick hearth that surrounded the simulated coals of the gas fire, Chinese figures on shelves around the walls, a china tea set on the Welsh dresser. Geraldine couldn't see where there was room for Andrew to play, what with all that and the television and video recorder and the pine bar at which Brian was waiting to serve. What'll it be? Anything so long as it's scotch, gin, or martini. June handed out paper mats and slipped one beneath her tumbler of martini before she sat down, sighing. Maybe now I can relax after worrying about Andrew all day. What's been the matter, Geraldine said. June stared as if Geraldine were being facetious. Don't you know where that American woman took them? Not just up on the moors, but right by the cave. If you even set foot on the moors, you should take a map and compass and food, in case you get lost. I think that's only on a long walk, Jeremy said. My father said, if you even set foot on the moors. Still, I suppose you feel you've got to defend his teacher, seeing that she's a friend of yours. We got to know her from taking Andrew to school, Geraldine pointed out. She's all right as teachers go, except she thinks she knows all about kids, Brian said. What she needs is a man to teach her a few things, if you take my meaning. Geraldine looked away from his wink. You were saying you wanted to talk about Andrew. We wanted your opinion as long as you see so much of him. Brian took a swallow of his scotch and looked hard at each of them in turn. Maybe you know more about these things than we would. What I want to know is, do you think he is queer? Odd, you mean, Jeremy suggested. Not just odd, queer. I suppose you'd call it gay, though I'm buggered if I know what they've got to be gay about. Brian's face was reddening. Do you think he's not a man? He isn't yet, is he? Geraldine said. 
He's only a little boy. Most of us aren't sure what sex we are until we're at least in our teens. People round here are, let me tell you, and he'd better had be if he knows what's good for him. I'm sure he's as normal as any of us, Geraldine said, wishing he were, hoping he would be. That's my feeling, too. I didn't see how he could be queer. It isn't as if anyone could have got their hands on him. He turned, grinning to Jeremy. I'll tell you something now. I used to think you might be one of them, what with all the time you spend in the kitchen, and that name of yours. June broke the awkward silence. If Andrew's normal that way, then what is wrong with him? In what way, Geraldine said. In just about every way you can think of, God help us. He's near the bottom of his year at school, though your teacher friend has brought him up a bit this year. I suppose we must give her that. And out of school, he's even worse. Under my feet from dawn to dusk, and won't go out because nobody will play with him. Not that you can blame them when he never acts his age. Talks like a baby half the time. Perhaps if you encouraged him to talk a bit more. Talk more? Dear Lord, when I've had a weekend of him, sometimes I think my head will never stop aching. I dread the summer holidays, I don't mind telling you. If you had a day of him, I don't think you'd be so anxious to encourage him. I wouldn't mind. Well, let's not let him spoil the evening, Brian said as June pursed her lips. Who wants to watch a video? You two haven't got a machine, have you? I've something here you might like. He reached behind the bar and produced an unmarked plastic box. His sudden eager good humor made Geraldine uneasy, even before he said, It isn't what you'd call hardcore, more of a comedy. I don't mind pornography, June said, with what looked like a brave smile as long as it doesn't involve children. Geraldine sighed inwardly and took Jeremy's hand as the film's few credits faded. Brian began to chortle as the target for a game of marbles proved to be an anonymous vagina. Geraldine refused to look at him, though she was sure he was gazing at her to see how she reacted, making her conscious of her long legs and large breasts, of the heat spreading up her heart-shaped face to her close-cropped silvery hair to the tips of her slightly pointed ears. She hoped furiously that she wasn't blushing. That's what I call a game of marbles, Brian spluttered as the winner took the woman as a preamble to an orgy. At the first spurt of semen in the film, Jeremy cleared his throat. I really think we should make sure we don't miss Eddings. You've never got to go yet, Brian protested, and jumped up. Come with me first, anyway. I've got something else to show you. Jeremy glanced back helplessly at Geraldine as he followed Brian upstairs. She would have suggested switching off the tape, but June was staring at the screen with a tight-lipped smile that didn't invite any kind of approach. Overhead, Geraldine heard a buzzing that surely couldn't be what it sounded like. The tangle of flesh on the television screen looked almost abstract to her by the time the men came downstairs. Any time you want a rest from Andrew, bring him round to us, Jeremy said in a casual tone that was meant to deny the rest of the evening. He was clearly as anxious to leave as she was. She took his hand, and they hurried out into the velvety evening. As soon as they were beyond the Bevan's gate, he muttered, You'll never guess what he wanted to show me. Geraldine suppressed mirth through her words about. Not a vibrator. Damn right. And how big their bed is. He was dropping hints about a game we could all play when I managed to edge my way out. I have a good idea who he had in mind for prizes. Just shows you what goes on behind net curtains. I could have done without knowing. Do you fancy a walk? Eddings won't be coming this late, or if he does, he can be inconvenienced for a change. And then I've something to read to you. They often read to each other in the evenings. She didn't realize how tense the Bevans had made her until she stepped onto the moor above the town. A cold wind snatched at her out of the dark as the higher slopes began to take shape against the black sky. 
take shape because something else was rising into view, an unstable white forehead above the edge beyond which the cave lay. She calmed herself down, even though the white rim was swelling too large, its outline trembling. Of course, it was only the moon, magnified by mist. She held Jeremy's hand and stood where she was until the moon was clear in the sky. It showed how much the Bevans had worked on her nerves that the sight of the incomplete moon above the cave made her so inexplicably nervous. 4. Just one more call, Hazel said to her parents, searching the phone directory that was open on her lap for a name that she hadn't yet marked. She dialed and put on her official voice. Mr. Fletcher, my name is Hazel Eddings, and I'm calling you on behalf of Peak Security. I wonder if you're confident that no burglar could ever break into your house. Here's Benedict now, her mother Vera said sharply, too late to stop the call as Hazel's husband poked his sharp-chinned face into the room. Whenever you're ready, he called, jerking his arms to adjust his cuffs while he tried to fix his bow tie. You'll never manage that, Vera rebuked him. Here, let me. She followed him into the hall, and so it was only Craig who saw Hazel duck her head away from the phone, looking hurt. No need for that kind of language, she murmured, and dropped the receiver into its cradle as if she didn't want to hold it any more. What did he say, sweetheart? Craig demanded. She looked so vulnerable that his heart seemed to twist, as it had fifteen years ago at the sight of her in her first evening dress. But she blinked her eyes bright and smiled at him as if nothing had happened. I'm fine, Daddy, she said, and strode into the hall. Dressed like that, she looked even more like her mother, black hair piled above her long white neck, emphasizing her dark eyes and delicate bones like Vera's. Craig took Vera's arm and sensed that she'd heard Hazel's last words to the phone, but thought better of commenting now. Benedict opened the front door and waited for the others to precede him so that he could set the alarm. I may have to dash off after dinner, he said. If you like, Craig, you could come along. The Eddingses lived on the Moorland Road just outside Moonwell, in a cottage with blue shutters and whitewashed walls. The first few hundred yards toward the town were unlit, and Craig held onto Vera's arm. Once he slipped on a leaf that rain had plastered to the road and felt himself skidding into the dark. The lights began at the church, the outermost building. Lamps stretched the shadows of willows across the lumpy graveyard full of headstones, postering the church wall with the shadow of an oak. The small peaked porch was lit, Craig saw, I'll just get the newsletter, Benedict said. Come in if you like. Small blurred gargoyles poked their heads out of the thick walls beneath the high sloping roof. Light streamed onto the sparkling grass through the tall, thin, arched windows, each of which contained three figures in stained glass, crowded so closely that they looked almost like a single figure. Indeed, as a child, Craig had thought some of them were. The memory made him feel unexpectedly childlike as he followed Vera through the porch into the church. Beneath the pointed arches of the vaulting, the nave was calm and welcoming. Unbelievers welcome, too, he thought as Vera leafed through the visitor's book. A pity more people don't come in. It's a pretty church. Figures are up this year anyway, she said. And then, oh, dear... Hazel glanced over her mother's shoulder and gave a cry of disgust. Someone had scrawled piss off across a page full of signatures. All the signatures were dated earlier that month. Before Craig could comment, Hazel cried, That's what happens when people stop believing. They've no respect for anything, even God. I think God will forgive them, Mrs. Eddings, the priest said, emerging from behind the high oak pulpit. He was a squat, beer-bellied man with a cheerful red face and straggling gray hair. I'm more worried that folk like yourself may be offended. I think that's a sin. Hazel stared open-mouthed at him. You don't think insulting God is a sin? I'm not sure that whoever wrote that rather silly comment had God in mind at all. I rather think they hoped to shock whoever read it. After all, this church has been here for close to eight hundred years, and the foundations for much longer. You can feel that, can't you? Yet that isn't a split second in the eye of God. 
think how much less important this bit of childishness must be. Are you sure you ought to speak for God like that, Benedict said? Well, it rather comes with a job, you know. I do believe God forgives. And I think you can feel that here, too. He turned to Craig and Vera. You're Mrs. Edding's parents, aren't you? Do I hear you're thinking of joining my parish? Sorry, Hazel intervened. Father O'Connell, Craig and Vera Wilde. Craig shook the priest's hand, which was strong and warm. If we retire, we might come to Moonwell. We might even carry on doing legal work. But I ought to tell you, he said, taken aback by his own embarrassment. We aren't what you'd call churchgoers. If you're pubgoers, you'll find me there, too. You're from Moonwell originally, aren't you? Did you ever help dress the cave? We still make up the panels in here, you know. My personal opinion is that it strengthens the church. I'd be happy if you got to know Father O'Connell. Hazel lowered her voice as if she didn't want Craig to hear. You aren't getting any younger. In the street, Craig said, I quite like your priest. At least he doesn't believe in the hard sell. Maybe he ought to, Benedict said. Nothing wrong with being aggressive for God. He lost quite a lot of his congregation when he preached against the missile bases, as if he didn't realize the fear of them is bringing people back to God. They want strong leadership now that there's a base so close to Moonwell. They don't go to church to hear that kind of thing. I really believe he had the chance to turn our whole town back to God, if only he hadn't been so soft. That's why we've so much crime here now, because people won't stand up for what's right, and no wonder when even their priest seems afraid to. Still, you're helping prevent crime, aren't you, Craig said, rather than suggest that Benedict had something to thank crime for. How's business since you changed the company name? It wouldn't be half what it is without Hazel, Benedict said, patting her head. Changing the name is standard business practice, of course. So tell us the reason, Craig thought. There would be time enough to pursue it. Just now he was regaining his sense of the town, the way no terrace was quite in line with its neighbors, the stretches of the high street that had no pavements, only grass verges from which the bellies of barrel-shaped drains protruded. Streets led down from the town square through the terraces toward the dry valley, and the sight of the crooked skeins of lamps descending into a gathering mist made him feel nostalgic and peaceful. He mustn't feel too settled, he reminded himself, as they crossed the square to the Moonwell Hotel. The hotel was four stories tall, the smallest rooms up under the steep roof. The restaurant had space enough to cope if all the rooms were occupied, but since they never were, Craig hadn't booked a table. Perhaps he should have, for every table in the high-paneled room with its polished dance floor was taken. Well, I never, Benedict said, strong words for him. Presumably the people, mostly middle-aged, were a coach party, since they all seemed to know each other. The Wilds and the Eddingses found seats at adjacent tables, but they had hardly sat down when the couples at the tables rose. A minute later, the restaurant had emptied, leaving the four of them with echoes, crumpled napkins, used cups and plates. It's a good thing we'll be having wine, Craig said to the waiter, who came to clear the table of their predecessor's leavings, or you'd have sold none this evening. By the time a matronly waitress brought their meals, he and Vera had drunk most of the wine and were calling for another bottle, despite a surprised look from Benedict that stopped just short of reproof. As Craig cut into his chicken Kiev, he thought again of Hazel in her first evening dress. Remember the first time we dined at Sheffield Town Hall? You had chicken Kiev then. You couldn't work out how they put the garlic butter in. You said it was like a ship in a bottle. Did I really, Hazel said with a smile. Hazel remembers quite a lot about her childhood, Benedict said. I'm glad, Vera said, and blinked at him though his pale voice had been neutral. Or shouldn't I be? Well now, Benedict said, and Hazel interrupted. It's only that I happened to mention to Benedict how you and Daddy used to dress at home. How we didn't, you mean, Craig said, picking cork off his tongue. 
I know you were trying to be modern, ahead of your time, really, but you don't mind if I say this now, do you? I never liked it when you went around like that. I'm glad it's going out of fashion. Mind you, just the other day, Benedict had to knock on someone's door and ask them to put some clothes on their little boy while he was playing out in his garden. They didn't sound very Christian to me, Benedict added. Vera put down the glass that she'd stopped short of her lips. So what else didn't you like about your childhood, Hazel? Let's hear the rest of it. Mummy, I didn't mean to hurt you. I wouldn't have said anything if I'd known you would take it that way. No, please, Vera said, and withdrew her hand as Hazel reached for it. I'd rather know. Just little things. I know you didn't keep me away from religious activities at school, but I always felt as if Daddy wanted to, and I wish you'd let me go to Sunday school, but I thought if I asked you might feel I was trying to say you weren't enough for me. I wouldn't have been. I hope you know. You wouldn't have said it, just thought it, you mean. Oh, Mummy, Hazel cried, lowering her voice as the sound echoed through the empty restaurant and brought a waiter's face to the kitchen doors. Say you aren't offended. I was always afraid we'd end up talking like this. You're a surprise to me, that's all, Vera said, blinking back tears, and Benedict cleared his throat. I'd better be getting back to work, he told Craig through a last mouthful of his main course. I'll come with you. Perhaps you could pick me up when you've been home for the van. Just as you like, Benedict said, in a tone that implied they should leave the women to themselves. His footsteps faded, sounding thin and prim, and then Craig tried to intervene. I know you didn't mean to hurt your mother, Hazel. We both realize you've got to be yourself. We've no right to try and keep you the way we'd have liked you to be, but at least you might leave us our illusions about ourselves. Hazel grabbed his hand and Vera's. You are the two people I most care about in the world. I only say these things because I worry about you. No need to, Craig said. If there's a god, he can hardly blame us for not being equipped to believe in him. Both women looked reproachfully at him, and he resented feeling glad when Benedict came back. As soon as he was in the van, which was piled with tools and new timber, Craig said, So, what did you want to talk to me about? Benedict turned the key again as the engine sputtered. I thought you might like to see how I look after my customers. I hope you'll agree we deserve to succeed. Meaning, Craig said as the van lurched forward, you're not doing as well as you think you deserve to. We could be doing better. We would be if I hadn't been landed with those alarms in lieu of payment when the firm was going bankrupt. I just need to liven business up, get myself a new van, smarten up our advertising, maybe employ someone part-time to deal with a work I'm not perfect at. I have worked out the initial costs. They wouldn't be outrageous. I hope your bank manager agrees with you. To be honest, he wasn't very encouraging. We owe the bank some money, unfortunately. He halted the van at the end of the village. Then what do you propose to do, Craig said. I was rather wondering if you and Vera might be able to help. Able, possibly. What had you in mind? Three thousand would be ample to put the business back on its feet, and twice that would pay off the bank as well. We're talking about a short-term loan, you understand. I'm sure we'd be able to pay most, if not all, of it back by the end of the year. I can't comment until I've talked to Vera. I shouldn't raise your hopes too high if I were you, Craig said, as they climbed down from the van. The booksellers looked as if they'd been ready for bed. This is my father-in-law, Benedict said, which didn't seem to please them much. They led the way into the bookshop, and Benedict snapped open the microcomputer that controlled the alarm system. Just as I thought, this is what you did wrong, he said, and demonstrated with exaggerated patience. On the way out, he stopped in front of a bookcase. Oh, have you fixed it? I would have done that for you, he said peevishly. Business is business, he said as he restarted the van, but I do wish I could afford not to work for such people. Did you see what they'd put where the altar should be? A table full of books about superstition. Perhaps you don't think there's any difference. Craig gave a noncommittal murmur as Benedict drove back to the hotel. The women had already left. Do you remember I'm not asking for the money purely for myself, Benedict said, on the way to the cottage, mist drifting across the deserted main street into the headlights. Vera had gone to bed and was asleep. Craig found that he'd wanted to talk and felt lonely. 
He lay beside her, feeling the ache start in his bones, trying to fall asleep before their nagging prevented him. A stab of pain in his left calf brought him lurching awake, gasping. The plunge into sleep had felt like his fall into the disused mine shaft, his boyhood fall that was always waiting in his dreams when he was nervous. He peered at the room as moonbeams probed the curtains. He closed his eyes and drifted until an impression startled him. In the hotel restaurant, he'd thought fleetingly that the diners didn't just all know one another. The feeling lingered that they all knew something he didn't know and were waiting. Five. What's that we just backed into, Mr. Gloom? Some silly fool standing on the pavement, Mr. Despondency. Must have missed him, he's still standing. Great balls of fire, what's he doing now? Banging on the car boot as if we hadn't noticed him. Hey, up, he's banged it open. Here, here, what's the game? Get your hands off my car or I'll have the law on you. Too late, Eustace realized that he shouldn't have started improvising, because now he couldn't think of a punchline. That really happened to me here today in Sheffield, but don't tell anyone, will you, he said, reverting to his normal voice. It didn't sound much like his in the headphones they'd given him. It was high-pitched and over-eager and more regionally accented than he'd thought possible. He could see his face reflected in the studio window beside the patient face of the producer, his hair sticking up above his perspiring forehead, his mouth only a little wider than his broad nose. He made his mouth into an O, his features turning into an exclamation mark, and for the first time the producer laughed. But this wasn't television. Eustace was auditioning for radio. Above all, he had to keep talking. He shouldn't have brought gloom and despondency on so soon. He should have told the incident with the car as it had happened, him slapping the boot and the driver accusing him of trying to steal from the car, because then he could have led into what had happened at the bank. The teller hadn't been convinced that the signature on the check he'd made out to cash was his, and when he'd signed it again for her, it had looked even less like the signature on his check card. As for the photograph on his union membership card, she'd stared at it as if he must have bought it in a joke shop. So far it had been a pretty average day, but he'd missed his chance to use it now. All he could do was go into another routine, the one he'd meant to save until the end. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways, he said solemnly, and couldn't bear the sound of his amputated voice any longer. He pulled off the headphones and let them dangle from the table. One, two, two and a bit on Sundays. Four, if you count the times when I have a touch of the old trouble. Five, when you do. He could still hear his other voice squeaking mouse-like beside his thigh. He felt parched for a laugh, even a smile from the producer. Don't tell anyone, will you, Eustace said, hoping that this time the man would realize it was his catchphrase, and wondered why the producer was holding up one finger, drawing circles in the air. When the producer sawed it across his throat, Eustace said, Thank you, and stumbled to his feet, knocking the earphones to the floor, tripped over a cable and wrenched at the door until he realized he was trying to open it the wrong way. He struggled past it in time to hear the producer say, You'll agree that wasn't worth the tape, let alone my time. He needs a proper audience, Anthony, said his colleague, who'd invited Eustace. What do you want me to do, Steve? Drag them in off the street? No, I'd like you to see him on his own ground. You were the one who said we ought to be giving more local talent a chance. He turned to Eustace, who stopped mopping his forehead. When are you next on at that pub I saw you in? The one-armed soldier? Thursday week. We've got to go to Manchester that week anyway, Anthony. Come on, trust me, we'll stop off to watch Eustace on the way back, and if you still don't see what I saw in him, I'll treat you to dinner. I'll let you know. By the time these auditions are over, I may well be ready to punch the next clown I see on the nose. Hear that, Eustace? He made a joke. There's still hope for him. Steve guided Eustace out by one elbow. I know you won't let me down, Steve said. He wouldn't, Eustace vowed as the bus climbed out of Sheffield. Yellowish gouges of mines guard the grassy slopes. A reservoir, a fallen slab of the cloudy sky, stretched to the horizon, sinking as the bus labored upward. Thursday week might change his life. No longer just the Moonwell postman and a treat for the customers at the pub, he'd be the man who was hiding inside him, waiting to be noticed. He'd be worthy of Phoebe Wainwright's notice. The bus led him off at the edge of the pine woods. 
He walked through the green calm, breaking into routines when he felt like it. Tea in the pot, Mr. Gloom. Best bloody place for it, Mr. Despondency. They summed up northern dourness at its worst. Their behavior wasn't even that much of a parody, to judge by the way his audiences at the pub recognized them. A sharp wind met him as he emerged from the old forest. Above him, the ridge overlooking the town looked charred against the lumpy, piebald sky. Don't miss Eustace Gift at the one-armed soldier, he announced, blowing himself a fanfare as he gained the ridge. But don't tell anyone, will you? He swallowed his last word, for he'd been overheard. A man was resting on the ferny bank beside the road. The man placed his long hands on his knees and stood up as Eustace faltered. He wore a denim suit, shoes with thick soles, a rucksack. His face was angular, cheekbones thrusting forward. His hair was clipped close to his head. His eyes were unnervingly blue. Shyness made Eustace speak before he was ready. Heading for Moonwell? Sure am. Californian, Eustace thought, having been educated by television. Eustace made to hurry past, but the man fell into step with him. I hope you weren't thinking I was crazy, Eustace said eventually, awkwardly, because I was talking to myself. Not at all. I knew who you were talking to up here. Eustace didn't like to ask who. What brings you to Moonwell? Good news. Oh, good. That's good news, Eustace babbled, unwilling to risk anything else. And the greatest challenge of my life. Really? That must be... Eustace blundered and gave up. Thank heaven they were entering Moonwell. Noticing how dusty the man's shoes and trousers were, he wondered how far he could have walked. He made to stride ahead, but the man took hold of his arm. How do I get above the town? Along here, Eustace said reluctantly, and led him off the high street. At the end of the unpaved side road, a stepped path led up to the moors. You'd be doing me a favor if you'd help me to the top, the man said. Eustace took pity on him, since he seemed exhausted. Yet as soon as they reached the moor, wind hissing down the grassy slopes to set the heather scratching, the man revived. I know my way now, he said, and when Eustace made to retreat, come with me. It isn't far. You won't want to miss this. He waited until Eustace stumbled after him along the path, wondering what he'd been talked into. The man's face pressed forward into the wind until the skin turned pale with stretching, and Eustace began to feel he'd rather hear at second hand about whatever was coming. But he hadn't thought of an excuse for turning back when the crowd of people appeared above them on the slopes, cried out, and started singing. 6. Nick drove away from the missile base and wondered how best to contradict himself. There were fewer protesters at the base today than there had been last week. Most of them came from Sheffield or farther away, very few from the Peak District, and none at all from Moonwell. It looked as if the defense minister had been proved right after all. The site of the base had been moved away from Sheffield into a dale at the edge of the peaks. There had been protests that it was too close to the reservoirs, and a few that it was too close to Moonwell. When the couple who ran a bookshop in Moonwell had written to the defense minister— They'd received a letter that all but said Moonwell was small enough to be expendable. That had brought protesters out of the peaks, but not for long. Today's demonstration had been entirely peaceful. Too much so, Nick thought, for its own good. Whatever report he wrote, he could imagine its carrying some such headline as Peaks Accept Missile Base. Looks like another job for the masked man of the airwaves, he thought, his wry grin fading as he wondered how hard a time Julia would give him. He'd been broadcasting anonymously on her pirate wave band in Manchester for almost a year. They'd met at a fundraiser for Amnesty International, not long after she'd started broadcasting. When she'd learned he was a reporter, she'd begun to probe his feelings, his frustration at seeing his reports toned down or distorted— how he'd resigned himself to being satisfied when the newspaper let a token left-wing observation of his slip through into print. The best you could expect when the newspapers were owned by fewer and fewer proprietors and were becoming mouthpieces for bigger and bigger mouths. But there was an alternative, she'd told him, her eyes sparkling. He wouldn't be the only reporter who was using her radio station to say what his paper refused to let him say. He turned off the Manchester Road and drove across the moors. There ought to be a town on the Moorland Road, if he wasn't mistaken, or at least a pub for a late lunch. He'd grown fond of Julia. 
Over the months during which he'd visited her sagging Victorian house in Salford with the radio equipment in the cellar, they'd made love several times. But recently her attitude toward him had changed. People must know who he was on the air, she kept saying. He ought to name himself and see what his editor did then. Nick's name would make the authorities think twice about closing her down. Nick doubted that his name carried much weight, and touched though he was by her promise that she would always have a job for him. He didn't think he would achieve anything by putting his career at risk. Lately, to placate Julia, he'd taken to attacking himself by name on the air. He switched on the car radio in case he could hear her, but her wave band was swamped by an American evangelical station, a rock group singing, Have a nice day, Jesus, have a nice day. He turned the radio off and planned how to scathe Nick Reed. He thought of Julia's soft lips, long cool arms, long legs wrapped around his. The car sped across the moors, miles from the main road now, and he wondered if he'd been mistaken about the pub. He'd stopped the car so as to consult the road map when he heard the singing. He rolled the window down. Moors divided by infrequent dry stone walls glowed sullenly under the packed sky. A bird caught by the wind plummeted and swooped. Water trickled in a ditch beside the road. A shift of wind brought him another snatch of song from somewhere ahead. It sounded like a choir. He put away the AA book without consulting it. There must be a town ahead that was conducting an outdoor service of thanksgiving, as the townsfolk often did in the peaks. He drove up the next slope and saw the town, past a couple of farmhouses and a blue and white cottage. It looked typical. Terraces built of limestone and gritstone, small gardens brimming with flowers, a narrow main street that cut off his view of the rest of the town as soon as he drove in. The shops were locked, the streets deserted. He parked the car in the town square and got out, stretching. A telephone rang somewhere. A dog barked. The pub was locked, too, he saw. It didn't seem worth driving in search of another so close to closing time. The choir was still singing, out of sight above the town. He locked the car and went up. A path at the end of a terrace of cottages led him onto the moor. As he stepped over the edge, the singing surged toward him. There was a moment when it seemed to come from everywhere on the empty slopes, then from the churning sky. He went along the trampled grassy path through the heather toward a stretch of bare rock from beyond which he thought the sound was welling. He wasn't prepared for what he saw as he reached the top. The barren land sloped down to a large pothole, surrounded by a dry stone wall. The stony bowl outside the wall was full of hundreds of people and the sound of a hymn. Opposite Nick, by the wall where the lip of the pothole was highest, a man was kneeling by himself. Dozens of people had turned to stare at Nick. He stepped down into the crowd so as to be less conspicuous. Not everyone was singing. Some people looked bewildered, even suspicious. Nick had almost reached the front of the crowd when, with a shout that echoed from the slopes and startled birds out of the heather, the singing ended. Nick halted between a plump woman with a cheerful, delicate face and a couple with a restless child. The kneeling man had closed his eyes and raised his face to the sky, lips moving silently. He gazed at the crowd then, his keen blue eyes searching out face after face. I am Godwin Mann, he said in a light yet penetrating voice. And that's why I am here. The plump woman snorted, whether derisively or not, Nick couldn't tell. He means he's here to win people for God, Andrew, the woman on his other side murmured to her son. Please don't kneel unless you want to, Godwin Mann said but I'd like you to be seated until I ask you to stand up for God. When people stared at him or at the bare rock they were being asked to sit on, he added, if anyone would like a chair or a cushion, just raise your hand. Many hands went up, rather tentatively. In response to that, a large wedge of the crowd behind man, headed for a nearby line of tents, came back with armfuls of cushions or folding chairs, some of the crowd spread coats to sit on, though they still looked dubious. Nick suspected that some of them were sitting down because they resented having to stand, perhaps resented having been brought here at all. He was beginning to wonder what precisely he'd stumbled onto, 
all the more so when the Californian said, I guess some of you may think I was discourteous because I didn't tell you I was coming, but I didn't know how long it would take me to walk. From America? a man wearing a butcher's apron muttered. Man gazed at him. No, from Heathrow Airport. I wanted to be sure I was worthy to speak for God. Nick sensed how those who'd grumbled about sitting on the ground felt ashamed of having complained. Score one for the evangelist, Nick thought as man went on. Don't think I'm saying I'm better than any one of you. Listen, and I'll tell you how I was until I asked God into my life. He took a deep breath and glanced at the sunless sky. I was brought up in Hollywood. My father was a British movie actor, Gavin Mann. When a murmur of recognition went through the crowd, he said a shade more loudly, I'm not here to speak ill of my father, but I was brought up in the worst ways of Hollywood. At five years old, I was drinking alcohol. At ten, I was smoking marijuana. At twelve, I was snorting cocaine. Fifteen years old, and I visited a prostitute. And one year later, a man came into my bedroom who used to swim naked with my father. I'm afraid my father only remarried after he divorced my mother because his fans would have expected him to. Well, I found out that night what my father did with his men friends, and the next morning I cut my wrists. As you can see, he held up his arms, displaying the pinkish scars like stigmata to the audible dismay of the crowd. My father got me to the hospital, but I wouldn't tell anyone why I'd done that to myself. All I wanted was to be left alone to get well so I could go someplace by myself and finish myself off. The woman beside Nick was dabbing at her eyes and jerking her son's hand when he asked her what was wrong. Nick felt uncomfortable and suspicious of man's weepy technique, especially when man said, the morning of the day before I would have left the hospital to kill myself, God saved me. He gave a wide, self-deprecating smile. Maybe that sounds presumptuous, thinking God would take the trouble for someone like I was. But let me tell you, he'd do the same for anyone, just so long as they ask. See, every day a counselor from Mission America came to the hospital and I'd turn my back on her, not knowing I was turning my back on God. Only that last day I heard God telling me not to turn away, and I told that counselor everything and accepted God into my life. The wedge of the crowd behind him whooped and waved their arms. They were the main choir, Nick realized. Some of you may be thanking God. You aren't like I was, man said to the townsfolk in front of him. But are you really without sin? As God looks down on this unspoiled landscape, do you think he takes pride in everything he sees? Or does he grieve for his greatest creation, you and me? Can anyone here stand up and say that sin has passed your town of Moonwell by? He let the silence answer him. You see how much you know, but don't like to talk about. These days, it isn't fashionable to talk about sin, or even about God. Rock musicians turn hymns into sex songs. Sacred music gets used in television commercials. Churches are turned into markets, as if man no longer needs God. But people still need to believe and that's why they're turning to magic and drugs and worse stuff to fill the gaps in their lives. But all that does is widen the gaps to let in sin. How could they face God if the bomb dropped now? What sort of eternal life do you think they can expect? I'm not here to argue the rights and wrongs of nuclear war, but if that missile base on the other side of these moors were to be nuked right now, I know that I shall go to heaven because Paul's gospel tells me so. Some of the townsfolk nodded at that. Maybe some of you are saying to yourselves that it's okay for me because I have faith. But so have you. You had faith 
when you got up this morning, that your house hadn't been burgled. You had faith when you went out into the street that you wouldn't be run down by a stolen car or a driver high on drugs. You have faith now that we won't see the nuclear cloud over these moors, and there won't be an earthquake that will spill us all down this evil hole. He stared down into the cave with what seemed to Nick unnecessary vehemence. Let me put it another way, man said, raising his blue eyes again. How many of you can say you have no faith at all? Are you really prepared to die alone in the dark, rejecting God? Christ died on the cross for you. He made that act of faith to show you how much God loves you and wants you to accept him. And if you reject that, you're condemning him to die alone without you condemning Christ to die alone in the dark, crying out, Why have you forsaken me? You may call yourself a Christian. You may believe you lead a good Christian life. But hear this. You can't take what you need from Christ and leave the rest. You can't say, Thank you, Jesus. I've got all I want from you now. Just give the rest of the stuff to someone who needs it. You can't think your way to God unless you let God into your life to show you how to live, unless you accept him whole like a child does, you're turning your back on him, and your name is Judas. He was hitting his stride now, Nick thought, not sure whether some of the crowd were restless with resentment or guilt. But God wants you to know this, man said. He wants you to understand that he sees your doubts. He sees if you're afraid to confess your sins. He sees if you aren't sure of your faith. And he wants you to know you needn't doubt any longer. One act of faith will bring God into your life. Remember the thief on the cross had only to turn to Christ, and all his sins were forgiven. He was that day with Christ in paradise. His voice was rising, echoing in the cave. Can't you feel God looking at you now? He's looking at you and loving you, as if you're the only person in the world, knowing all your problems and doubts and temptations and sins, and wanting to help you if you'll only let him, only turn to him for help. He knows if you think you can't live up to him, can't live by his commandments. That's why the commandments ask so much of you, to make you turn to God, because unless you let him into your life, you can't live up to them. Can you feel him loving you now, praying that you'll turn to him? That's right. God is praying for you. All he wants is a sign that you'll let him into your life, and I'm going to ask you to give him that sign now. I'm going to ask you to stand up for God. He put his hands on his thighs and shoved himself painfully to his feet. As he stood up, his legs wavered, and he stumbled against the dry stone wall, dislodging a fragment of stone. It skittered down the barren slope and over the edge of the cave. It struck rock twice on the way down. Nick sensed that the crowd was holding its breath, as man appeared to be. They heard a faint chink far below and a fainter sound that might have been the stone slithering further into the dark. Man gripped the wall, staring down. Someone coughed, and man looked up. I'm asking you to stand up as a sign that you're ready to confess. Don't be afraid that your sins are too terrible to be confessed. There is no sin so vile that God will not forgive, and no sin so trivial that it did not help nail Christ to the cross. Will you stand up now as a sign that you are ready to confess if called upon, or am I the only sinner here? The choir stood up at once. For a few moments, none of the townsfolk did. Then people began to struggle to their feet, and suddenly there were hundreds. Nick wondered how many of them might be standing up so as not to be noticed. He remained squatting and found he was unreasonably grateful that at least the plump woman was still sitting next to him. I was brought up in a Christian family, a woman in the choir said loudly. 
But we never obeyed God's word without question. When my parents died, I wanted to die too, because they hadn't left me enough to believe in. I turned to heroin until God's word saved me. As soon as she fell silent, an ex-alcoholic spoke up, and then a man who used to beat up his wife and five children. Man's eyes brightened as the parade of confessions went on, as if he were drawing energy from the public display of faith. He seemed almost to glow, a small, intensely clear figure under the dull sky. Suddenly a young woman standing close to Nick swung round, almost losing her balance. Mrs. Bevan, I stole money from the till when I were helping in your shop. Oh, Katie, never mind, said the mother beside Nick, flapping a nervous hand at her. But man had noticed. Don't be ashamed, whatever it is, he called. No sooner confessed than forgiven. Katie faced him and the crowd. I betrayed someone's trust. She gave me a job to help me make ends meet, and I stole from her, she cried, and burst into tears. You mustn't make so much of it, Katie. It's nothing compared to some of the things I do, the shopkeeper protested, and winced out of her husband's reach as he tried to quiet her. I give in to lust, she told man, her voice growing louder. I do things you shouldn't do even when you're married. Me and my husband look at pornography to give us more ideas, as if the way God made wasn't enough. You never said you felt like that, her husband mumbled, reddening. I never knew I was making you do things you didn't want to do. It should be me who's confessing. Your marriage will be whole once you ask God into it, man declared. The clouds were breaking overhead, and the urge to confess seemed to spread through the townsfolk as the sunlight spread. All at once people were confessing to pride, vindictiveness, lapses of faith, envy, drunkenness, selfishness. Can you feel God loving you, man cried. Can you feel him smiling? Nick felt he was taking advantage of the sunlight, but around him people were nodding in agreement with man, smiling uncertainly, even beaming. Let us give thanks now, man said eventually. We thank you, God, for giving us your word to show us how to live our lives, to make everything clear to us. The choir joined in, the townsfolk following raggedly. As the prayer came to an end, man glanced at the sun. Soon it will be the longest day of the year, he said, and I really think by then your town may be God's, a truly Christian community. But I believe God would ask one more thing first. A truly Christian community can't keep a pagan tradition alive. The plump woman beside Nick peered sharply at man. I know you may think it's just a charming old custom, the evangelist said, but that's where Christianity went wrong, trying to swallow paganism instead of stamping it out once and for all. I want to ask you a favor on God's behalf. Will you think about leaving this cave as it is this year, not decorating it for once? No need to answer now, but can anyone here say that the picture you make out of flowers is worth offending God for? I'll speak up if nobody else will. The plump woman supported herself on Nick's shoulder and heaved herself to her feet. I'm Phoebe Wainwright, and I organize the cave dressing. I think you're making things too black and white. The tradition's part of what we are, and I'm sure I'm not the only person here who thinks so. Why, even some of the children I've delivered helped me dress the cave. Somewhere in the crowd, Nick heard a murmur. She doesn't even go to church on Sundays. Otherwise, the townsfolk seemed embarrassed, resentful that she'd spoken up. I don't ask you to decide now, man said to them. Next time we meet here, you can let God know what you've decided. I only ask you to remember that paganism was always Christ's enemy. But a town where God has been invited into every home is a great defense against evil, and so I'll ask you one more thing. Next time we meet, I'd like those of you who stood up here for God to bring anyone who hasn't asked God into their lives. Some of the choir had slipped away to their tents for handfuls of silver balloons. They let the balloons, which were printed with the words, God loves you, 
flock into the sky, blotting out the sunlight for a few moments. The meeting was breaking up. Nick limped toward the front of the crowd, taking out his pocket tape recorder. There were several questions he wanted to ask man, but he wasn't out of the crowd, quite a few of whom were converging on the evangelist, when someone grabbed his arm. 7. The young woman who'd stopped Nick had a tapering face, wide greenish eyes, long black hair that the wind was tossing. He was rather pleased to have been halted by her until she spoke. Could you tell me what you're doing? She was a New Yorker, one of man's followers, obviously. Just going for a word, Nick said, indicating man. About what? Exactly what have you been doing? I think we're entitled to know. So far I've been watching. If man's followers were all as paranoid as this, what had they to hide? She was staring at his tape recorder. I haven't been using this, he said, if that's what you were thinking. Then why did you bring it at all? I always carry it. It comes with the job. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd like a word with your leader. He may want to talk to me even if you don't think so. She grabbed his arm again. Aren't you with his congregation? Only by accident. I happen to be passing. Take it easy with the arm, would you mind? I'd like to be able to use it when you've finished with it. Sorry. Here. Please, put it somewhere safe. She was peering at his tape recorder and stifling a giggle. That's not a field telephone at all, is it? I thought you'd been using it to organize the response. I thought that was what you were doing to me on behalf of the God Squad. Looks as if we're on the same side after all. Maybe we should start again. I'm Diana Kramer and I take it you're a reporter. Nick Reed from Manchester. You're not from round here, surely. I came here last year. I teach school in Moonwell. Don't let my accent fool you into thinking I'm mixed up with these guys. You've got your doubts about them, have you? Can I quote you? When she nodded, he switched on the recorder. Go ahead. It's just that the whole thing seems so organized to get the response this guy man wants. Nobody from Moonwell knew he was coming, so far as I know. And if they did, they certainly weren't telling. But the hotel's full of people he sent on ahead of him, and so are all the tents around the town. It doesn't feel like religion to me. It feels more like a bloodless invasion. I'll put that to him. Anything else? Would you like to tag along and hear what he says? Sure, if you like, I might catch something you'd miss. The crowd was dispersing around them. Man's followers waited beside the path to speak to the townsfolk, making sure nobody slipped past without answering. A lone figure who'd been watching from a higher slope turned away across the moors. Who's that? Nick said. It must be Nathaniel Needham. He lives out there. I hear he's the oldest native of Moonwell. They made their way across the barren slope to Man. Don't be ashamed to bear witness to your neighbors, he was saying. That's one of evil's greatest triumphs in our time, that people are embarrassed to talk about God or say publicly that they believe in him. Though his face was glowing, he looked exhausted, all the more so when he saw Nick's recorder. You want to talk to me? I'd like to, if you've time. Nick Reed from Manchester. The news. Man frowned. News travels fast. That you were here, you mean? I was just passing. Would you rather not have the publicity? If the faithful want to come and join our congregation, they know they'll be welcome. I can't think of any other reason why anyone would want to join us, can you? Unless to hinder God's work. And I hope you wouldn't want that any more than I do. Excuse me, Diana said, but you seem pretty sure you know what people want. I mean, your people damn near occupied the town so you'd get a welcome. I don't think anyone would object if that means God occupying their hearts, do you? And I think he has already for many of the people of this town. I guess you aren't one of them. I wasn't born here, no. I still don't understand why you picked this town. Because I had faith I would be welcome here if you can handle the idea, because God told me I was needed here. For what? To stop them practicing a ceremony that's hundreds of years old? 
I'm afraid so. Man's face seemed to thrust forward against a strong wind, eyes glittering. It's the oldest of all the druid ceremonies in England. Maybe you didn't know. I didn't, but I'd say that was all the more reason not to interfere. We don't have traditions that old ourselves. We shouldn't be jealous of people who have. God is a jealous God, or hadn't you heard? Nick intervened. But how significant do you think this ceremony is? I mean, how much influence can it really have? Man fixed his electric blue gaze on him. While these druidic rites keep being practiced, evil gains ground in the world. Saying they don't matter any longer is like saying there was never anything to fear in the dark. It was only primitive man who thought so. Let me tell you something. The year after I dedicated my life to God, he led me to a cult of Satanists in Hollywood, and some of the people I saved are here with me now. God gave me the power to seek out evil. That's why he sent me here. He seemed suddenly to feel he'd said too much. So what can I tell you that you'll print, he said more quietly. Nick asked him standard questions and received the answers he expected. Man was against abortion, divorce, pornography, permissiveness in all its forms, and on the side of marriage, obedience to authority, a return to order. Nick tried to draw him out on the subject of his presence in Moonwell, but man slumped all at once, his mouth drooping. I'll go down now, he said to two of his followers, who helped him toward the town. Two more of them buttonholed Nick and Diana on the path to ask if they'd been won over by man's preaching. I'm just a reporter, Nick said, and this lady's with me. Once out of earshot, he murmured to her, I hope you didn't think I was presuming, saying you were with me, since you asked so many of my questions. I didn't really, did I? She made a comically apologetic face. Breaking your arm and now elbowing you out of your interview? You should have told me to shut up. No hard feelings. You got him going where I mightn't have. Made him say more than he'd have wanted to, I thought. Let me buy you a drink to show I don't bear grudges. But the pub, the one-armed soldier, was still locked. Nick had meant to phone in his report about the missile base. You're welcome to use my phone, Diana said. She lived in a small rented cottage below the town square. The white room smelled of the flowers she had in pots in all the windows. He phoned from the low-timbered entrance hall, then joined her in the front room with its children's paintings, where she had coffee waiting. Soon the conversation veered back to man. What I don't understand, she said, is why he thinks doing away with this ceremony, just because it's the oldest, will put a stop to all the others. I don't know if that's what he meant. Why else would it be so important to him? Nick couldn't imagine. Listen. I've got to be going, he said, and scribbled his phone number on a page torn from his notebook. If anything happens you think I should know about, give me a call, will you? And whenever you're coming to Manchester again, let me know and I'll buy you lunch. Most of the shops were open as he walked back to the car. He wondered which of the people on the streets were townsfolk, which man's followers, and how many were now both. As he drove away from Moonwell down into the forest below the moor, Diana's question began to trouble him. He should have asked man what it was about the cave that had brought him all the way from California. He felt almost as if something had distracted him from asking. 8. Diana woke on Monday morning thinking about druids. She got onto the subject almost by accident in the Manchester Library where she'd been researching her Peak District ancestry. Her background seemed so familiar, though not the way her mother's grandfather had lived, a miner who'd carved his family a home out of the lime waste outside Buxton. But perhaps, she thought now, her sense of belonging had just been part of the peace she'd felt on the moors, the first time she'd felt peaceful since coming to England to try to adjust to the death of her parents. Her last sight of them at the Kennedy Barrier was as vivid as ever her father giving her a hug that smelled of the pipe tobacco he always bought near the New York Public Library, her mother's cool hands on her face as she murmured, Don't worry, Diana not knowing then why she felt anxious. 
The glimpse of the airliner dwindling into the blackening sky had wakened her hours later in a panic that had sent her praying as she hadn't since her childhood, praying they were safe. When she'd given in to her panic and called the airport, the clerk at first suspected her because she seemed to know the plane had crashed. Not until the police had questioned her at length did they tell her that both her parents were dead. She wondered how man would have dealt with that. Not so much that God had failed to respond to her prayers, but that if he'd wanted to take her parents, he'd taken dozens of other lives just to do so. Or didn't the individual lives matter to God, just the number of lives, the statistic? All that could justify that kind of behavior by a God would be life after death. She'd reached that conclusion in the midst of her peace on the moor. The murmur of the world had faded into the sound of the wind in her ears. The mist had withdrawn over the deserted slopes until it seemed they would never end. And as Diana had drunk in the silence and loneliness, she'd grown calm, at peace with her loss. She'd felt on the edge of passing through loneliness to whatever lay beyond. Teaching in Moonwell had, apparently, and now man and his aversion to druids. On the way to the school, through streets glistening with mist, pinpoint rainbows shining out of flowers, she thought how much the druids had left behind. Kissing under the mistletoe, throwing spilled salt over your head, gargoyles as a civilized alternative to displaying the severed heads of your enemies above your roof, even calling two weeks a fortnight, since the druids measured time by nights rather than days. Druids never wrote anything down, perhaps as an aid to memory. They often spoke in triads, since three was their sacred number. The great Celtic fear was that the sky would fall and the sea overflow. By the eighteenth century the Druids had become a romantic myth, but the truth seemed to be that they had been more savage, sacrificing human beings before battle. It was hard to be sure, since no account survived of their religion. Presumably the cave had been one of their sacred places— and she wished more and more that man would leave it alone. Mrs. Scragg was waiting for her in the schoolyard, which was unusually crowded. My husband wants to see you in his office. He was sitting at his desk, which looked absurdly large for him, reading a pamphlet called Stand Up for God, and rubbing his hands together. His broad smile made his face look cramped between his chin and bristling eyebrows. You've some extra pupils, he said. Godwin Man arranged for us to take them. My wife will have the nine- and ten-year-olds, and I'll have the eldest. I assume you can cope. No problem, Diana said, determined that there wouldn't be. Even when her class lined up at the sound of Mrs. Scragg's ear-splitting whistle, and Diana saw their number had virtually doubled. All the new children looked bright-eyed and fresh-faced and eager, though some of them were sniffling from the chill that must creep into their tents. In her classroom, Diana said, I think you're all going to have to sit two to a desk. Her class moved over, shuffling and grumbling. When they'd made room, the new children remained standing. May we pray first? A boy with especially blonde hair and a southern accent said. Sure, if that's what you do. The new children knelt, then gazed at the others. They were expected to kneel, too, apparently, but Diana wasn't having her schoolroom routine taken over so thoroughly. Just bow your heads, she said, and bowed her own a little. Eventually, the newcomers finished thanking God and sat down. Let's start by getting to know one another, Diana suggested. Why doesn't each of you tell us your name and a bit about yourself? I'm Emmanuel, the blonde boy said. I come from Georgia. My daddy and my uncles worked a farm there until my uncles died fighting God's war against communism. Two English children and two from California claimed to be fighting God's war, too. Sally was bristling. Suddenly, she said loudly, My dad's in a union and he goes to church. You can go to church and still keep God out of your heart, Emmanuel said. We'll pray for him and for you to show him the true path. Sally stuck her tongue out at him and wrinkled her nose to stop her glasses from slipping. My mum says if there's another war, it'll be the last one, Jane said, because the bombs will kill everyone. You shouldn't care so long as God is your best friend, said a Welsh girl. But if he isn't, 
You'll go straight to hell when you die. I won't. You don't know note about it. Anyway, Sally's my best friend. She reached for Sally's hand between the desks, and Sally said defiantly, I love Jane, too. Girls shouldn't love girls, and boys shouldn't love boys, Jane's seatmate said. Godwin Mann says so. You have to offer up all your love to God. If you're going to argue, I think you'd better just tell whoever you're sitting with your name, Diana said, reminding herself that it wasn't their fault they were so old before their time, and so insufferable. It was the way they'd been brought up. Now I'm going to hear each of the new children read, and the rest of you can see how much you can read by yourselves. She'd heard two readings when Thomas's seatmate said loudly, You mustn't say that kind of stuff. Tell Miss Kramer the kind of dirty stuff you were saying. Not here, okay, Thomas? We don't want to offend anyone when there's no reason to. I forgive you. I'll pray for you, Thomas's deskmate said, and Diana had the disconcerting impression that he was talking to her as well as to Thomas. That was the way the morning went, the new children not so much telling tales as telling their seatmates to confess whenever they did anything wrong, however trivial. She went into the schoolyard at lunchtime, praying that there wouldn't be so puritanical while they were playing games. A radio was blaring disco music, which seemed promising, until Diana realized that the lyrics, repeated over and over, were, Upon this rock I shall build my church. Some of the Moonwell children began to dance enthusiastically, until the owner of the radio switched it off. You shouldn't dance like that, she rebuked them. Some of Diana's class were teaching the newcomers to play Harry in the Hole. The Welsh girl, Mary, was chosen to be in the hole, to be blindfolded and try to grab a victim from the circle that surrounded her, holding hands. If she guessed who the victim was, that child had to join her and be blindfolded, and once that process started, the circle wouldn't hold for long. But before the game had even begun, Mary pulled the blindfold off. What am I supposed to be? The giant who lives down the well, Thomas said. He means the cave, Ronnie said impatiently. We poked your eyes out and threw you in. No, we chopped your arms and legs off and rolled you in, Thomas told her with relish. Mary looked as if she wanted to run. Diana hushed Sally and Jane, who were holding her hands and telling her secrets, and started to intervene, but the boy with a portable radio was ahead of her. What's wrong, Mary? he demanded. They want me to play at being him down the cave, Daniel. You mustn't play that, any of you. Don't you know who he is? He's the devil waiting down there. He'll come for you if you don't pray to God, and make sure your folks do. A cloud rose into view above the town, blotting out the sun. Its shadow flexed rapidly over the cottages and rushed into the schoolyard, evoking a sudden stony chill. He's not a devil. He's a giant, Thomas said. Anyway, if he gets out... He'll get you first in those tents up there. He'll pick you up and turn you inside out and put you down to something else, and then you'll have to crawl about like that forever. Andrew spoke for the first time, haltingly. He can't be a devil when the cave's a holy place. My granddad said they threw the giant down there because it was holy, and he wouldn't be able to get out. Your granddad's telling lies, Mary said in her sharp Welsh voice. You should listen to Godwin Mann. He speaks with the voice of God. What is he then, Andrew said. A telephone? Good for you, Diana thought, and caught sight of Mr. Scragg in the school doorway. All right now, children, don't take everything so seriously. It's only a game, after all, she said, earning herself a contemptuous glance from Daniel. For a moment she wanted to lash out at him, and was shocked by her feelings, until the whistle interrupted them. As soon as there was silence, Mr. Scragg said icily, "'Has anyone been up on the moor today who isn't camping there?' His gaze darted about the faces of the Moonwell children, searching for hints of guilt. "'If anyone has been, I'll find out. Believe me, I've just been told that someone has knocked the safety wall into the cave.' It'll take more than that to drive our friends away, but I'm telling you all now, 
There'd better be no more such incidents, or as God is my witness, I won't rest until I find the culprits and give them what they deserve. When he'd finished glaring, he stalked back into the building. I was going to tell you why they were wrong to throw the devil into the cave, Daniel said, ushering Mary away. But I think we'd better pray for you all instead. He and his friends did so, while Thomas and his group played loudly, though not loudly enough to drown out the prayers. The new children clearly felt Diana should have kept them quiet. Throughout the afternoon she sensed their disapproval. Once, when the chalk broke on the patchy blackboard and she muttered, Damn! it came at her back like a wave. Could disapproval really prevent the floral ceremony from being performed at the cave on Midsummer Eve? And if so, did it matter? Surely it stood for so much, the lost celebrations of Midsummer Day that had been disguised as St. John the Baptist Day, public bonfires, dancing in the streets. Man wouldn't have liked those medieval rites much either, she thought wryly, feeling stifled by the threat of disapproving prayer in her classroom. She'd never felt so in need of the relaxation classes that Helen from the post office organized each Monday evening. Walking along the high street, which a mist was shortening, she passed strolling couples whom she didn't recognize, presumably man's followers. A thought stirred in her mind, something ominous about the way the town was now. But before she could grasp it, she saw Helen tacking a notice to the outer door of the assembly rooms. Why, Helen, what's wrong? Diana said. Nothing at all. Everything couldn't be better. Helen's round face, which was always delicately made up, looked scrubbed raw. But I've given up yoga, and I hope I can persuade you to. You don't need that kind of thing when you've let God into your life. 9. Geraldine was threading the last of her flowers through the perimeter fence of the missile base when the police began to move everyone back. Come along, madam, an avuncular constable said. You know this is government property. I hope you'll have something besides flowers waiting for the enemy. Anyone in particular? He gave her a reproving look. I think we know who wants the whole world to be communists. Would you like your children to grow up under a communist regime? We haven't any children, Jeremy said in a ragged voice. The one we might have had, we lost. Maybe we can thank the nuclear lobby for that. There's been a lot more miscarriages since they started testing fucking bombs. There are ladies present, sir, if you don't mind. Just move along now, there's a good lad. His eyes were less patient than his words, and he seemed suddenly to have grown bulkier. It's all right, Jeremy, Geraldine murmured thinking that confrontations like this were one reason why some bases were being picketed solely by women. We have to be going anyway. There's all the new stock to be checked. They picked their way across the muddy, trampled grass of the dale to their van. The eight-year-old engine only coughed and groaned when Jeremy tried to start it, but it caught first time for her. Jeremy threw up his hands. Shows how much use I am. You're a lot more than useful to me. I'm all right, honestly. The policeman hadn't bothered her, even though it would have been Jonathan's birthday in just a few weeks. It was Andrew she wasn't sure about, not Jonathan. She drove fast through the mountains and up across the moors. As soon as the van was parked, she went round to the Bevans. Come in, then, Brian said distractedly, jutting his jaw as he led her to the kitchen where he was preparing dinner. Dried up baked beans and sausages sputtered in a pan, soggy chips blackened under the grill above which a new plaque said, God lives here. Don't go thinking I do this often, he said, only when she's helping at Godwin Mann's shop, and I've got half-day closing. The shop sold plaques, Bibles, pamphlets, whose covers showed people beaming as if they never did anything else. Here, let me rescue your dinner, Geraldine said, laughing. Trust a man to do nothing but open cans and defrost packets. June always makes this kind of dinner. Well, I expect it's Andrew's favorite, she said quickly, scraping chips off the grill pan. How's he getting on? What did he make of the God Show? 
It isn't up to him to make anything of it. We've a few new children's books if he wants to choose something. If you want to go giving away books you could sell, you aren't going to let me stop you. He seemed uncomfortable so close to her in the small, hot, smoky kitchen, and turned away to mutter, We're grateful, really. I know we could do with giving him more of our time and having a bit more patience. Maybe now our lives are being changed. Andrew was playing soldiers on the stairs. He'd snapped off the barrel of a plastic anti-aircraft gun and was sticking his chin out like his father so as not to cry. He brightened when he saw Geraldine. Do you want to see my V's? What's the matter with you, Brian demanded. Do you want Geraldine to think we don't bring you up to speak properly? See my V's, he mimicked in an idiot's voice. Geraldine wants to give you a book to read. I wouldn't blame her now if she gave you a baby's book. We'll find something to show your parents how well you can read, Geraldine said, as she led Andrew into the bookshop, where Jeremy was opening cartons with a Stanley knife. I expect you're looking forward to when they see your schoolwork. They said they won't. Geraldine thought she'd misunderstood. They'll be going to see Miss Kramer at the open night next week, won't they? My mom has to go to God's shop then, because they'll be praying, and my dad has to do something at home. Geraldine busied herself with showing him books, because she didn't trust herself to speak. When he chose the jungle book, on impulse she followed him next door. June was waiting for him on the garden path. Thanks for seeing him home, Geraldine. Heaven knows what he'd be up to otherwise. No need to overdo it, June. Diana Kramer was wondering if you'll be at the open night. I'd love to, but I have to go to a prayer meeting, and we can't leave the boy alone in the house. Jeremy or I will sit, you've only to ask, unless, she said, meaning to shame June, you'd rather we went to the school in your place. Brian leaned out of the front window. Would you mind? You do know his teacher better than we do. He looked both shamefaced and secretive, but Geraldine wasn't interested in his reasons. I think, she said shakily, we ought to let Andrew decide who he wants to go. Andrew stared at his scuffed shoes. Haven't you got a tongue, June snapped, and he looked up at Geraldine. You and Jeremy, he said in a small voice. That settled then, June said, in what was either bitterness or triumph. Geraldine was about to retort that it was nothing of the kind when the alarm at the bookshop began to shrill. She couldn't think for the noise. She ran back into the shop just as Jeremy switched off the alarm. I'll call Eddings, she said, eager to deal with him to use up some of her anger. He wasn't at home. I'll tell him you called as soon as he comes in, his wife Hazel said. Someone else's need is greater than ours, is it? You might say that, yes. He's visiting our neighbors on behalf of Godwin Man. I'm afraid praying isn't going to fix our alarm. Are you sure? Perhaps you should try while you're waiting. Geraldine made the worst face she could manage at the receiver and dropped it into its cradle. When he finishes God's work, he'll get round to his own, she told Jeremy. A pity we can't ask God to guarantee Benedict's work. And what had the Bevans to say for themselves? Don't lose your temper. I'm not about to lose my temper. Why should I lose my temper? There's no reason for me to lose my temper just because of people. She closed her eyes and gritted her teeth and growled, almost screaming, and then she told him what had happened. He didn't seem to know what was best to do any more than she did. Whatever they tried, she thought Andrew would be the loser. They argued about it all through dinner, though really she was arguing with herself. Eventually, she admitted, I can't think. Shall we go out for a drink or a walk or something? We can't if Eddings is coming. Go by yourself if you like. You've had a pretty grim day one way and another. I'll finish checking the stock and maybe catch you up later. Street lamps were lighting up in the dusk. The jagged edge of the moor above the town smoldered against the glassy purple sky. Geraldine walked quickly up the path to shake off the growing chill. How could she make the Bevans do right by Andrew? He was their responsibility, not hers. He wasn't her child. He wasn't Jonathan. Jonathan was safe wherever he was. She told herself that in the chilly, white-tiled Sheffield Hospital. Jonathan was alive somewhere, and growing. 
She didn't need to see him, though sometimes she did, in dreams. She wished she could share her conviction with Jeremy. But the only time she'd tried, he'd begun to humor her. Jonathan had felt threatened, in danger of ceasing to be, and she had never mentioned him again. She could keep him safe. It was Andrew who had to live in the real world and cope with whatever it did to him. She stepped onto the moor and followed the path that glowed dark green in the dusk. The chill of the limestone seeped up like mist through the grass. She walked faster, hugging herself, wondering why the chill should make her nervous. She was on the bare stone above the cave when she remembered and halted, shivering. Home from the hospital, she'd made herself give away Jonathan's clothes at once. She'd opened the chest of drawers in the room that would have been his. She'd reached in to take a handful of baby clothes, and then she'd sucked in a breath that hurt her teeth, for the clothes had felt like ice. She could feel her fingertips aching with the cold as she'd begun to shake from head to foot. She'd stood there, unable to let go or pull away until Jeremy had found her. Later, when he'd got rid of the clothes, she'd learned that he'd felt nothing odd about them, no undue cold at all. The full moon trailed a rainbow halo over the clouds on the horizon. The moorland path reappeared, having faded under the sky that was now almost black. The tents on the higher slopes were chunks of ice. She hadn't known what the cold meant then, and she didn't know now— Certainly not that it was so cold wherever Jonathan was, but she didn't want to be alone with that thought up here, especially when the moonlight made the landscape even bleaker. She hurried past the cave, heading for the path that led down to the far end of Moonwell. Then she faltered, for there was no longer a gritstone wall around the cave. In the moonlight it looked even deeper. Though she was at the edge of the stone bowl, she felt too close to the gaping dark. She started away, and a fragment of rock flew from under her heel, skittered down the bowl. For no reason she could grasp, she was terrified that it would fall into the cave. She ran for the path, stumbling, almost falling. The moonlight crept across the town below her, glinted on the roofs of the cottages above the pools of streetlight. It followed her as she stepped over the edge toward the church. It glided over three faces in a narrow stained glass window, made them appear to turn on a single neck. Among the newest gravestones under the oak, one stone was brighter than the rest. In the moonlight it seemed almost to glow. Moonlight gathered in the churchyard as she reached the pavement. Columns of shadow stretched across the whitened grass. Blurs at the ends of the columns groped over the church wall. Geraldine peered across the road, then she crossed to the pavement bordering the churchyard. She still couldn't see the name on the glowing headstone, couldn't tell what kind of stone it was that was able to reflect the moonlight so strongly, almost as if it were shining itself. She paced along the railings and lifted the latch of the iron gate. The gate must have been oiled recently, for there was no sound. Perhaps her straining to read the stone at the edge of the shadow of the oak was blanking out her other senses— as she stepped onto the moonlit gravel path, she wasn't aware of her footsteps. The light that seemed to have congealed into a stony stillness made her begin to shiver. She left the path and advanced between the mossy stones, her feet slipping on mounds that reminded her of beds. She was close enough to read the inscription now, the little there was of it, and her legs were shaking. She had to support herself on stones that crumbled under her fingers. When she fell to her knees in front of the glowing stone, far brighter than the stones on either side of it, it was to stop herself from trembling as much as anything. But she was shivering as if she might never stop. The only date on the unblemished headstone was eight years ago, and the only name was Jonathan. Ten. I hope I'll see you at the pub tonight, Mrs. Wainwright, Phoebe. If he called her Mrs. Wainwright, Eustace thought, she might tell him to call her Phoebe. That would help. He'd known exactly what to say to her until he turned the corner into Church Row, tugging so hard at his collar that the button flew into the road to be pulverized under the wheels of a delivery van. Mrs. Wainwright, he decided. And now all he had to do was walk along Roman Row, press down the latch of her bright green wooden gate, walk under the trellis of flowering vines, and up the gravel path that was as good as a watchdog for letting her know someone was approaching. 
lift his leaden hand to the doorbell, take a deep breath that he meant to hold until they came face to face, so that he would have to let it out and ask her at once. He'd already sucked in his breath when he realized that he hadn't taken out the magazine he was supposed to be delivering. He pulled it out so hastily that he spilled half the contents of the post bag on the cottage doorstep, just as she opened the door. As he fell to his knees, he thought of how he looked, a swain kneeling before his lady love, who didn't even know she was. When she squatted to help him, her dress rode up her plump thighs, and he almost fell over backward. He was intensely aware of her perfume that smelled wild as heather, her lightly freckled bare arms, the bare upper curves of her large breasts, her deep brown eyes, small nose, very pink, full lips, her blonde hair in a ponytail that trailed down her back. Her soft, warm hand touched his as she handed him letters. Thanks very much, he mumbled, and lurched to his feet as soon as he could, only to realize that now he looked as if he were staring down the front of her dress. She stood up with a gracefulness that both surprised and moved him. You can sort your letters on my table, if you like. The front room was neat as his own, a solitary person's room. Fossils were outlined in some of the stones of the fireplace that she had built herself. Eustace dropped the letters on the embroidered tablecloth and glanced away from a photograph of her late husband, long face divided by a mustache, to a photograph of Phoebe dwarfed by last year's cave dressing, a floral picture of a man dressed in gold and brandishing a sword, a halo like the sun around his head. You'll still be dressing, will you, Eustace said, suddenly picturing her naked and not knowing where to look. Don't worry, I know what you meant. She giggled, then grew sober. Some of the people who usually help have started making excuses. I hope there'll still be enough. I wouldn't like to think our town would let itself be told what to do by someone who's never even seen the ceremony. Exactly. Ask her now, his voice was clamoring, so loudly that he felt as if he were wearing headphones again. But his mouth felt as if he'd swallowed superglue, and his expert hands had sorted the letters before he could say anything. He took a deep breath and heard himself say the only thing he was capable of. Thank you. He was heading clumsily for the door, wanting only to be out and by himself, when she said, Did you have any reason for calling except to unload yourself on my doorstep? Sorry. I've been nursing this all along. He handed her the magazine and remembered that her husband had been a male nurse, killed two years ago as he drove off the road in the midst of an instant peak district fog. I don't suppose you were dying to read it, he said, and wished he could bury his head in the post bag. She was both smiling and frowning when the doorbell rang. He followed her as she opened the door to two women with bright open faces, shoulder bags stuffed with pamphlets and books. Will you let God into your house, one said. Eustace slipped past them. I'm going now, so there'll be room for him. You'll have to excuse me, too, I'm afraid, Phoebe said to the women. As she closed the door, she called after Eustace. I'll see you later. I'm looking forward to your show at the pub. He was so delighted that he almost went straight home without finishing his walk. He delivered the rest of the mail, then he strolled home to his cottage between the high street and a steep slope to the moor. He lay on the couch and watched Stan Laurel burn down Hardy's house while trying to help him clear up after a party. For once, he didn't even need to feel that someone was clumsier than himself. Later, he brought home fish and chips from the shop on the high street. Then he walked through the darkening town to the one-armed soldier. The pub was crowded. The faces under the low oak beams were mostly unfamiliar. They often were on folk nights like tonight, or when Eric, the landlord, showed a film on the video screen. In a corner full of horse brasses, Eustace saw the producers from Radio Sheffield. Anthony, who'd thought he wasn't worth the tape, was shaking his head on its wiry neck to fling back his graying hair. Eustace hadn't time to talk to them now, even if he'd felt like doing so. He always arrived with just a few minutes to spare so as not to lose his confidence. But when Eric bought him a pint of ale and called, Take your seats, ladies and gentlemen, for Moonwell's own comedian, Eustace Gift. There was still no sign of Phoebe. 
Eustace squeezed between the tables, sipping from his tankard so that it wouldn't slop over, and climbed the steps to the makeshift stage. He'd show Anthony from Radio Sheffield that he was a comedian after all. He'd found out he was the night he'd chatted to Eric about his usual pratfall-ridden week, so enthusiastically that he hadn't noticed everyone was listening until they'd cheered him at the end and brought him drinks. He couldn't wait for Phoebe. The show had to go on. That's me, he said, settling himself on the straight chair in the middle of the bare stage. Eustace by name and Eustace by nature. A small woman at a table by the window laughed raucously. That's Eustace love, meaning rich in corn, he said, and got a more general laugh, if rather a polite one. He was glancing about for someone else to chat to. Make one laugh, he believed, and you've won yourself a friend who will spread the laughter. When the door opened and Phoebe came in, she looked breathless. Perhaps she'd been running for him. She gave him a quick apologetic smile, and at once he felt inches taller. I deliver the letters in Moonwell while Phoebe Wainwright there delivers the babies. Lucky it isn't the other way round, or I might be delivering second-class citizens. That brought another polite laugh, but all it earned him from the radio producers was a faint shift of the lips. It was time to give them something sharper. Things may change now that Mission Moonwell's come to town. I believe soon we're going to have to call letter boxes epistle boxes. Don't tell me you thought epistle was what you are when you come out of a pub. Father O'Connell, who was sitting with Diana Kramer, laughed at that, and so did the radio producers. I hear Godwin Mann's been resting in his room at the hotel since he introduced himself to Moonwell, Eustace said with an innocent look. But don't tell anyone, will you? Probably gives him a headache listening to God's voice all the time. Good job that never happens to me. The way I am, I'd get a crossed line, hear a voice saying, Fasten your seatbelts, or what color underwear are you wearing? He reached for his tankard, but let his hand dangle. The laughter he was leaving space for hadn't come. A few late laughs sounded encouraging rather than spontaneous. As he took a quick swallow of ale, he saw the butcher leaning against the bar, gazing at Eustace as if he wished he'd try a different style of humor. That couldn't be right. The butcher had been skeptical enough at the rally. Now it looks as if it's getting too crowded in Mr. Man's room, Eustace said, because he's sending people round the town to ask if someone will let God into their house. When Steve, the other man from Radio Sheffield, laughed at that, heads turned to stare at him. Otherwise, there was silence, though surely it couldn't be as pained as Eustace felt it was. He was in danger of losing control, both of himself and the audience. Gloom and despondency to the rescue, he thought desperately. Hey up, Mr. Gloom. They want us to let God into our house. Tell them we don't take lodgers, Mr. Despondency. They say we can't keep him out. He's too big. Great balls of fire. You know what this means, don't you? Every night, loaves and fishes for tea. Nobody was laughing. Eustace found he was staring at a woman he'd never seen before, willing her even to smile. She stared blankly at him, asked if she wondered how much longer she had to wait for the next act, and the answer to that felt like a last-minute rescue. Anyway, that's enough from me and the firm of gloom and despondency for now, he said, almost stammering. Time for some music from, from our own Billy Bell. So many people stared at him as if he'd meant that as a joke, that he thought for a moment he'd transposed the vowels. No, he could hear what he'd said, echoing in his invisible headphones. He climbed down from the stage, his legs hindering each other, and made for a dark corner to let his face cool down. Bearded Billy, the postmistress's son, was raising his guitar above his head on the way to the stage when a young woman stood up, blocking his way. May I tell a good joke? Billy hesitated. Go on, voices cried. She was tall and fresh-faced, with pigtails and a smile that said she couldn't wait to tell the joke. People were laughing eagerly before she sat down on the edge of the stage. There was this Irishman called Simon O'Serene, she said, and giggled. And he suddenly finds he's out of work, so he says to himself, I feel lucky. I'll spend my savings on a holiday abroad instead of sitting around doing nothing. 
So he goes off to Israel for his summer holidays. And one day he goes to Jerusalem because he's heard there's going to be a parade. So he's standing in the crowd waiting for the parade to come along, and a pickpocket steals all his money while he isn't looking. And Simon says to himself, Oh, dear me, what's this now? I could have sworn this was my lucky day. Eustace was bewildered. He not only didn't see anything to laugh at, especially not her phony Irish accent, but she was killing her joke by giggling in advance. Yet around him, everyone was smiling. Some were laughing outright, as she said. So he's looking round for a policeman when he hears the parade coming, and he says to himself he's come to see it, he may as well get his money's worth. So here's the procession coming along, and Simon sees sixpence lying in the middle of the road. So he goes in the road, and he's just bending down to pick up this sixpence, when the procession comes along, and they put something on his back. So he says, what's this now? All I did was bend down to pick up this sixpence because I was feeling lucky, and someone puts a cross on my back. But Jesus says to him, want to hear some good news? This really is your lucky day. Eustace gaped, not just at her, but at the laughter and applause that greeted the punchline. Now he noticed how many of the people in the pub were drinking soft drinks. He began to realize that he'd seen many of the faces at man's rally, in the choir. He must point that out to the producers from Radio Sheffield. But before he could struggle over to them, they'd sidled out of the pub. He slumped back into the corner. They hadn't even given him a chance to redeem himself. The young woman told jokes about doubting Thomas and Pentecost to redoubled applause, and then she said, Would you like to hear a story now? I think we'd better have some music, the landlord said, obviously unhappy with the way the evening was developing. Billy Bell had picked up his guitar when a voice beside the bar said, There's an old song I'd like to remind you folk of before Midsummer Eve. It was Nathaniel Needham, Moonwell's old man, who lived in a cottage on the moors. Though people claimed he was over a hundred years old, he still had most of his faculties. He raised his long, wizened face toward the oak beams, his white hair trailing over his collar, and began to sing in a strong, clear, nasal voice. Three brave lads went walking when the sun it was high, swore they'd find Harry Mooney and poke in his eye. Here's the chorus now, join in, if you like. Go down, Harry Mooney, harry us no more. We've flowers to please you to leave at your door. Three brave lads went walking, went into the wood. They found Harry Mooney while the light it was good. Go down, Harry Mooney. He sang, but only the landlord joined in. The old man went on, smiling oddly to himself. Three brave lads, they chopped him up limb from limb. They rolled him down where the light it was dim. Three brave lads went walking when the moon it was new. They went back to see if their victory was true. They heard Harry Mooney laugh to wake the dead. The boys have my eyes, but that'll give me the heads. One brave lad put his head down the hole. Harry Mooney, he's got it, his head and his soul. Two brave lads bolt their doors and locks but bolt and lock open to the dead man's knock. Who's that knocking? Let me hear the hello. Tis the friend come a-calling with note in his collar. Jump out the window and run like a hare. There's nowhere to hide but Harry Mooney hears where. Two brave lads leave their heads down below, two bodies walking, and one more to go. Old Moon's a-laughing and showing his teeth, Harry Mooney, he is coming from his grave beneath. The priest's in the well and the night's in the sun, and nobody leaves till Harry Mooney is done. Go down, Harry Mooney, harry us no more. We flowers to please you to leave at your door. Eustace came back to himself with a start. He couldn't have said how the song affected him, but it had made him forget where he was. There was a little applause, but few people seemed to have cared for the song. Some looked offended. As Billy Bell reached the stage at last, Diana came over to Eustace. Father O'Connell and I want you to know we enjoyed your act so far. We could see the problems you were facing. Thanks, he mumbled, and was suddenly shyer than ever.
Whatever instinct let him pretend in front of an audience that he wasn't shy had deserted him. He'd no chance of winning back this audience, and what would they think of him for trying? There were too many people in the pub whom he'd have to meet in the course of his work. The idea of having to face them after he'd made even more of a fool of himself was unbearable. He shoved himself out of the corner looking anywhere but at Phoebe and struggled to the door. Outside, he discovered how drunk he was. Most of a face appeared to be rolling about the sky above the moors, grinning at him. He stumbled home and fell into bed and woke next morning with the sense that a joke had been played on him. The whole evening had been a joke, but he couldn't turn it into one that would make him laugh. He groped his way through the dawning streets to sort the delivery, wondering what tricks the day had in store for him. When he heard about the sheep, he thought at first that it was a sick joke. Eleven. Craig tried to keep his temper as they left the one-armed soldier. He'd felt like leaving once Eustace had been driven out, but Hazel and Benedict had wanted to stay to the end. The bearded youth with the guitar had received polite applause, but most of the audience had obviously been waiting for the last act, a Christian duo with an array of instruments and joyful messages. Craig resented the way they seemed to assume they had the greatest right to take the stage. He would have said so if Hazel and Benedict hadn't been with friends. Hazel had met them at the new Christian shop where she was helping. Mel held out his large, moist hands whenever he wanted to make a point, his wife Ursula nodding her head at every claim he made. Both were bubbling over with joy, and Craig had had enough of them long before they reached the Eddings's cottage, where Hazel had invited her friends for coffee. Halfway along the high street, he said, you seem to have had a good time this evening. Didn't you? Ursula cried. I thought it was super. I enjoyed the comedian, the first one. I rather felt some of you were glad to see the back of him. I certainly was, Benedict said. Moonwell can do without that sort of thing. Can't do without a postman, though, can it? I wouldn't blame him if he decided Moonwell could. You wouldn't blame him, Mel said, drooping his shoulder toward Craig. Surely you would. It's up to all of us to blame him, to show him where he's gone wrong. Craig breathed heavily rather than argue when he'd had so much to drink. But Vera spoke up. You don't usually go into pubs, do you, any of you new people? Were you there tonight to spoil his show? You can't spoil something that's already worthless, Benedict said. You were, weren't you? You were in there meaning to destroy him. Oh, really, now? I don't think so, Ursula said brightly. He must be a pretty poor comedian if one failure destroys him. I hope it'll teach him to make the kind of jokes we can all laugh at. But you must remember that he went on stage tonight meaning to destroy our faith in God. I should think God and your faith can look after themselves. You near as damn it took over the pub so that the people who weren't on your side would be too embarrassed to laugh. No, no, Mel said as gently as a sick bed visitor. The people are already with us, as you saw. They've realized they need God, not his enemies. Such as us, you mean, Craig growled. Mummy isn't, not deep in her heart, Hazel said, almost pleading, and neither would you be if you'd just take the time to think. For a moment, Craig wanted to take her hand, squeeze it to let her know she shouldn't worry about him, especially not when he was trying not to worry about her. Mel and Ursula began to murmur a hymn, and the Eddingses joined in. They were still singing when they reached the cottage on the moorland road. Craig slumped in a chair in the front room under a mass-produced painting of Christ holding out his hands, a tasteful dab of blood on each palm. It was the lack of any painterly feeling that offended Craig, the assumption that any kind of representation ought to be enough to provoke an automatic response. He hoped Benedict had bought the painting, not Hazel. Mel and Ursula sat down in the corner seat, and Mel read Craig's face as he looked away from the painting. Aren't you at all spiritual, Mel said. Put me down as a don't know, if you like. Christ doesn't allow neutrality. Anyone who isn't with him is against him. He held out his hands as if he were offering Craig something large, yet weightless. Can you really search your heart and say there isn't emptiness where there should be faith? Emptiness is good enough for me. Mel turned to Vera. 
Hazel said you were more of a believer. We believers have a duty to show others the right path. I believe in Pascal's wager. Pardon? The philosopher who argued that since the existence of God can be proved, it's worth betting he exists, because if he doesn't, you've lost nothing. But if he does, you've gained, well, whatever you've gained. That sophistry masquerading as faith. The only way to believe in God is let him rule your life. I think we're a bit old for that, Craig said. We don't feel the need to be constantly told what to do. Benedict carried in a tray full of mugs of coffee. Some people might think that's what you want to do to us. What do you mean, Benedict? Some people. Suddenly Craig wanted to get the inevitable confrontation over with. If you've something to say, spit it out. What do you feel you're a victim of? Benedict set the tray down carefully next to a pile of tracts. Excuse me. Thank you, he said as he passed the mugs round. And then he blinked at Craig. Well, I think you need to accept the way Hazel's grown up, and I think you'd like to tell me how to run my business. If Vera and I were going to lend you the money you asked for, we'd have wanted to. I suppose that's fair, to let you make suggestions anyway. I said if, Benedict, if we'd been going to lend you the money. Hazel tried to steady her mug with both hands, winced at the heat, and put down the mug on the hearth. Aren't you going to, she said, her voice a little too high. We don't know how much we'll have to spare, if anything, Vera said. We don't know where we'll be living. Not in Moonwell, if it carries on the way it's going. What way is that? Benedict demanded. All Godwin wants to do is make a little piece of the world free of crime and sin and corruption. He can do it here because we're so cut off, safe from outside influences. Surely even you can't say that's not worth doing. Even who? Craig felt his chest stiffening with anger. Even someone as sinful as us? Perhaps now you see why we wouldn't feel welcome. Oh, Daddy, you know you're both always welcome, Hazel pleaded, but Benedict interrupted. You haven't told me what you don't like about my business methods. Don't be so sure you'd want to hear. I'll tell you one thing we don't care for, and that's the way you use Hazel to try and drum up customers. We've heard some of the abuse she's had to put up with, and no wonder the way you expect her to play on people's fears to sell your damned alarms. I don't mind, Daddy, really I don't. It's my duty to help. Oh, for Christ's sake, Hazel, when did you turn into such a bloody prig, Craig demanded, and gritted his teeth as if he could bite back what he'd said. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Put it down to the drink. I forgive you. Craig gritted his teeth harder. What's wrong, Benedict asked lightly. She said she forgives you. Yes, because your friend man says she has to. Am I right? You're forgiving me because it's your duty, Hazel. Isn't that so? It's got nothing to do with my loving you or your loving me or anything else that's real. He turned on Benedict. I'll tell you what's wrong with your kind of forgiveness. It suppresses the feelings you'd have if you were honest with yourself. I thought religion was supposed to bring peace. That's the one way it might have got to me at my age. But if I lived around your forgiveness for any length of time, I'd end up with an ulcer. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm very tired, and I've already said too much. Nevertheless, he halted in the doorway. As far as your business problems are concerned, I should think you ought to trust God to provide. He labored upstairs to the bathroom and splashed water on his face, glared at himself in the mirror as he brushed his teeth. When he went into the bedroom with its twin folding beds, Vera was waiting for him. I said we'd leave in the morning, she told him in a small voice. We've given up on Moonwell, have we? I couldn't have stood it much longer either. But when she came back from the bathroom, put out the light, and climbed into her shaky bed, her voice was unsteadier. I just hope he won't stop her from coming to visit us, she murmured. She's still Hazel, however she's changed. I still want to see her. Damn old age for not letting us drive the way we could once. When she was asleep, Craig lay hearing what she'd said. Why couldn't he have kept quiet downstairs instead of trying to win an argument that led nowhere? The thought of God when man and his followers enraged him, the woman who'd taken the stage after Eustace, most of all. 
Humor was a calculated technique they were using, like their imitations of every form of popular song. How could Hazel be taken in by them? Where had he and Vera gone wrong? He felt clumsy and vulnerable. Perhaps that was why he dreamed he was. He found himself back in his childhood, found himself driven to do things for a dare he didn't even want to do. He was climbing down the rope into the disused mine shaft on the moor above Moonwell, but this time he knew what would happen, so he was struggling to make his hands drag him out of the dark while there was still a chance. He just managed to halt his descent by gripping the rope with his arms and legs when the knot that fastened the rope to a rock came loose. He didn't fall far. Rough stone thumped the breath out of him. His friend's face appeared at the top of the shaft as if at the wrong end of a telescope, shouting that he'd go for help. And then Craig was left lying, bruised and breathless, deep in the dark that seemed to be gathering like mud in his lungs. He couldn't breathe because he knew what came next, and now he could feel it coming. Something reaching for him along the tunnels of the abandoned mine. Something that would drag him into the dark until he could be dragged no further, until his shoulders were wedged and his head was poking helplessly into the blackest dark. Now that was where he was, his shoulders crushed together so that he couldn't move, and whatever had dragged him there was reaching for his head. He woke with his face in the pillow, suffocating. At least that muffled his cry. He sat up then to free himself of the dream. Of course, none of the worst had happened. He'd been rescued before it could have. It wouldn't have happened anyway. He had just been a frightened child. He must have dreamed about it now because of the song he'd heard in the pub, though he couldn't remember having heard the song before. He got stiffly to his feet and tiptoed to the window to let the view take the place of the dream. He pushed back one curtain so that moonlight spread into the room, but stopped short of Vera's bed. He turned back to the window to find out why the moonlight was flickering, lapping the carpet. He looked up, and then he craned forward, banging his forehead on the pane. The moor was on fire. How could fire be so white? For a moment he thought it was mist or gas, except that it moved like neither— the edge of the moor looked more charred than ever, and white flames were dancing on the stone, on the heather and the grass. Then the flames reddened and leaped higher, and Craig was shoving himself away from the window to raise the alarm when he heard a fire engine heading for the moor. He watched until the edge of the moor was still again, not even a hint of smoke under the remains of the moon, and then he went back to bed. In the morning he learned that someone unknown had started a fire up there— the fire had driven a flock of sheep through the tents, injuring two of man's followers. Several of the animals had plunged straight into the unwalled cave above which man had held his rally. Benedict recounted all this in a tone that seemed almost to imply that Craig and Vera were somehow culpable. Apart from that, he said very little as he drove them back to Sheffield, and Craig had nothing to distract him from feeling that he shouldn't have let himself be forced out of Moonwell though it was certainly too late now. He kept remembering that first sight of flames that had looked white as ash, white as the moon. Twelve. The PTA meeting seemed more than ever like a class for adults, but they weren't treated as such. As Diana followed Sally's father into the assembly hall, Mrs. Scragg remarked, "'Now we can start, I suppose,' as if Diana should have spent less time in discussing children with their parents. Diana took her place at the trestle table on the stage, and Mrs. Scragg slapped the table with the heel of her hand, sending a dull echo across the crowded hall. "'I hope you all know what happened by the cave,' she thundered. Perhaps she didn't mean to sound accusing, but quite a few people looked away from her. "'I don't know who the terrorists and vandals are who'd stoop to cruelty to dumb animals, but they'd better stay away from my husband and I if they know what's good for them, and they'd better realize it'll take more than them setting fire to the moor to drive Godwin Man out of our lives.' She grabbed the edge of the table with both red-knuckled hands and hitched herself forward at the parents. "'Now I'll tell you what me and my husband have done to help our new friends. We've invited two of them to stay in our house for as long as they're in Moonwell.' Let the cowards try to harm them now. I hope every one of you will do the same, at least all of you that own your own homes. If that was intended to exclude Diana, that was fine by her. 
Mrs. Cragg sat back, snorting for emphasis, and Mr. Scragg cleared his throat minutely. Before we move on to the rest of the business, are there any comments, he said. A hand waved toward the back of the hall. Mr. Millman, Mr. Scragg acknowledged. I appreciate the points you were making, Mrs. Scragg, but Mrs. Scragg frowned at him as if she'd never seen him before. Stand up now or we'll not be able to hear you. He stood up awkwardly, leaning on the folding seat in front of him. I was saying that, of course, I don't approve of trying to drive people out that way, but I do think it's understandable if there's a bit of resentment about... I mean, nobody asked for the town to be changed overnight. My family and I go to church every Sunday, and we don't need to be made to feel that isn't enough. Several people were nodding agreement, even murmuring. Perhaps this time, Diana thought, they'd speak up for themselves. Nobody asked Mary and Joseph if they wanted to have the Christ child, Mrs. Cragg said. If all you're wanting is to cry over the spilt milk, Mr. Milkman, I think we'll be getting on with the business of the meeting. It isn't all, as a matter of fact. Mr. Millman stood up straighter. I was saying to Miss Kramer that some of your new pupils have been giving our Kirsty nightmares. Mr. Scragg sat up on the two cushions that added height to his chair. And what did Miss Kramer say to you? She said I ought to raise the question here. Did she now? I hope so, Mrs. Scragg said tightly. And how are our new friends supposed to be giving the girl nightmares? By telling her the devil will get her if she doesn't confess every silly little wrong she does. Why, they even wanted her to tell Miss Kramer she'd fallen asleep one night before saying her prayers. I admire Miss Kramer, and I know she wouldn't want to hear that sort of thing. They've got Kirstie having nightmares about something walking down the moonlight and growing bigger, and heaven knows what else. That's not what she comes to school to learn. If I could just explain, one of man's followers said, we believe in helping one another. A sin confessed is a burden shared. Our children are only trying to help yours. Maybe you should ask yourself if God is sending your child nightmares to show where she's gone wrong. I'll tell you what. I know my child a damn sight better than your children do, and I don't think I'm the only one who feels that way. He glanced quickly about the noncommittal faces. Isn't that so? The murmurs of assent were muted and difficult to locate. Mrs. Scragg smirked at him. You'll have to face up to it. Not all children are as perfect as yours. I reckon I'm speaking for most of us here when I say that anything we can do to improve them is worth doing. Not much chance of improvement with the size of your classes now, Jeremy Booth said. You can't expect children to do their best when they're sitting two to a desk. They cope well enough in my class and my husband's. Mrs. Scragg craned her neck and found him. You aren't even a parent. What do you mean by pretending you are? He's here on behalf of Andrew's parents, Diana said. Mrs. Scragg didn't even glance at her. Let's be hearing from someone who's got the right to speak. Who's going to speak up for the school? Our new friends will be thinking they were wrong about us. You have to have rules, Mr. Clegg, the greengrocer said shyly, even rules that don't make sense. When the children grow up, they'll have to obey laws that may not make sense to them either. Diana thought of some of the Scraggs' rules. No trousers for girls in the winter, no juice for the children to drink at lunchtime, only hot water. Aren't you talking about training people never to want to change anything? Too much of that, and we'd be training them not to think. They aren't here to think. They're here to learn. Mrs. Scragg looked pleased with her turn of phrase. I want a show of hands now. You've all heard the arguments. You know people who aren't even brave enough to show their faces are doing things you never thought you'd see in our town, just because they don't want to be told they're sinners like the rest of us. Now then, with all that going on, who wants to see less discipline here at the school? That wasn't what we were talking about, Kirsty's father protested. It may not be what you wanted to talk about, but there are other children besides yours to be considered. If she keeps on having nightmares, you'd best get her to the doctor. Now then, does anybody want to make our new friends feel unwelcome because they act like Christians? Mrs. Scragg snorted when there was no response. So, who isn't happy about the discipline? 
Kirsty's father and Jeremy raised their hands at once. A few others went up tentatively. Parents were glancing surreptitiously about to see if there was enough of a response for their own not to be singled out and deciding against responding. Not many of you, Mr. Scragg said, slapping his small hands together. If anybody wants a word with me afterward, I'll be waiting. But after the meeting, the rest of which was uneventful, several parents came into Diana's classroom to tell her how much they preferred her teaching to the rest of the school. Presumably, they were too afraid for their children to have spoken up at the meeting. We were thinking of moving to Manchester anyway, Kirsty's father told her. And suddenly, that seemed a world away. She walked home feeling slow and dull. The moon was out of sight behind a sharp-edged frieze of chimneys. Beyond the forest, an airliner glinted like a fly, its sound out of all proportion to its apparent size. She led herself into her cottage, away from the rumbling dark, and made for bed. She slept dreamlessly, wakened, feeling refreshed and optimistic. After all, man and his followers would move on once he'd achieved his token victory over paganism, and she could carry on treating her pupils the way she felt they should be treated, once man's young mouthpieces weren't there to tell tales. She'd already achieved quite a lot with her regular class, despite the scrags. She felt far more capable as the sun chased the shadows back under the cottages, and when she saw Mr. Scragg beckoning her curtly from the window of his office, she marched straight in. He pushed a typewritten sheet across his desk to her. For your immediate attention. It was an undertaking not to teach moral or religious matters, except in the manner specified by the headmaster. The teaching generally should take a Christian view of history and life today should ensure that the children behaved like Christians to one another. She read on, noting misspellings and jumping letters. What do you want me to do with this, she said. Mr. Scragg gazed blankly at her. Sign it, please. I don't think you can ask me to do that. It isn't in my contract of employment. His small face seemed to harden beneath the bristling gray eyebrows, yet when he spoke his voice was almost lilting. In that case... I have to tell you that this school no longer needs your services, he said. 13. As Saturday wore on, June grew impatient with Andrew. At last she gave him some Christian stickers to put up around the shop, but when he tried to climb into the display window, she threw up her hand. What do you want to do, knock everything down? Try and have the sense God gave you, she cried, and Brian intervened. Come on, son, you can help me in the back. In fact, there wasn't much to do in the long, narrow room that smelled of boots and rope and cold primus stoves. What do you want to do, son? Brian murmured. The boy peered timidly up at him from under his eyebrows that were hardly there at all. I can read to you. You've already done that for your mother. You don't need to do any more today, Brian said, and saw Andrew suck in his hollow cheeks with disappointment. All right, if you want to. The boy scampered into the shop, shouting, Daddy says I can read to him. Brian felt ashamed of himself, wished again that he'd attended the open night and talked to Andrew's teacher. He would have, except that since the rally at the cave, he'd been reluctant to show his face in public. Since the rally, he'd seen women looking in the shop window and pretending they weren't talking about him. Once he'd overheard a murmur about the things his poor wife had to put up with, the things he forced her to do. He wanted to tell them he hadn't touched June since the rally. He wouldn't, while she didn't want him to, however frustrating it was for him. But he couldn't tell anyone that. No doubt the town thought even worse of him because he was too ashamed to invite one of Godwin's followers to take refuge in the house. At least June was no longer taking Valium. Godwin's religion had done that for her. Perhaps in time she would be more patient with Andrew. He wished he could be more patient himself. Sometimes when it was just himself and Andrew, he didn't feel so bad. But when Andrew began to read him a pamphlet, he couldn't help wincing inwardly whenever the boy misread a word. Not ice ache, he said, trying to be gentle. You don't want to grow up not being able to read or write properly, do you? You don't want to have to work down a mine because you can't get anything better, stay down there all day in the dark. When Andrew tried, ice acre. Brian wanted to shake the stupidity out of him. It's Isaac, damn it, Isaac. See if you can read just one line without making a fool of yourself. 
Andrew almost read the last sentence right, about how God wanted every child to obey his parents and teachers and anyone in uniform. He gave his father one quick pleading glance, which made Brian feel awkward and embarrassed. That was better, he muttered. Come on, I'll take you to watch the football for trying. Wind herded clouds across the sun, racing shadows molded themselves to the slopes. As Brian and Andrew walked down the steepening streets to the edge of the town, the wind carried the smell of charred vegetation from the moor above Moonwell. Would Isaac's daddy really have killed him, Andrew said? It's only a story, son, to show you how to behave, or if it's true it happened a long, long time ago. Would you kill me if God said you had to? Nobody is going to tell me to kill you. Now stop being morbid and watch the game. Two teams were playing five-a-side in the field that the school also used. Fathers and sons and old men smoking pipes stood outside the white lines shouting. Pass it! Pass the ball! Brian yelled. Oh, you silly bugger! When Andrew flinched, he gripped the boy's shoulder. I'm not shouting at you. You can shout too. But Andrew stood staring even when the ball rolled almost to his feet. Go on, son, kick it, Brian cried. The players were yelling at him, too. Kick it as hard as you can, son. You're not a girl, Brian told him, and the boy lurched forward. He gave the ball a glancing kick, slipped in the mud and fell. Brian led him home with Andrew holding out his muddy arms on either side of his body. In the bathroom, he waited for his father to undress him. Can't you even do that for yourself, Brian growled, embarrassed by having to touch the boy's pale skin his penis that was shrinking back into his scrotum as if it didn't want to be seen. He needn't feel guilty, he told himself. June was embarrassed now, too, whenever she saw the boy naked. He ignored Andrew's protests that the bath was too hot, hauled him out when the boy lay there, saying that his fingertips looked like raisins, and eventually got him dry and dressed and back to the shop. June raised her eyes heavenward. Where are the clothes you were wearing? What have you been up to now? Someone kicked a ball at him, and he fell down, love. His clothes are in the washer. He's got to get dirty sometimes if he's going to be a proper boy. You're no better. Look at your shoes. You don't have to roll in the mud to prove you're men, do you? June was smiling wryly. Never mind, Andrew. At least there are some decent children for you to play with now, not like the ones who always tease you. I'd rather play with you and Daddy. Would you? June hugged him. Then we will. It's about time we were more of a family. I'm glad you care more for us than for your so-called friends at the bookshop. I think they've been pretty good friends to us all, Brian intervened. Oh, do you? Well, I'll tell you what I think. She checked herself. But not in front of Andrew and not while we've got a customer. A young woman was looking in the window, comparing prices. As Brian hurried Andrew into the storeroom, she came into the shop, and Brian caught a glimpse of her. Large breasts, long, bare, sun-tanned arms and legs. Broke my flask this morning, she told June. I'll take that green one in the window. You can count these for me, son, Brian murmured, opening a carton of boot laces. He heard June say, Have you walked far? Ten miles this morning. Hey, don't think me rude, but don't go putting any of those stickers on my flask, will you? If God wants me to carry his advertising, he'll have to pay me. I didn't think we had towns like this in England. God in every window. It's a pity there aren't a few more towns like this. Haven't you any time at all for God? I've just walked away from that and my parents, told them I was going walking for a fortnight, and they mustn't ask me where. What do you call this town, anyway? Moonwell. Can't say I've heard of it. Must have overlooked it on the map. Thanks for the flask. Listen, I hope I didn't offend you with my big mouth. I don't matter. It's God you should worry about, and yourself. And you should think of your parents. At least let them know where you are. It isn't that simple, the young woman said, and Brian heard her striding away from the counter, her haversack jiggling. He imagined her bottom swaying in the tight denim shorts, her pert face that he'd glimpsed her wide, moist lips. His penis had hardened as soon as she'd mentioned her big mouth. What's wrong, Daddy? Andrew said. Brian opened his eyes, quieted his breathing, and suddenly saw his chance. He had to take it, had to escape the room that had grown hot and stifling. I've dropped some money down by the football field, he said, and as soon as he heard the shop door close, went out to tell June. 
The young woman was turning the corner of Moorland Lane as he came out of the shop. She was going straight up to the moor then, not following the main road. Realizing where she was going excited him, though he couldn't have said why. He strolled along casually to Moorland Lane, and as soon as she was out of sight on the path the side street led to, he paced to the end to wait until she reached the moor. A loose stone came rattling down the slope as she climbed over the edge. Brian glanced along the terraces of cottages before stepping onto the path. Nobody was about, and the street was still deserted when he reached the top. He poked his head over the edge. The young woman was striding along the path that would take her past the cave. She was alone on the moor, or thought she was. Nobody would see or hear. Nobody would, because Brian wasn't going to do anything, only imagine what he could do. Your thoughts were your own, whatever Godwin man might say. Brian felt as if they were the only place he could hide and be himself. Nobody would see if he crept up behind her, unheard because of the blustering wind. He could imagine how she would struggle, how hard it would be to pin her muscular limbs. It occurred to him that all the excitement had gone out of his marriage once June always gave in to him. As soon as the young woman was out of sight, Brian scurried across the moor. Nothing grew now between the edge where the path climbed over and the stone that surrounded the cave. Here and there charred stubs of heather stuck up from the oily black ash that squeaked underfoot. He couldn't do anything to her, he realized, because Godwin Man came to the cave to pray every afternoon about now. All the same, he trod quietly as he paced up to the rim of the stone bowl. The young woman was squatting at the edge of the pothole and shading her eyes to peer down. There was no sign of Godwin Man. The sight of her, alone there at the edge of the dark, made Brian's heart pound. The wind had dropped, and he felt as if he were at the exact center of a silence, as motionless and chill and deep as the cave. He felt as if the silence were seeping into him, emptying him of himself. He'd begun to move his limbs stealthily, for what purpose he no longer knew, when the ash caught in his throat. The instant he coughed, he knew what was going to happen. He lurched forward into the bowl, desperate to prevent it if he could. The young woman glanced up at the sound of his cough and made to get up as she saw him coming. She blinked, frowned, jerked her head back, her wide mouth stiffening. She was shoving herself to her feet, away from the rim, when her feet slipped and she fell. He hadn't even time to stretch out his hands uselessly toward her. One moment she was on the edge, the next the stone was bare. Her scream plummeted into the dark and was cut short by a thud. After that, there was silence, except for the sound of a heavy object sliding further downward amid a shrill rattling of stones. Brian had to force himself to go to the edge. He was terrified of falling after her. Eventually, he crawled to the rim of the cave on hands and knees, feeling as if once he got there, he wouldn't be able to crawl back. Silence and darkness filled the shaft, as if she had never been there at all. For a moment he thought he heard an object being dragged away somewhere, but that couldn't be below him, even if that was how it sounded. He scrabbled backward from the edge and was halfway up the bowl before he dared stumble to his feet. He turned away, sickened by the sight of the empty stone throat, and ran toward Moonwell. He hadn't meant to harm her. She shouldn't have put herself in danger. All he'd wanted was— but he couldn't think now what he wanted. She must have been killed instantly like the sheep. But he ran to the police station in case there was a chance she was alive. I think someone's fallen in the cave, he panted. The sergeant at the front desk of the small limestone building near the square reached for the pen behind his inky ear. How long ago? How sure are you? I was just up there, walking. I saw someone go down to the cave, and then I heard them scream. When I got there, there was nobody. I've run straight here from there. The sergeant was dialing the rescue team. Man or woman? I couldn't tell you. I only saw them for a moment against the sun. When the questions were over, Brian ran back to the moor, hating himself for being tempted to wish she weren't rescued, because if she were brought up alive, she might recognize him, contradict his story. One man went down, but as far as his light reached, it showed nothing. Brian retreated as soon as he could, afraid that he was going to be sick. June gasped when she saw him, gasped again when he told her what he told the police.
I couldn't find the money, he said, realizing too late that the footballers might know he hadn't gone back to the field. So I went for a walk to settle myself. She was more sympathetic to him than he felt he deserved. She kept Andrew away from him, made him sit and rest that evening to recover from what must appear to be shock. When a policeman rang the doorbell, Brian felt pinned in his chair, but the police only wanted him to know that no sound had been heard from the cave and nobody had been reported missing. Nevertheless, Godwin Mann was going to hold an overnight vigil above the cave, so that if anyone was alive down there, he or she was certain to be heard. Later, Brian lay awake, dreading the ring at the doorbell in the middle of the night, and trying to define what else he was afraid of. He kept seeing the young woman falling, kept running toward her with his useless hands outstretched. His arms would never stretch far enough. As God is my judge, I didn't want you to, he whispered. He slept at last, only to be wakened by the sensation of wearing a mask. It was the moonlight on his face. He turned away from the light, but couldn't turn away from a thought so vague as to be disturbing, that in some way, by praying at the cave, Godwin Man was making things worse. 14. On Sunday, Man called a rally at the cave. Geraldine heard hymns as she picked flowers behind the bookshop. At that distance, she found the hymns moving. They made the town sound like a church. They felt appropriate as she strolled with Jeremy to the far end of the town, to the church where Jonathan's grave would be. That had to be what her vision meant, the gravestone she'd seen in the moonlight, the stone with Jonathan's name. She'd gazed at it until the cold had driven her away, but it hadn't changed or vanished. It was real, or would be. She wouldn't make it real. She'd wanted to tell Jeremy her vision when she'd run home in the moonlight, but Benedict had been tinkering with the alarm. The next morning she'd wakened, anxious to see Jonathan's grave in Sheffield. She didn't know what she might find there. But when they'd driven to Sheffield that evening, the gravestone was still there. Jonathan had been telling her he didn't want to be so far away. He wanted to be buried in Moonwell. She'd gone to the superintendent of cemeteries and stifled her impatience with all the paperwork, tried not to feel too disappointed that Jonathan might not be in Moonwell in time for his birthday. Jeremy assumed that she wanted the grave moved so that she could visit it more easily, and she didn't enlighten him. He might ask questions that she didn't want to ask herself, make Jonathan feel threatened. Besides, he was worrying about Diana Kramer, worrying that he'd made the situation at school worse for her by speaking up. They were passing the school now on their way to the churchyard. Don't worry, she's going to see her union next week, she said, and took his hand as they approached the church. The newly oiled gate opened silently. Geraldine remembered the silence and the moonlight, the feeling that the light had turned into white ice. She laid the flowers at the edge of the new graves, where Jonathan's would be. Be seeing you, Jonathan, she murmured, and Jeremy squeezed her hand. That made her feel secretive, unfair to him. Her doubts preoccupied her all the way home through the deserted town, and he didn't try to make her talk. She was still debating with herself halfway through dinner when Andrew knocked at the door. My mom says I have to give this back, he told her, and fled. It was a book of fairy tales illustrated by Maurice Sendak. What's wrong with it, Jeremy wondered, leafing through one happily. I can't see anything even Godwin Mann could object to. We'll find Andrew something else tomorrow, Geraldine said, to cheer him up. But the next day was when Godwin Mann came to the shop. It was almost Monday lunchtime, and they hadn't had a customer. They'd spent the morning rearranging some of the display, moving books about the peaks to the table by the door, children's books to the far end of the shop. They'd hardly finished when June and another woman marched in. Tell them what you told me, June said, then faltered. They've hidden them, hidden the children's books. I can see it. Her companion, a lanky young woman with gray hair straggling out of a hairband, strode up the aisle between the tables. This is what I meant. They don't let children read this where I come from. She'd grabbed Maurice Sendak's in the night kitchen. June cried out in disgust at the page she was displaying. I thought that kind of thing was supposed to be against the law. What kind of thing, June? Geraldine asked quietly. Children exposing themselves, and you gave a book by this man to our Andrew. 
If I'd known what you were up to, I'd never have let him near you. Now, June, this isn't like you, Jeremy said. The little boy in the book has a penis, that's all. Little boys do have them. Maybe, but they don't show them to people. Not in our town. June's eyes narrowed. How come you know so much about little boys? I've often wondered why you were so interested in Andrew. I know about them because I used to be one. Geraldine couldn't contain herself. We've been showing interest in Andrew because he needed someone to, June, and it's about time you realized. The only people he needs are his parents, June said furiously, and fell silent as Godwin Mann strode into the shop. He looked paler than ever, his face pared down, cheekbones thrusting forward as if his skin were being stretched by his struggle to arrive wherever he was going. Look what they're selling to children, Godwin, June's companion cried. They've books like this where the altar should be. Thank God I was called here in time. Man sank to his knees in front of the children's books. Forgive them, O Lord, for they don't know what they're doing. Jeremy and Geraldine aren't bad people. They don't mean to drive you out of your house. Jeremy stooped to him. Don't think I'm rude, but this isn't a church anymore. It's a bookshop. Man gazed heavenward. Nobody has the right to cast you out of a house you've been invited into, least of all one that was built for you. It's not just a bookshop, actually. It's our home. You can see the deeds, if you like. We can see the evidence of your deeds right here, Jeremy. Man crossed himself and stood up, looking saddened. There is no more time for argument. Time is running short. Won't you invite God back into his house and into your lives? Time's running short for what, Geraldine said. The evangelist looked suddenly wary. I should like to tell you, but not until you've asked God back into his house. Then we'll do without knowing, Jeremy said. Man glanced at him, then made for the door. If you won't let God's love reach you, perhaps you won't be able to ignore your neighbors. He stood on the pavement and called out more loudly than he had at the rally. Come and see the devil's church. Come and see the evil that's been festering in your midst. Damned fool, Jeremy muttered. As for you, June, if you're ashamed of how you used to carry on, that's your affair. But you shouldn't take it out on us. I'd appreciate it if you'd just go away now. I've nothing to be ashamed of since I've been forgiven. You can't get rid of me that easily, nor these people either. Several of their neighbors had come out of houses or shops and were converging on the bookshop. What's the row, the baker, a balding man with flowery eyebrows said, they're trying to make out we're a dirty bookshop, Mr. Meller, Geraldine said, forcing a laugh. I'll bet you didn't realize that was the sort of place you buy your wife or books. Why should anyone want to make that out? Because every foothold you leave for evil in your town gives it more strength, man said behind him. Now that we're winning, it has to be more determined than ever. Why else do you think there was a fire on the moor? June brought Mr. Meller the Sendak picture book. This is the sort of thing they sell to children. This is what we let into our town because we didn't listen to Mrs. Scragg. The other neighbors crowded round, making disgusted noises. Nearly all of them had given house room to man's followers, Geraldine realized. But even so, I didn't realize, Mr. Meller said. A book is a guest you invite into your house, after all, and you don't expect guests to suddenly start being offensive. For heaven's sake... That's a book by a respected American artist. Several people turned on Jeremy. We know all about artists, one sneered. Jeremy moved quickly to intercept man who was stalking toward the children's books. What are you up to now? Ask yourself what Christ would have done if he'd found such things being sold in the temple. You lay a finger on those books unless you mean to buy them, and you'll find yourself leaving very suddenly. All the neighbors except Mr. Meller ran to man's aid. Don't you dare touch him, screeched the woman from the wool shop. He's a man of God. Man held up one hand. Thank you, my friends, but violence won't be necessary. 
I think I may be able to shame Jeremy and Geraldine into realizing what they've been doing. He strode off to the Christian shop. Mr. Meller blinked uneasily at the others, then sidled out back to the bakery. June went to scrutinize the shelves, and the others joined her. So long as you mean to buy something, Jeremy said. But even when he repeated it, they ignored him. They were still pawing at the shelves when man came back. He marched straight to the children's books and seized the copies of In the Night Kitchen. And I see Lolita and some drug books over there. If there's anything else that your town doesn't need, just show me where it is. Put those down and get out of here, Jeremy said in a quiet, stiff voice, or I'll call the police. They'd think that pretty strange, you calling them because someone was buying your books. Here's fifty pounds to start with, and if we go over that, just tell me. He slapped the notes down on the children's table and set off to search. Soon all his helpers were carrying piles of books. Henry Miller, William Burroughs, Von Donneken, The Joy of Sex, A Handbook of Witchcraft, Life on Earth, A Child's Book of English Folklore. You won't get much change out of two hundred, Jeremy said, and man's followers stared at him contemptuously while man paid him the balance. The evangelist picked up the largest pile of books and let out his helpers. As soon as they dumped the books in the gutter outside the shop, he emptied a tin of lighter fluid over the books and set fire to them. They caught with a wolf that brought more people out of their houses. Shall I call the fire brigade? An old lady cried. We're just burning some filth they were selling in the bookshop, June told her. Do you know they made Godwin pay for every book? That's money that could have been given to God. Maybe you should realize books that sell as well as those just did are worth reordering, Jeremy shouted, then turned away, furious with himself for having been provoked. Geraldine watched until the fire died down and man and his helpers left the ashes to scatter. There they go, Jeremy muttered, the true faces of small-town life. They're not like that, really. I wouldn't be surprised if they apologize to us once man goes away, if not before— you have more faith in them than I have. Small town minds that want to reduce everything to what they can cope with. The good minds go to university or just get out as soon as they can. I know how you feel, Jerry, but I wonder if you do. You don't seem to care as much about your shop as you used to. His anger changed the subject. My God, that American talks about evil. But that's evil, if anything is, people trying to suppress anything they find disturbing, as if shoving it out of sight will make it go away. You know I still care about our shop. He meant she'd been preoccupied, but this was certainly not the time to explain about Jonathan. For the rest of the day, whenever she heard footsteps in the street, she grew tense, thinking that it might be another invasion of the faithful, or one of them returning to apologize. However, when closing time dragged round, nobody else had come into the shop. Later, she went out for a walk with Jeremy, though not until it was almost dark. She didn't want to meet any of the neighbors. Oily scraps of ash whispered in the gutter. She felt as if she'd been barred from all the lit houses. The high street was deserted except for Father O'Connell, who hailed them as Jeremy started to turn away. May I walk along with you? Christ, not another sermon. Jeremy snarled under his breath. I was on my way to see you both. I only just heard what happened at your shop. I wish I'd been there. You'd have helped, would you? I hope I could have made them think twice. I'll be raising the subject on Sunday, if I still have a congregation. There may still be a few who prefer the church to that show on the moor. I misjudged you, Jeremy admitted. I thought at first you meant you'd have helped men. God forbid, especially since he came to tell me I ought to make my preaching more like his. I don't care much for this homogenized religion, and I told him so. This notion that you mustn't think your way to faith is obviously not far from the intolerance that leads to burning books. May we quote you, Geraldine said. By all means, it's what I'll be saying on Sunday. I don't think he'll be happy until he's converted everyone in town, or believes he has. He said something about not having much time. Before what? Do you know? Well, for whom the bell tolls and all that, but perhaps you're right to wonder if he meant something else. 
I'll see what I can find out, though he's difficult to pin down when he wants to be. They were nearly at the church. He uses words the way some doctors prescribe tranquilizers, the priest was saying, when Geraldine cried out, What's that? Father O'Connell shaded his eyes. Birds. Look, there they go. I couldn't tell you what breed. That's right, just birds. Jeremy took her arm, having sensed her unease. It was just the way the light caught them. It must have been, she told herself. They couldn't have been glowing with their own pale light, even though the moonlight hadn't yet reached the church. Perhaps the light had reflected from a window opposite the churchyard and caught the birds where they stood pecking at the graves. She didn't like to wonder what they'd carried in their beaks as the three of them had risen in unison and flapped toward the moor. The moonlight must have caught them directly then, for as soon as they took flight they'd seemed even brighter. Everything was explicable, there was no reason for her to feel nervous, and yet she knew that wherever she and Jeremy continued their evening walk, she would rather that it wasn't on the moor. Fifteen. The man at the reception desk assumed that Moonwell was a company. No, it's where I live, Diana said. Tell him I want to take up his offer. Nick looked puzzled until he caught sight of her, and then he smiled broadly, his round face and large dark eyes relaxed. I owe you lunch. Where shall we go? A pub would be good. I've quite a lot to tell you. About Mission Moonwell? Operation Moonwell would be more like it. He frowned, rubbing his squarish chin as if he could erase the gray tinge that made it look less than shaved. Give me ten minutes to finish a story and we'll go. They went to a pub near the Gothic town hall, off a wide street where the buildings looked laundered by sunlight above the glacier of lunchtime traffic. They found stools near the back of the long, narrow, dark-paneled room and sat down with drinks. So, what's been happening, Nick said. More of the same? I don't know if you realized how organized it was. Man's after the children now, with the help of the school. The headmaster tried to make me sign an undertaking not to teach anything man wouldn't approve of, and when I wouldn't sign, they fired me. Can they do that? Not here in Manchester, they couldn't, but you can get away with a lot in a town that takes more than an hour to reach, I guess. I've just been to my union headquarters this morning, and they don't hold out much hope. You're kidding. What? Because they'd have to drive up there to help you? No, because of something I didn't do. See, the union called a strike when I'd been at the school about six months and I didn't join the strike. I thought, come on, I'm on probation here. And besides, if I strike, they'll bring in someone who'll treat the kids worse. I mean, I really wanted that job. When I happened to read, it was up for grabs. But I nearly didn't get a work permit in time. And I want to keep it all the more now I know what it entails— but the union bosses say they can't do much because I'm a foreigner and I haven't been here long enough. Only I think it's because they haven't forgiven me for staying at work. I've got friends in the education offices. I can let you know in advance of any teaching jobs in Manchester. That's kind of you, Nick, but I was hoping you might be able to publicize what the school is trying to do to me. She drained her glass of beer. My round... When she carried the drinks to the table, Nick was looking uncomfortable. I'll do what I can, of course, he said. I'd certainly like to help. I think you'll have a story by the time I've finished. She told him about Eustace Gift's show, The Book Burning, Father O'Connell's Doubts. And now man's going from house to house, so nobody can sit on the fence. I told you it was systematic. The priest said he was willing to be quoted, did he? That may be the clincher. Let's eat, and then I'll talk to my editor. She waited in the lobby of the newspaper building fifteen minutes before he reappeared. She jumped up, her mock-leather chair reflating. Do you need me? Diana, I'm really sorry. Not to say embarrassed. I didn't have much success. Maybe I should talk to him. I'd take you up if I thought it would do any good. You see, I did a series on Billy Graham and the rest of this fundamentalist backlash last year, and my editor's taking the line that it's last year's news— doesn't seem to see it's getting worse. He did raise an eyebrow when I mentioned your priest, though. Listen, are you free for dinner? I owe you more of an explanation, but I'd rather not go into it here. You needn't feel you owe me, Diana said gently. Well, anyway, I'd like to buy your dinner. I finish work at six. We'll decide who pays when they bring us the check. I still need to go to the library. 
But in the high-domed reading room, where she had to apply at the desk for any book she wanted, there seemed to be no information that she needed, nothing to give her an insight into man's obsession with the cave. Indeed, she could find very few references to Moonwell. Then, as she leafed through the catalogue again more studiedly, she found an author's name she knew. The subject entry was for Lutadarum. The book proved to be an updated yellowing pamphlet bound in plastic by the library. It was an essay about a lost Roman lead mine, which the writer located on a sketch map, showing Lutadarum where Diana would have looked for Moonwell. The writer's name was Nathaniel Needham. I should have thought of him, she told Nick over dinner in Chinatown. He lives on the moors. If anyone but man knows what's supposed to be so important about the cave, he should. Assuming it means much to anyone but man, this whole idea of a deep, dark, evil well sounds pretty Freudian, don't you think? Her quick smile faded. I think there's more to it. There are certainly enough stories about the cave. Not about man, though, I'm afraid. At least none he doesn't tell himself. His father's real name was Manipal, and I don't blame anyone for changing that. So tell me why you're having problems at the paper. Do you ever hear Radio Freedom? No, the evangelical station blots it out in your area. It's a pirate radio station I used to broadcast on. Say things the paper wouldn't let me say. Only when I came back from your town, I couldn't have disguised my voice enough. Because my editor realized who I was. Oh, shit. He put it rather more strongly. I'm lucky still to be working there, I can tell you. And then the woman who runs Radio Freedom said I should broadcast who I was and work for the station if I cared about the truth. And that was the end of quite a good relationship. And maybe of my chance to help you. Do keep in mind what I said about finding you a job. I ought to take you up on that, shouldn't I? I ought to get out of Moonwell since the parents have got what they seem to want. He looked taken aback by her sudden bitterness. Is it really that bad? Nick, when I started teaching at that school, the kids were terrified of me because they thought I'd be like the other teachers. Is that bad? And when you weren't, they started getting out of hand, I imagine. Sure, until they saw I wasn't going to hit them or send them to the headmaster for a caning. We didn't cane kids in New York. We don't need to do it here. It really pisses me off to hear parents saying it never did them any harm. I think people forget how it was for them at a school like that. Otherwise, they couldn't bear to send their children. And they're scared to be singled out as troublemakers. Even now, they're grown up. The kind of fear man plays on. That's another thing that worries me. My kids won't say they believe his scare stories if they don't, and I'm afraid he or his followers may start some crap about how the kids are against him. Nick drew a deep breath and stood up. I may not be broadcasting anymore, but I can still give Radio Freedom the story. Let me call Julia now. He came back looking frustrated. I can't get through. I'll try again in a few minutes. Julia may want to run an interview with you. Don't let your meal get cold. Nick, I think it'd be best if I don't go on the air. We both of us know what I really ought to do. Do we? Nick said doubtfully. Sure, I ought to go back to the school and sign the son of a bitch of a form so that at least I'll be there to look after my kids. Saying it made her feel even more certain, made her instincts feel as keen as they had the night they'd wakened her with a glimpse of the airplane. This time she wouldn't fail them, she promised herself. After dinner, Nick suggested coffee at his apartment, but she was afraid that a sudden mist might wipe out the road back to Moonwell. She knew that if she went home with Nick, she might end up spending the night with him. In other circumstances, she might have wanted that as much as she sensed he did. She drove out of Manchester onto the steep, dark roads. Clouds hung over Moonwell, weighing down the night. She had it in her to dispel the sense of darkening and heaviness she felt as she drove toward the town, she reminded herself. The day must have exhausted her, for though moonrise wasn't due for hours, she thought she glimpsed whitish movements on the clouds above the cave. She went quickly to bed, to rest, and be ready for the Scraggs in the morning. Mrs. Scragg was at the schoolyard gate and glared at Diana as if she had no right even to step over the threshold. Some of the parents looked glad to see her, and some of the children certainly did. She had to sign. 
Nicholas Nickleby might have stormed into Mr. Scragg's office, but life didn't work like that. Life just went on in its usual unsatisfactory way. She hurried into the school and knocked on Mr. Scragg's door. The headmaster stared blankly at her. I'm sorry I was hasty when you asked me to sign that disclaimer, she said, managing to smile. I'll sign it now, if I may. I'm glad you listened to your conscience. I hope you'll find it is its own reward. He began to shuffle papers on his desk. But as far as your job is concerned, I'm afraid you've changed your mind too late. The post has already been filled by two of our new friends, who don't even want to be paid. Sixteen. Andrew's head felt big and aching, his nose and eyes stuffed with tears. But you said I could last year, he whined, said it was good for me. Well, we were wrong. His mother stuck out her hand for a close peg from the bag he was holding, a canvas bag with a little girl holding a handful of pegs stitched on it. I've said no, and that's all there is to it. But it's at the church. Father O'Connell doesn't mind. There's too many things he doesn't mind when he's supposed to be a man of God. You're not to go near the church without me or your father, do you hear? You're not to have anything to do with Mrs. Wainwright or dressing the cave. But you promised you and Daddy would come and see me doing it this year. I was wrong. Can't you understand? God sent Godwin Man to show us where we'd gone wrong. Give the bag here if you're going to be stupid. I'll get the peg myself. As she grabbed the bag, she dropped her armful of washing on the lawn. Now look what you've made me do, you little devil. Just you kneel down and ask God for forgiveness. Grass blades poked Andrew's bare knees. Please, God, forgive me, he muttered, and had to repeat what his mother said, for being such a trial to my father and mother. Now go up to your room and close the door, his mother said, and don't come down till you're worth knowing. Andrew felt as if that might be never. He stumbled to his feet, glancing nervously about in case anyone had heard him confessing, and saw his father in the kitchen watching him. His father looked away quickly as if the fat gray sky meant something to him. Just you read that story about how to obey your parents, Andrew's mother cried. Andrew sat on his bed and stared at his room that no longer felt much like his. The bareness seemed chilly now that he couldn't have Maurice Sendak posters on the walls. He wasn't allowed to see Geraldine or Jeremy or even Miss Kramer now that she wasn't at the school. And he didn't want to play with the new children his mother liked so much, who made him feel he hadn't confessed enough. He felt even clumsier and more of an embarrassment to his parents than ever. He began to tear the pamphlet about Abraham and Isaac, tiny pieces from the edges of the pages. He didn't dare hate God, but he hated Godwin Man. His mother hadn't really changed, except for talking so much about God. But his father had changed somehow since Godwin Man had come to town. Andrew didn't want to think how. He couldn't help flinching when his father came into the room. Don't do that, son. His father collected the torn scraps of paper and flushed them down the toilet beneath the plaque that said, God loves you. Put that away before your mother sees what you've done to it, and we'll go out for a bit. You shouldn't be shut up on a day like this. Please, may we go to the fair? You don't call that a fair, do you? You wait, and I'll give you a surprise. People weren't supposed to have secrets once they'd confessed to God. Hadn't Mr. Mann said something like that? But once they were in the street, his father said, I don't see why you shouldn't go to the church. I'll be taking you, so it's not as if you'll be disobeying your mother. No need to tell her, though, in case she doesn't see it that way. A butcher's boy cycled along the high street, the basket on his handlebars piled with raw deliveries. Andrew wanted to do that one day, cycle through the town like that, whistling and taking his hands off the handlebars to comb his hair. Perhaps then his parents would be proud of him. If he wouldn't be disobeying his mother... Why couldn't he tell her so that she would come and admire his bit of the cave dressing? Sometimes thinking felt like trying to lift a weight that just grew heavier, especially when people were impatient with him. He was trying to put words straight in his head so as to ask his father in a way that wouldn't make him angry when they came abreast of Roman Row. I'd better check with Mrs. Wainwright that someone's at the church, his father said. 
Mrs. Wainwright was trimming the vines on the arch above her gate. Andrew ran to her, then faltered, for she looked as if she wanted to cry. I'm sorry, Andrew, she said, staring at the vines. We won't be dressing the cave this year. Andrew's father caught up with him. Why not? I thought you were going ahead anyway. There won't be enough people. Her eyes were so bright and blank they made Andrew's ache. Anyway, I've more to worry me than dressing the cave, but I can't talk about it in front of the boy. The cave doesn't matter now. It does matter, Andrew blurted as she turned awkwardly and almost ran into her house. Her door slammed, and he saw that her next-door neighbor, a toothless old woman with a mustache, had been standing hands on hips in her front doorway. Good riddance to her. The less we see of her, the better, she mumbled loudly, working her lips over each other between phrases. Why, what's happened, Andrew's father demanded. Haven't you heard? She lost a baby last night. And do you know why? Because the mother wouldn't have her sort in the room. I won't have my baby delivered by that godless woman. That's what I was told, she said. You'd think a midwife would have knelt down by the bed if it was that or lose a baby. But not Mrs. High and Mighty Wainwright. So the father tried to deliver the baby himself. And all I can say is, if there's any justice, that baby went straight to heaven. And you know where Mrs. Wainwright ought to go. That didn't seem quite fair to Andrew, as he watched the old woman chewing her words as if she liked the taste. His father pulled him away. Come on, I'll take you to the fair. It was down by the playing field. Children threw quoits or rolled balls for prizes. The only ride was a roundabout. Old pedal cars and bicycles bolted to a stage under a canopy like an umbrella whose canvas had blown off. Andrew sat on a rusty bicycle and pretended he was a delivery boy as the fairground man turned the rusty handle that made the stage creak round. Look at me, Dad, he shouted every time his father went by, because every time his father was staring at the sunless sky above the moors, as if it meant something to him, or he wished he were somewhere else. The fair didn't make up for his not being able to help Mrs. Wainwright. When they went home, he could tell that his mother sensed he was still disappointed, for she let him say grace before dinner. All too soon, long before dark, it was time for bed. He lay watching shapes form and dissolve inside his eyelids and listened to the murmur of his parents downstairs. He was waiting for his mother to demand what his father was hiding, but now that Andrew was in bed, they didn't seem to be saying much. Their sounds and the long silences between felt like a storm gathering under the puffy sky. He pulled the blanket over his ear that felt swollen with trying to listen, and remembered last year, remembered fitting the lines of petals overlapping like feathers on a bird into his piece of the screen until there wasn't room for a single extra petal. He remembered seeing his work snap into place, his piece of blue sky taking its place above the head of the man with the sword. Light surrounded the calm face as if the head were the sun, shining like the sword he held up in one hand the other arm hidden inside his tunic made of leaves. Andrew felt cool as the church now, no longer aware of the weight of muggy heat and blankets, and he didn't notice when he fell asleep. His dream felt peaceful, too, at first. He was following the picture he'd helped create up to the cave. He couldn't see who was carrying it, not in sections as usual, but put together, so that it was several times as tall as he was, he ran through the dark toward the cave, over ground that felt more like ash than stone. Just as he reached the top, the moon came swooping over the jagged horizon, and he saw that the picture of the swordsman was standing over the cave. Andrew felt safe, until the moon began to laugh. It was only a fairy tale, he tried to tell himself. It was only in those books that the moon had a cartoony face with a big grin that could open and show its teeth but it was laughing at the way the swordsman was tottering drunkenly at the edge of the cave, as if he'd been moved too close. It was only a picture, Andrew told himself, and Mrs. Wainwright had said he didn't matter. The swordsman fell forward into the yawning dark, and Andrew heard him scream as he'd never heard anyone scream in his life. Andrew lurched awake and almost screamed himself at the tarry dark. He struggled out of bed, stumbled toward the landing. Whoever he woke up would shout at him, but he couldn't bear to be alone with the dream. He inched open the door of his parents' room, and then he halted, gaping at the white statue that lay next to his mother in the bed. 
The moon was shining directly on his father's face. He looked as if he were bathing in the light, soaking it up. Andrew wanted to run to him and shake him, because if the moon shone on your face while you were asleep, it was supposed to drive you mad. His mother had told him that was just a story, but she always drew his curtains tight when there was going to be a moon. He would have cried out to her now, except he was growing afraid of seeing his father's eyes open, full of moonlight. Then his father's face writhed into an expression Andrew wouldn't have dreamed it could wear, and he fled back to his bedroom, hid in bed. His father must be having a nightmare. Only mightn't you look as terrified as that, if you were going mad? What would his father do then? Something worse than the way men at football games screamed at one another, worse than making Andrew's mother sound as if he was hurting her when they thought Andrew was asleep. Andrew hadn't heard her make those noises since Mr. Mann had come to Moonwell. But now the waiting silence made him more nervous than the noises had. He ground his knuckles into his ears. His mother always told him in the summer that he'd better be asleep before it was dark. Now he felt as if he was finding out why, finding out that everything changed for the worse. He couldn't bear waiting, couldn't bear not knowing what was happening in his parents' room. But when he made himself get out of bed and tiptoe back across the landing to ease their door open, he almost screamed. His father wasn't in the bed. His mother was still huddled in the blankets, her back to the moon. As Andrew tried to nerve himself to wake her, he heard the front door close quietly. Suddenly, he could move. He tiptoed across his parents' bedroom, knowing instinctively that he wouldn't bump into anything, and peered into the thin moonlight. His father was across the main road and loping up the nearest side street that led to the moors. At once, Andrew knew that his father had meant to leave him at the church and go wherever he was going now. Andrew wouldn't have been able to tell his mother without giving himself away. He backed out of the room and managed to close the door with his stiff, shaky hands. If his mother found out what was happening to his father, whatever it was, she might make it worse. Andrew dressed quickly and crept downstairs put the door on the latch and slipped out of the house. His body heat seemed to flood out of the top of his head toward the cloudless sky. As he dodged across the high street, the clock above the assembly room struck two. He ran along the side street and up the zigzag path, both exhilarated to be out so late and afraid of what he might see when he caught up with his father. At the top of the path, he poked his head gingerly over the edge. His father was loping toward the cave, ash softening his tread under the waning moon that made Andrew blink. As Andrew ran after him, the boy couldn't hear himself. Running on the moon must be like this, running in silence, hardly feeling your own footsteps. His father was at the rim that surrounded the cave, and Andrew threw himself face down in the ash because his father was pacing round the rim to a point almost opposite him but his father was too intent on whatever was beyond the rim to notice Andrew. Though he felt exposed by the moonlight and the charred landscape, Andrew began to crawl through the ash. He crawled until he was almost abreast of his father, just able to see him by raising his head. He hid his face in his hands to clear his throat, and when he looked up again, his father had gone over the rim. Suddenly terrified that he meant to throw himself into the cave, Andrew scrambled up to the edge. The moon was almost overhead. It glared into the stone bowl and made the lip of the cave appear to glow. Beyond that, the cave looked as black and deep as the sky. Halfway between the cave and the edge of the bowl, one of Mr. Mann's helpers was kneeling, fingers interlocked, eyes closed. He must be guarding the cave, Andrew thought. Behind him, so stealthily Andrew couldn't see him move, Andrew's father came creeping. His face was a smooth, luminous white mask. His shadow inched in front of him, as silent as he was. The praying man must see it if he opened his eyes. But no, the shadow was directly behind him, touching him now. Suppose he felt it and turned. Andrew was as terrified for his father, terrified that his father would be found out, as he was of seeing what would happen when his father reached the man. His father was inches short of the man when he heard something. His mask-like face lifted in the moonlight. Andrew thought of a dog pricking up its ears. His father began to back stealthily away, up the bowl, and Andrew fled back to his place in the ash. On his way, 
he saw another of Mr. Man's helpers hurrying across the moor. The newcomer passed within a few yards of Andrew without noticing him. I'm sorry I overslept, he called down toward the cave. Andrew's father was already out of sight along the other path, the long way back to Moonwell. Andrew ran home as soon as the newcomer was in the stone bowl, ran slapping himself to dust off the ash, slapping harder to stop his thoughts. He led himself into the cottage and crept upstairs. He lay in bed, hardly able to breathe as he waited for his father to come home, his mother to waken and demand to know where his father had been. At last he heard the front door close, the creaking of the stairs, then silence. His mother hadn't wakened. Andrew lay awake then until dawn, praying that whatever was still going to happen wouldn't happen. 17. I say, I say, I say, what's this film we're watching? I don't know. God told me to throw my glasses away. That was no God. That was Godwin Man throwing his voice. Godwin Man throwing his voice? Why should he want to do that? So you can't see what an old devil his father turned into. Nobody was laughing except Eustace. If that was laughter somewhere up on the moors, it could hardly be meant for him. He wouldn't be performing that routine when the landlord of the one-armed soldier showed the video in which man's father played the devil. He wasn't a comedian. He was just a postman who'd been talking to himself. If he weren't a postman, he wouldn't be on his way to Phoebe Wainwright's house. He hadn't seen her since the night at the pub, Whenever he had to deliver her mail, he made sure she wouldn't hear him coming. The idea of just being a postman, nothing more than his job, was oddly comforting. The sense of being unworthy of her was, surprisingly, a relief. He was settling into not having to approach her any more when he heard how she'd been prevented from saving the baby. What appalled him even more was how everyone he'd spoken to blamed her, he had to let her know that somebody was on her side, and today he had a reason to go to her house. He glanced along the high street to reassure himself that nobody had heard him playing straight man to himself, and turned quickly along Church Row. He had a letter for her that had been posted locally, and a childbirth magazine that was too bulky to go through her letterbox. He stepped under the viney arch and tried to think of a joke to cheer her up, something about the magazine in case the sight of it upset her. They mustn't have heard that God doesn't want you to deliver any more babies, he thought, and rang the doorbell. When she peered through the front room window, he was shocked to see how slack her face was. Cheering her up would be more of a task than he'd thought he realized, and then he heard his headphone voice delivering the tasteless, insensitive joke he was planning to offer her. He tried frantically to think of something else to say as she opened the door. All he could think of were jokes— even more tasteless than the one he'd suppressed, and he was terrified that they would spill out if he opened his mouth. She was gazing at him, not so much patiently as indifferently, while he fumbled in his bag as though he might have more for her. He thrust the letter and the magazine at her. For you, he mumbled, as if they were presents. Her face turned blanker still as she glanced at the magazine and stuffed it under one arm. Now she was tearing the envelope open with one plump thumb. She must want him to speak, otherwise she would have closed the door. I heard what happened the other night, he blurted, and floundered on. They won't let either of us do what we do best, will they? Maybe they just can't stand creative people. When she looked up from the single page she'd unfolded, he wished he'd made one of his jokes instead. It was a joke, of course, a joke at his expense. Sorry, he babbled. Nothing worse than a comedian trying to be serious, except I'm not much of a comedian, as you're painfully aware. She must be wondering if he would ever stop. Trapped with his own headphone voice, he wondered that himself. He gulped himself silent, and she began suddenly to blink, more and more rapidly. For a moment he thought she might hide her face against his shoulder, and then he found himself staring at the closed front door. Her letter came seesawing through the air to his feet. He picked it up and rang the bell without thinking. In the seconds before she flung the door open, he saw what the letter said. The message, written in large anonymous capital, said, Leave our town before you kill more children. Phoebe snatched it from his hand. 
Can't any of you leave me alone? If I throw myself down the cave, will that make up for the baby, she cried, and slammed the door. He reached wildly for the doorbell, but turned away instead. Whatever he said would only make things worse. He saw himself handing her the letter for the second time, the third, the fourth. He couldn't even survive that by making it into a joke at his own expense. There was nobody to whom he could tell the joke. He finished his deliveries and tramped home, speaking to nobody. No, he didn't want to speak to Eric at the pub. What on earth would Eric be achieving by showing the film with man's father? It was nothing but defiance. So trivial it was like accepting that the town was man's now. Eustace stalked into his cottage and locked himself in with his rage at himself. He had only just dropped his post bag beside the sofa when someone knocked at the front door. It was the dressmaker who lived three cottages away. She squinted at him through the smoke of the cigarette in one corner of her mouth. Well, Mr. Gift, she said, the cigarette jerking, you've been keeping well out of our way, haven't you? Where's your friend? In your pocket? Up your arse? But all he said was, I've just been doing my job. So long as that's all you've been up to. She slapped her breasts vigorously to dislodge a worm of ash. Well, are we going to see you up there on Sunday? He felt close to laughter, or something more violent. Someone like her had sent Phoebe the letter. I don't think you'd want to see me, he muttered. Oh, yes, we would, my lad. Do you know you're the only one in the street who wasn't up there last Sunday? You're not going to say we're all deluded, are you? I'm not going to say that, no. I should think not, too. Do you know that every single person in both of the next streets was up there? Just you make sure you are on Sunday. We don't want our street shown up. She trod on her cigarette and peered at him. You aren't scared to go, are you? No need to be. We all know what you have to confess. Do yourself some good for a change. It doesn't seem to have changed you. Now, if you'll excuse me, Eustace said, and closed the door. While I play with myself, or get ready for a black mass, or stick pins in my Godwin man doll. His urge to laugh went out with the words, leaving him more furious than ever. He went back to the sofa and watched the dressmaker stump away down his path, and suddenly he had to force himself to sit down rather than chase after her, grab her, drag her, where he didn't know. Somewhere he was almost sure he heard laughter deep and hollow, growing. 18. Priest defends sex books, the headline said. Given the lack of detail in the report, you might well assume that the bookshop was a sex shop. The name of the town, a small town near Sheffield, was apparently Moonwall. It wasn't Nick's fault, Diana told herself. He'd done his best, and now she must do better. She dropped the newspaper on the hall table and stepped out of her cottage. The afternoon was gray and muggy. Diana's thin dress clung to her as she made for the hotel. The round-shouldered man at reception, who wore a sacred heart badge in his lapel, referred her to one of man's helpers when she asked for man. If you need counseling, perhaps I can help, the young, wide-eyed, smiling woman said. Godwin is resting just now. I thought he was available to anyone who wants to talk to him. Usually he is. Right now he's preparing, the young woman said, and went on quickly. Miss Kramer, isn't it? I'll tell him you were asking for him. He'll come to see you as soon as he can. Then Diana would talk to Nathaniel Needham. Indeed, that might better equip her to talk to man. Townsfolk watched her suspiciously as she headed for the nearest path to the moors. This morning the woman from whom she rented the cottage had wanted to know how much longer Diana would be staying now that she had no job. For a while yet, Diana had told her, for as long as she felt the children had to be protected. It didn't matter that she'd seen parents telling their children to stay away from her. Her instincts told her she had to stay, and that must be to protect the children, even though she had a vague, uneasy notion that she was underestimating whatever she had to protect them from. She climbed on the moor and hurried across the dead ground, the ash that muffled her footsteps, and the oppressive silence that seemed to surround the cave, above which one of man's followers was kneeling. From the top of the slope where Needham had stood at the rally, she surveyed her route. 
The slopes beyond were thick with grass and heather, but there was no sign of a cottage, nor of a path. A mossy concrete slab showed her where an abandoned mine shaft was. She avoided that and trudged up the next slope, fanning herself. There was a cottage two slopes ahead. She ran down into the next hollow and made her way between the abandoned shafts left uncovered this far from town. Tussocks and heather slowed her down, grass concealed ankle-deep puddles. The silence seemed to have followed her from the cave. No bird was singing. Not until she climbed the next slope did she realize the silence was missed. In the few minutes she'd spent in the hollow, the adjacent slopes had all but vanished. A clump of trees looked like stitching on gray velvet. The mist unveiled a glimpse of the cottage a few hundred yards ahead, then wiped it out. She made for the cottage, the only landmark. At the bottom of the slope, darkness lay under the grass. She avoided the dark widely wherever she saw it, even if it was only puddles. She felt as if the ground were gaping at her, opening its mouths. One detour took her to the edge of a shaft, which she almost didn't see for tall grass. She recoiled, heart-pounding, and stumbled up the wet grass of the nearest slope. She was safe on an island in the midst of a still gray sea, but she no longer knew where the cottage was. She was preparing to wait until the mist lifted when a man's voice said, Who's there? I'm lost. Can you help me? Wait there where you are. The mist fell silent, and Diana's eyes began to sting as she tried to see where the voice had come from. When it spoke again, it was farther away. If you want to be found, keep talking, it growled. My name's Diana Kramer. I was looking for Nathaniel Needham's cottage. I almost had it when the mist came down. He appeared suddenly at the foot of the slope, a tall man leaning on a stick. He levered himself through the mist and towered over her. He had white hair that spilled over his collar, a long face wizened as a monkey's, and large, venous, knuckly hands that gripped his stick as he leaned at her, his gray eyes staring blankly. Well, you found me, he said. You're Nathaniel Needham. That's who I am, and if you've come looking to save my soul, you've got yourself lost for nothing. I'll make my own peace with God when the time comes. I haven't come for that. I've nothing to do with what's happening in Moonwell. I read your pamphlet about the Roman mines, and I heard the song you sang the other week at the pub. I guess you may want to see traditions preserved like I do. He shrugged, apparently because he felt cold. Take my arm, he said, and began to descend the slope. You Americans are fond of our traditions, aren't you? My da used to say that's because you've got none of your own. I ought to tell you I'm not a tourist. I taught school in Moonwell until I refused to be a mouthpiece for Godwood Man. I love the town and I don't see why someone else should cross the ocean to change it. Happen there's traditions you wouldn't want to keep. He raised his stick to point at an open shaft they were avoiding in the murk. Who do you think used to live down one of those? Miners? Think a man who spent his working life down there would want to live down there as well? No, love, not bloody miners. A family who'd wait for someone like you to get lost on a day like this. Robbers, you mean. Happen they started off that way, but what they needed most was food. And they'd plenty of that once they dragged some poor lost fool into their lair. My da heard tell how they were caught when someone from Moonwell was missed. They'd cut out his tongue so he couldn't scream for help, and cut bits off him. But he was still alive. My da heard tell they gave their kids the eyes for supper, he said. And with less relish... I suppose you'd better come in until the mist lifts. He'd brought her to his cottage, when she'd thought he was leading her back to Moonwell. He unlocked the small front door, which was thick with red paint that had splashed onto the limestone walls, and stooped in. The door opened into the main room. A double bed stood against the far wall. A bookcase full of dusty books leaned in one gloomy corner. Two faded easy chairs faced a hearth on which stood a toaster-shaped radio that must have been at least thirty years old. Needham stooped slowly to the hearth and began to build a fire with chunks of wood. You're here in my house where you wanted to be, he said, and I still don't know what you're after. I'm trying to find out the truth about the cave, 
Godwin Mann keeps claiming that there's something evil there, something that's spreading evil I don't know how far. Needham reached for a box of kitchen matches beside the radio and lit the fire. As it began to crackle, he rubbed his hands close to the flames, then reached behind him and lowered himself into the right-hand chair. I think Godwin Mann is on the right track. Diana couldn't keep dismay out of her voice. You agree with him? I don't agree with what he wants to do, no. I think he should leave well alone, but you can't reason with his sort. Only I don't think he knows the half of what's down there in the cave. Diana felt as if the chill were seeping through the small window from the mist that crept across the glass. Why? What do you say is down there? Come and sit by me before I get a crick in my neck. He settled back, closing his eyes as the fire flared higher. What do I say? The man in the moon. Oh. The man in the moon came down too soon and asked his way to Norwich. He chanted like a grandfather to a child. But I don't reckon you'd know that song. Sure I do. One of the children I taught used to sing it. And I know my Shakespeare. The man in the moon was supposed to have a bundle of sticks on his back because he'd been exiled to the moon for cutting wood on the Sabbath. Aye, that's the story. He sounded grudgingly impressed. And you hear tales of people bringing the moon down to earth and waking up the dead, and St. Peter having to put it back. And wishing on the new moon brings you luck, and babies born at the new moon are healthiest. Happen, you don't realize those are the kind of story people make up about things they're afraid of. Used to be afraid of, you mean. Not so long ago, either. He turned his head toward her, flames flickering in his slitted eyes. I remember my da sitting where you're sitting now, in a muck sweat, because the radio was saying they'd put a man on the moon. It did for his heart, and I've lived alone here ever since. I'm sorry, Diana said, though he sounded as if he would resent sympathy. But did he really have a reason to be afraid? No, and I told him so. He breathed hard through his nose, and then he said, I told him what he was afraid of on the moon was already on the earth. Diana made her face blank. The man in the moon, do you mean? God help us. You sound like a nurse. I haven't had one in my house yet, and I'm damned if I'll have one now. Didn't I just tell you the man in the moon was a story folk made up to hide the truth from themselves? When folk knew the truth, they kept it to themselves. The druids did. Happen, that's why they never wrote anything down. Godwin Mann mentioned the druids, Diana said, telling herself that there might be a version of some truth in the midst of all this. Aye, and what does either of you know about them? Quite a lot, Diana said, provoked. I do, I mean. I know some historians say the Romans occupied your country in order to destroy the Druid religion. It was either religion or politics. It was religion right enough. He was quiet for so long that Diana wondered if he were nodding off. Suddenly, he said, The Druids made their last stand here at Moonwell. They did what they'd never dared to do. They called what they worshipped to come down from the moon and stay on the earth. I thought they worshipped the sun. Needham thumped the arms of his chair. They had a god of the moon all right. They just didn't dare give it a name. They sacrificed people to it. But the priests didn't stay to see it come for them. They used to throw people down shafts like the one your gospeling friend wants to tamper with. That way it had to go down out of the light to get its sacrifices. If there was any logic to his argument, it wasn't clear to Diana. Seems strange they'd try to use the moon against the Romans. He sighed like a long-suffering teacher. The Greeks and Romans worshipped the moon, and the Druids reckoned their months and years by the moon, and I keep telling you that was just to keep it happy, don't you understand? They all knew it had no love for us. The Druids were only the last of an older religion, if you didn't know. There's something about it in those books. Diana took that as a hint that she could look at them. Mist surged against the windows as she crossed the dimming room, scraps of carpet shifting underfoot. To the light switch, the bare bulb lit, though feebly. Could you show me where? I could have once, 
Look if you want to. The books weren't merely dusty. Above the illegible spines, the tops of the pages were furred with gray. Just because I can't see any longer, Needham growled, doesn't mean I can't think. She thought of living up here alone and blind, miles from the next house, surrounded by the gaping shafts. I wasn't thinking that, she said, and it doesn't mean I can't remember. He drew himself up in the chair and recited, Sostolere monstra, quibus hominum, oxidere religiosissimum erat, mandi vero etiam saluberimum. Know what that means? A monstrous cult who thought murdering someone was the height of religion, especially if you ate him afterwards. That's what old Pliny said about the Druids. But it wasn't so long since the Romans gave up human sacrifice themselves. They were never like the Druids. There was a book, fifty volumes of it, written before Christ was born, that told all about the Druids. To fear the moon, to feed her as she must be fed, and never to look upon her feeding. I read that somewhere, quoted out of one of those books, the thing the Druids used to believe. Those books were lost because they told too much about the Druids, and Moonwell was lost because of what the Druids brought to it. You mean its Roman name was lost? Aye. You said you'd read my pamphlet. The thought seemed to mollify him. The Romans couldn't have known this was the ideal place for the Druids to call on their god that wasn't a god but a monster. Why was it ideal, Diana asked, and then her instincts told her. She didn't need to hear him say, because we see less of the sun here than anywhere else in the country. The shapeless movements at the window were darkening. But is there really any story about the Druids using magic or whatever it was against the Romans, Diana said, he turned his head and stared at her with nothing in his eyes. Eventually, he said, I'll tell you what I know, and if you don't believe it, suit yourself. But you won't like what you hear. At least she wouldn't have to touch the fattened books. He waited for her to sit down, and then he said, Happen, you know, the Romans never gained much ground up here. A military dictatorship was all they could manage, and not much of that this far into the peak. Half the peak was forest then. Where we're sitting now was the edge of a forest of oaks. Mist stirred like foliage at the window. Well, the Romans cut down trees for their furnaces and worked the natives in the mines, Needham said. And at first they didn't notice if the odd child or old person went missing— even when a Roman patrol did, the commander of the garrison thought they had got lost in a mist that was lasting for days. But then he thought of sending a patrol into the woods to see what the natives were scared of. The woods went down past where Moonwell is now for miles. You can still see some of the old trees. Whenever the trees had to be felled for fuel, the natives had to be forced to do it. The Romans thought they were just being superstitious savages, until they noticed that the natives were most afraid of the woods when the moon was up. Well, the commander knew that meant druidism, and he sent a patrol into the woods in daylight, and they found the cave you're so concerned about. It was in a glade of oaks then, and all the oaks around it were carved. Some of them had three faces, and some looked like men with their innards hanging out, the way the druids used to cut them open as part of their magic. Some of those carvings must have been hundreds of years old even then. And caught on one of them, they found a bit of a tunic that a soldier in the missing patrol had been wearing. The commander didn't let on to the natives that he knew anything. The Romans just kept watch until the next full moon, and then they saw a few of the natives sneaking off into the forest. One of them was carrying a newborn baby. The Romans followed them to the cave and saw them throw the baby down, and they were just going to seize them when the thing that lived in the forest came looking for its food. His eyes were brighter, as if he could see what he was describing. The Romans ought to have noticed there was more to the place than superstition. Happen some did. Some of them thought on the way to the cave that— there was more moonlight under the trees than there ought to be. 
One soldier even thought that the rays coming down through the branches looked like a spider's web, the way they kept crossing. He thought the light seemed to get hold of your feet when you stepped in it. But happened that was the ground, or the undergrowth. Only there must have been more to it than moonlight, because they saw the thing in the forest running across the web the rays made to get to the baby in the cave. You don't want to hear what it looked like, do you? Diana nodded, then had to swallow in order to say, If you know. They could never agree on what they saw. Not that they talked about it much. The light got brighter as it came nearer, for a start, until the moonlight hurt their eyes. It looked like a spider as big as a man. A beautiful spider, made out of moonlight. Or it may have looked like a maggot that was growing more legs than a spider. Or a man with arms and legs that stretched out over the forest, and a face just like the moon's face, except it was moving. The druids were running away from the cave as they saw it coming, and they ran straight into the soldiers. But the soldier who'd seen the light turning into a web saw it scuttle over the edge of the cave, down to the baby, and the light seemed to flare up out of the cave as if the moon had fallen in. The Romans marched their prisoners back to the village and executed all of them, except the head druid, who was an old man they'd hardly even noticed. They wanted to find out from him what they were up against and he wanted them to know. He'd done what the druids never dared to do. He'd used magic so old it was almost forgotten, not just to call their god they mustn't name, but to keep it here on the earth, instead of coming down on the moonlight for its sacrifices. He believed the whole forest was its place now, the druids' last refuge where nobody else would dare enter. Well, the commander didn't know if burning down the forest would help so he tried to starve the thing into the open. He set a guard around the village so that nobody could get out. A few nights later, they saw the moonlight coming through the forest and trying to reach out for people, and sometimes they saw a man made out of moonlight standing just inside the forest, beckoning. Some of the soldiers almost went to him, except the others held them back. One of them thought that when the man went back into the forest just before dawn, he got taller as he went away until he was as tall as the trees. The commander had the notion that the thing got weaker as the moon waned. Of course, the druid priest made out it wasn't so, but he must have realized the commander was waiting until it was weakest before he attacked. So one night, just before dark of the moon, the druid escaped, ran into the forest. He came back at dawn, or something did. Meaning, Diana said, meaning it looked like him. It mostly was him. He'd made the ultimate sacrifice, and he almost managed to let it come among them before they realized. Only the Romans saw how all the villagers backed away when the druid came out of the woods. So they tied him until he couldn't move a muscle, and waited until nightfall. And they saw him start to glow as if he'd swallowed the moon. The next day, they made the villagers cut down the trees around the cave, all except the one where they'd found the bit of uniform. And then they crucified the druid on it, and piled wood round it, and set fire to it. In the morning, the fire was ash, but the druid, or the thing that looked like him, was still alive and crawling about in the hot ash, though all that was left of it was a head on a few charred bones. For an instant, Diana saw that as clearly as if she'd once seen it herself. She snatched her mind back to the flickering room, the windows patchy with moisture. The pain must have trapped it, Needham said, or going inside the druid. Otherwise it would have got loose from the tree. So the soldier who saw clearest drew his sword and went into the hot ash and chopped off its head and arms and legs, and then he kicked all of it down into the cave. Except he picked up the head. Happen he was showing he wasn't scared to. And the moment he touched it, it was part of him. He went and stood on the edge of the cave, and he cut off his own arm, and then he stepped off the edge himself. That same day, the Romans killed all the villagers and burned the village and most of the forest to the ground. Even as a story, that dismayed her. But why? Though the place would be forgotten, 
so that the rest of the druids wouldn't gather here, and they knew something was alive down there that might get a hold over people who settled near. Presumably Rome wasn't happy about what they did, because there's no record of it, or the garrison as I know of, though I wonder if the thing down there wiped out all memory of the place until it was ready to come back. But if the memory was wiped out, how can I know about it? Say I dreamed it. Say I dream because I can't see. I told you you wouldn't believe me. I didn't say that, but I don't understand how, if all that was forgotten, the dressing of the cave got started. I think the druids still knew where to look. It would have wanted them to. I think Moonwell was settled by druids, people with some of the old beliefs, anyway, after the Romans left Britain. Happened they thought they'd revive what was in the cave until they realized what they'd be reviving. What do you think it'd do if it ever got loose? Think how much it must hate mankind for crucifying it and burning it and chopping it to bits and leaving it down there in the dark. The figure they made out of flowers wasn't a tribute. It was meant to guard the cave. I heard tell that once it didn't just have a halo round its head. Its head was the sun. The sun god, Diana realized. That's why they put it there on Midsummer Eve. Only now they pretend it's for St. John the Baptist Day and make it look like a saint. Aye, but do you know why it was Midsummer Eve? Because that's when the nights start getting longer and the power of the sun begins to wane, which is like saying the power of the moon gets stronger. In Rome, it was the feast of your namesake, the goddess of the moon. No, I'm the other one, the huntress, Diana said, almost without thinking. If man stops them dressing the cave, how much do you think it will matter? Not much, by itself. Needham's eyes were suddenly more lifeless than ever, if that was all he planned to do. Why, what else? You'll have to ask him that. Needham pushed himself to his feet. Now, you'll have to excuse me. I haven't talked so much for years. I'll see you part of the way back, if you like. Glancing at the window, Diana saw that the mist had vanished as unexpectedly as it had appeared. A waning moon was high above the moors. I'll find my way, she said. Thanks for putting up with me. Moonlight coated all the slopes, turning heather into white lace, grass into spikes of ice. From the first slope, Diana saw Needham in his doorway, his eyes like globes of marble. She looked back again from the top of the slope. His door was closed, his window was dark. She made her way down the slope toward Moonwell. Doughy clouds rose over the horizon, but the moon showed her every open shaft and made them look deeper and blacker as the light probed into them. Could any of them be connected with the main cave? The breathless silence isolated her with the moon, tilted coquettishly above her as if to display how little of its face was left, half an eye gaping at her, the top of the head missing. However fast she walked, it hovered over her. Once she thought three shapes were fluttering above her, high in the sky, but when she looked, she saw only the white, decaying mask. On the edge of the ashen land she faltered, for stars were glimmering in the heather, five-pointed figures in a dozen places. She was spellbound until she realized they were spiders' webs. She ran through the ash to the path down to Moonwell, not sure yet how much she believed of Needham's story. She couldn't expect Nick to take any of it seriously, and certainly his newspaper wouldn't. Once she was home, she could ponder what she'd heard, but there was no doubt in her mind what she must do now. She had to confront Godwin Mann. 19. The second newspaper to pick up the story was a tabloid. Priest in sex and drug book squabble, the headline said. Jeremy flung the paper on the table that had ousted the altar and waited while Geraldine read the report. Because of a printer's error, the town wasn't named. At least people won't know it's us, she said. You should have seen their faces when I bought the paper, Jerry. Everyone in Moonwell must be rubbing their hands over it except Father O'Connell and Diana Kramer and one or two others. So let them. They can't do us any more harm. They'll have to accept eventually that we aren't going to budge. My God, what more harm do you think they could do? When did you last see a customer step through those doors? 
What do you want us to do? Stay here just to prove a point while the books gather dust and the bank manager comes for us? He went round the table to her and held her shoulders gently. Some of the bookshops in Hayon Wye are supposed to be falling vacant. We'd have the Welsh mountains there and neighbors who care about books. And what about Andrew? Are we just going to abandon him? You heard the way he was screaming last night. He must have been having a nightmare, and no wonder. But what are we going to achieve by staying? June and Brian aren't going to let us anywhere near him. I'm not so sure about Brian, Geraldine said, knowing that Jeremy was probably right. But of course it wasn't only Andrew who made her feel compelled to stay in Moonwell. She wished they could leave as much as Jeremy did. Whenever she met people in the street, she couldn't help wondering what they thought of her. Her yearning for their good opinion dismayed her even more than their contempt, and sometimes when people spoke to her as if they were doing her a favor, she was barely able to restrain herself from flying at them. Why couldn't Jonathan make himself clear? If she had him buried wherever they moved to, would that satisfy him? Or had the shining gravestone meant that he wanted to be buried only in Moonwell? She had to let them know in Sheffield soon if she didn't want his grave moved here. Perhaps she didn't need to be alone with her doubts. If Jeremy saw the stone, he would have to believe, whatever arguments that might lead to. Come with me tonight, she blurted out, and I'll show you why I don't know if I want to leave. Why tonight? Why not now? It's not as if there's anyone to keep the shop open for. You never know, we might be lucky today. Wait until tonight, Jerry, all right? I have a reason. They'd see nothing in daylight at the graveyard. She never had. Perhaps sharing her vision would help her understand why. Did Jonathan's life after death mean there had to be a god, or would life after death exist without religion, whatever the religions claimed? In time, she might talk to Father O'Connell. As for Godwin Mann, she suspected that he would regard her belief in Jonathan as something she ought to confess, not discuss. Nobody came to the shop that day. She wondered if Mann's followers were putting off potential customers. Jeremy tried to conceal his impatience with having been made to wait. The thought of feeling trapped in the shop until dark didn't appeal to her either. Let's go out and I'll buy you dinner, she said, remembering that she'd said that the first time they'd gone for a meal. They drove to the Snake Inn all by itself in the pines on the Manchester Road. After dinner, they sat outside watching mountains glow in the twilight and grow dim, and Geraldine realized how peaceful she felt now that she was out of Moonwell. Suppose Moonwell was where Jonathan wants to be, and Man and his followers were driving him out. She could imagine how their children would treat him if he were alive, the child of the disreputable Booths. She felt as if Man couldn't even leave him alone where he was. As she drove back to Moonwell, the moon appeared above a reservoir, a lopsided crescent skimming the water. Toward Moonwell, it seemed to grow brighter, icing the ridges. The signpost for Moonwell dripped with rain like whitewash, the town's name hardly legible. As she turned the van onto the side road, she felt herself grow tense with wishing. All the way up to the crest that overlooked the town and down the last stretch of streaming tarmac, she was wishing that there would be something for Jeremy to see. The van coasted down to the church, railings and tree trunks fluttered by, blurring her view of the graveyard. As she parked the van, Jeremy stared about, obviously disappointed by where she'd brought him. He was blocking her view, but she suddenly felt sure that the stone would be there. She turned off the engine and slid back her door. Come and see, she murmured. Jeremy dragged his door open, the sound harsh in the silence. She splashed through a puddle to take his hand as he climbed down. Beyond the dripping railings, the moonlit grass was almost as white as the memorials. She was surprised how bright the remnant of moon was. At the forefront of the newest graves, where she'd left the flowers for Jonathan, a stone was glowing. She tugged at Jeremy's hand. Look, she said urgently, and pushed open the gate that was beaded with rain. Under their feet, the soaked gravel made a sound halfway between a squeak and a squelch. She stepped onto the soggy lawn, and then she missed a step. Not all the stone was there. It was certainly Jonathan's, for she could read most of his name. Nathan, it said. But would that be enough for Jeremy? 
Why wasn't it all there? The stone was mottled now as though it were aging. The marks reminded her of the markings of the moon, and she had an odd momentary notion that the stone was incomplete because the moon was waning. Come on, she whispered, pulling Jeremy onto the grass, but this time it was he who made her falter. He was staring at the flowers she'd left where the stone was. In the moonlight they were moving perceptibly, opening. What's that? Jeremy demanded in a small choked voice. He peered at the flowers, stumbled forward. Look at the stone, Geraldine urged him. Under the mottling it showed not only the year of Jonathan's stillbirth, but also, very faintly, the month and the day. The stone, Jeremy, she cried, just as the moonlight vanished. She moaned in frustration and dismay. Clouds that would go on for minutes had closed over the moon, and the stone was no longer glowing. It was barely visible in the barred light through the railings. Jeremy was stooping to the flowers, reaching for them, and then his hand flinched back. My God, they've taken root. They're growing. It doesn't matter. Jeremy, read the stone. She wanted to fling herself at him, hold his head so that he had to see. How might Jonathan be feeling because his father wouldn't look? But Jeremy was tugging at the flowers, one of which tore free of the wreath, spattering the headstone with moist earth. She stepped toward him, and then headlights swept into the graveyard and pinned them both. Jeremy leaped up, almost falling. Geraldine glanced at the stone and saw that now it was blank. Beyond the headlight, the sliding door slammed open. In the name of God, what are you doing there? Benedict Eddings cried. Geraldine turned toward him, then looked back at once at Jonathan Stone. But there was no stone, only bare grass and her flowers, which were curling up, withering. It's this place, Jeremy said hoarsely. There's something wrong with it. Things growing that shouldn't be growing. What business is it of yours? Nobody of yours is laid to rest in there. Benedict flung open the gate with a clang that dislodged a shower from the railings. Come out of there at once. Haven't you committed enough sacrilege? You'd stoop to desecrating graves, would you? Windows lit in the cottages behind him. A sash slid up. Jeremy lurched toward him as if to manhandle him into the graveyard. I told you, something's happened to the flowers. Take a look for yourself. Benedict retreated hurriedly. Have you been taking drugs as well as selling books about them? Leave our graveyard this instant, or I'll call the police. You'll call the fucking police, will you? Maybe I should call them to you and your shoddy workmanship, you pious little hypocritical bastard. Jeremy took another step then burst out laughing mirthlessly as Benedict retreated further. He grabbed Geraldine's arm so hard she almost cried out. For Christ's sake, let's get home, he muttered. Faces peered out of windows opposite the church as Jeremy started the van. When he swung the vehicle away from the pavement, she realized he was shaking. What did you see, she said, as gently as she could. Did you see the stone? I don't know what I saw, and I don't want to know. He slowed the van and clenched his hands on the wheel as if that would quiet him. But I'll tell you one thing. I wouldn't have a child of mine buried there if it was the last graveyard on earth. 20. June was full of righteous anger when she came back from the Christian shop. Hazel didn't want to say much, but I got it out of her. He found them dancing on the graves and throwing the wreaths about. Either they thought they could get their own back on the town that way, or they were high on drugs. I've never heard anything so pathetic. Brian blinked at her from where he sat hunched behind the counter. I hear they're planning to move. Good riddance. They'd better not try to say goodbye to Andrew. She glanced around the shop. Why are you sitting dreaming in the gloom like I don't know what? You'll have people thinking we're shot. When she switched on the fluorescent tubes, the interior of the shop jerked forward, closed around him as the street under the padded sky fell back. Sitting in the dark like an old spider, she said, and brushed away a star-shaped web between two stoves in the window. What's been wrong with you these past few days? Some kind of summer germ, I expect. Maybe I need more fresh air. You can collect the boy from school, then. He was saying you don't anymore, just yesterday. 
Take him for a walk, if you like, while I have time off from the other shop. And if you don't feel any better, go to the doctor. Even Godwin does. Brian closed his eyes, but her voice probed the nervous orange dimness where he was trying to hide. You'd tell me if there was anything else, wouldn't you? Godwin says we mustn't keep things to ourselves. Bring them out into the open where they can be dealt with. That's what we're supposed to do. I know what he says, Brian mumbled, feeling as if she kept dragging him out of a long, dim tunnel that was himself. If only he could go all the way down there, he might stop remembering for at least a little while. You aren't blaming me, are you? I know you must be frustrated. It's only that I'm afraid Andrew might hear us, and I still think he's backward because God was punishing us for what we used to do. The shop bell rang. Brian's eyes twitched open. A young woman wearing a loose overall with a crucifix stitched on the front was striding up to the counter. Mr. Bevan, Godwin says, would you come and see him now, if you don't mind? Brian thought of hiding in the tunnel of himself, of hunching himself up so tightly that they wouldn't be able to ferret him out. Once they went for help, he could make a run for it, onto the moors. But June was watching him, not knowing whether to be proud of him or nervous, and it seemed he could only do what he was told. He followed the young woman into the street. Her overalls sketched her body, and he felt his groin stirring until the sun broke through the clouds. He had almost to close his eyes as she led him to the hotel. He could feel his skin stinging wherever it wasn't covered. The relative dimness of the hotel felt like ointment on his skin, soothed his eyes. The young woman announced them at the reception desk, then took him up to man's room. At the moment when he had to leave the rickety lift, Brian's steps grew heavier as he remembered all that he'd done and felt, and would have to confess. Okay, man called when the young woman knocked at his door. She stood aside for Brian, who stumbled into the room more quickly than he meant to. It must be one of the smallest bedrooms in the hotel, just a single bed and a sink under a mirror bolted to the wall. The bareness made him think of an interrogation room. Man was sitting on the bed. His angular face looked thinner than ever, tight and ready as a fist. He sat forward, blue eyes gleaming. Close the door, Brian. I'd appreciate your help. This was so unexpected that Brian had to lean against the door. What can I do? I need rope, all you have. Better still, rope ladders. You'd be better off with the mountain rescue people. They'd be able to see you were safe as well. They don't want me to do what I have to do. They say it's too dangerous. Seems like they don't trust in God as much as they should. Won't you do this for God? I'll pay for everything you provide. Brian wanted to help, yearned to, if that would relieve him of his guilt. But it wasn't that simple. I haven't any ladders at the shop. I'd have to order them. I'd need them early next week. I could drive over to Sheffield. If man trusted him so much, perhaps he wasn't as guilty as he thought he was. Would you do that? I'd be most grateful, and you don't need me to tell you God would be. He glanced down at his clasped hands, then at Brian. I want to ask you one more favor. Don't tell anyone what you'll be doing for me, okay? I don't want our enemies to learn of it and try to stop me. Stop you doing what? Man gazed at him until Brian wished he hadn't asked, felt as if he'd betrayed himself by asking. But Man was only deliberating, apparently. I mean to take God down into the cave, he said almost to himself. Whatever is there is no match for God. His eyes focused sharply on Brian. I told you that because you'd agreed not to say anything. I'll see you Sunday at the rally, he said, with the hint of a warning in his voice. Or before then, if you get to Sheffield first. Here, let me give you a hundred pounds, and if you spend more, just show me the check. Brian stuffed the notes deep into his pocket. Man was already sinking back on the bed, folding his hands on his chest, his face relaxing a little, perhaps as much as it ever did. Brian closed the door quietly and strolled along the corridor the wad of notes brushing repetitively against his thigh. 
It seemed a token that he could redeem himself, or even that he'd been judged and found worthy. Surely man could tell if anyone could. He hadn't meant her to fall, he reminded himself. He wished he could believe he'd dreamed her fall, as he'd dreamed the other night of going up to the cave and creeping behind man's sentry there. Perhaps that dream was a symptom of the fever he'd caught, some midsummer illness worse than hay fever, for even the thought of the dream made his skin crawl. He still felt in danger of confessing if he didn't keep tight control of himself, and if he confessed to making the young woman fall, he was sure he'd be suspected of far worse. At least there would be only one more rally before man went down the cave. Clouds had closed over Moonwell again. The subdued light allowed him to step confidently into the square. He'd take Andrew for a walk on the moors. He waited by the main door of the school while the children swarmed out. The last few came out by themselves, their faces sullen or smiling at a secret or bright with faith. Brian kept glancing up in case the clouds were about to break, and so he didn't notice Andrew until the boy had walked past him to Katie at the gate. Katie spent most of her time at the Christian shop now, perhaps atoning for having stolen from the Bevans. Her presence at the school made Brian feel as if June didn't trust him. Here, Andrew, he called. It's your dad. Here I am. Andrew turned clumsily, his school bag bumping one scabby knee. It's all right, Katie, Brian said. I'll take him. Mrs. Bevan said I were to bring him home. She said you had to go and see Mr. Mann. He needed my help, Brian said defensively, and reminded himself that he wasn't supposed to tell. You can say to my wife I took the lad. We're going for a walk. You'd like that, wouldn't you, son? Andrew nodded so feebly that Brian could almost have hit him for making Katie think he didn't like to be with his father. The rescue man said it were going to be misty on the moor, Katie said. I didn't say we were going there, did I? Brian felt found out as if he were the criminal, not her. All right, then, he muttered at Andrew, we'll go home. I'd better come, Katie said. She must be afraid that June would think she wasn't to be trusted even to collect Andrew, but it seemed to Brian that she was making sure he didn't go on the moors with Andrew. What business was it of hers? The boy had to do what his father told him. Brian was tempted to take him up anyway, except that she would only go telling tales to June, upsetting her. He walked faster instead, making Katie pant and stumble to keep up as he dragged Andrew along by one hand. Thanks anyway, Katie, June said. I'm sorry I didn't realize. She sounded to Brian as if she were apologizing for him. I'll be going to Sheffield tomorrow if you're interested. What are you going there for? On Godwin's behalf. He'd expected that to drive her doubts away, but she was still trying not to frown. Why? I'll tell you later, he said, and thought of another way to justify himself to Katie. Listen, Andrew, you tell your new teacher that if she wants a bit more room than she's got at Mrs. Scraggs, we'd be happy to have her. The moment June nodded, he realized that would give them even less opportunity for sex. He felt as if he'd tricked himself. At least June's doubts should vanish once she knew what man had asked of him. But when he told her after Andrew was in bed, she still looked dubious. She must be worried on man's behalf, not suspicious of Brian's story. He was glad to go to bed to hide in his sleep for a while, until he woke shaking uncontrollably because of what he'd seen, the moon's new face hatching. It was more than a full moon. It was swollen and trembling, almost filling the sky and touching the moor. It had more than one face. It had three, one of which vanished before he could glimpse it as the white globe began to turn. It wasn't just trembling. It was cracking open, hatching three shapes the color of the moon, shapes that unfurled their wings and glowed brighter as they flapped away across the moor. He could still see the new face as they burst forth from it, the face that had been hidden until the familiar markings turned away. The new face was his own. Of course, it was the dream that was making him shiver, not the frosty light of the remnant of moon outside the window. All the same, he felt as if the light were making his body uncontrollable, hardly recognizable. He was tempted to go to the mirror to prove to himself that he didn't have the moon's face, however unfamiliar it felt, but he would be bound to wake June. 
Here on the edge of nightmare he felt vulnerable again, at the mercy of whoever might find out about him. If man found the hiker's body, he would never be able to keep from confessing. But man needn't find the body. At least, he needn't be able to tell anyone about it. His safety would be in Brian's hands. Twenty-one. Bit summary today, isn't it? Too bloody summary by half, and there'll be more of it before the year's over. Look at them all grinning like idiots. You'd think the sun was shining just for them. Or like they think it's shining out of Godwin Man's arse. One of them won't be grinning when we've finished with them. Are you ready then, Mr. Gloom? Let's join the happy throng, Mr. Despondency. Eustace stepped out of his cottage when he saw that the crowd was thinning. A few stragglers hurried along the high street on their way to the cave. Hardly anyone chatted to him on his rounds since the fiasco at the pub. Maybe they'd rather God delivered their letters. Like pigeon post, only holier. Pentecostal post, he muttered as he closed his gate. He made his way through the deserted streets and climbed toward the sky. Large white clouds unfurled across the sun and drifted onward. An old man who lived in Kill Lane was struggling up the last few yards before the moor. When Eustace offered him a hand, he grumbled, I can manage. For years, Eustace had been Moonwell's unofficial social worker, checking that old people didn't need help while he was on his rounds. But now some of them wouldn't even open their doors to him. No wonder someone must have been delighted to make him deliver the letter to Phoebe Wainwright. But before today's rally was over, he'd blow their halo off if he could. He owed Phoebe that much. The choir was singing as he stepped onto the charred moor. He followed the path of blackened stubble through the ash to the stone bowl. All of man's followers, which seemed to include virtually the whole of Moonwell, stood above the cave. About time you joined us, Eustace, Mrs. Scragg said loudly from where she stood, watching the children as if their parents weren't with them. Mr. Gloom to you, he almost said. She'd always told him he was slow at school, the old bitch. Maybe it wasn't such a bad thing if Phoebe didn't deliver so many children for the Scraggs to cow, but he still meant to expose the writer of the letter. He walked faster, staring at hundreds of faces he'd seen at their front doors in answer to his knock, every one of them sealed into the same pious blankness now, just enough masks to go round for God's matinee. Even the dressmaker's look of contemptuous triumph as she realized he'd come to the rally seemed preferable, though he would have liked to spit in her face. He came to rest opposite man as a large mottled cloud closed over the sun. Though he was beyond the crowd, he felt unsettlingly close to the cave. Perhaps he'd walked around the bowl too fast. The crowd seemed to be turning in a slow dance, a whirlpool whose center was the cave. He closed his eyes to try to regain his balance, to be ready to prowl in search of faces that looked guilty, when man started urging them to confess. He'd know which one to stare at until they couldn't keep quiet any longer. He was sure he would. But he was still trying to settle himself when the choir fell silent. In the stillness, which the faint sound of church bells was too distant to trouble, man said, I won't ask anyone to confess here today. Eustace's eyes snapped open. I know you're all here because you believe, the evangelist was saying. God's love is in every one of us now, and we've only to try our best to be worthy of it. He loves you for offering this place back to him. Now I want to ask you all to do him one more favor. I want you all to join me here at noon on St. John the Baptist Day to help me make this God's place forever. His voice echoed from the monotonous bare slopes and resounded in the cave. I know that ordinarily it would be a day for trading, but I want to ask you, as you love God, to close your shops that day and join me here. All you'll have to do is pray. I'll do the rest. My faith tells me I can. Eustace remembered what man had said to him the day they'd met on the road into Moonwell— that man was facing his greatest challenge. He struggled to control his dizziness, his sense of being drawn down toward the hub of the whirling. He was afraid to walk in case he fell over, but he still had to search for whoever didn't want to be noticed. 
I guess there are still a few people in Moonwell who aren't with us, man said. A very few. There's surely no reason for them to be up here, St. John the Baptist Day, and I'd appreciate it if someone who knows them would tell them so. Without more ado, he sank to his knees. And now... Now Eustace thought there would be prayers and hymns, and he would have lost his chance. Rage shuddered through him at the thought of the letter-writer hiding in plain sight, praying. His head was swimming so much that he didn't realize at first he was speaking aloud. There's someone here who's not a Christian, he said. Every face turned to him. He had the largest audience he'd ever had, and it froze him, his mouth hanging open, his body swaying uncontrollably as it fought to keep its balance. It took him a moment to realize what they were all thinking. No, he tried to say, I don't mean me. I'm not the one who has to confess. But their gaze and their feelings, contempt, encouragement, impatience, reassurance, sucked him in, and he was falling into the dark. At least his awareness was. His body was still standing, and he could hear his voice, distant and unstoppable. He didn't know what he was saying. All he knew was that the only way out of the dark was to fight his way back to his voice. Now he could almost make out what it was saying, and he was suddenly desperate to stop it. But when at last he struggled out of the dark and back into control of himself, back to feeling the ashen wind in his face as a cloud dragged across the sun— the look of the crowd told him it was too late. We forgive you, man said. We'll pray for you. Some of the crowd nodded and fell to their knees, but even they looked disgusted and appalled until they rearranged their faces into piety. When Eustace stumbled forward inadvertently, a woman shrank away from him as if she couldn't bear the thought of his touch. What did I say, he wanted to demand, but he didn't dare ask. As man started to pray, We ask your forgiveness, O God, for this sinner, Eustace lurched toward the path to the town. In the midst of the chorus of prayer that followed him across the moor, he thought he heard dry, croaking laughter. 22. The thing in Needham's story was like Br'er Rabbit, Diana thought. At least you had to wonder why the Romans were supposed to have thrown it down the very cave where it had been wont to receive its sacrifices. You might suspect that it had influenced them to do so, like a subtler version of Br'er Rabbit's pretense that he didn't want to be thrown to the briar patch. You might wonder if it had been able to blot out the memory of Lutadarum and of all that the Druids used to do. You might think a whole lot of damn fool things, Diana reflected— and there didn't seem to be much else she could do while she was refused access to Godwin Man. He'd no time now to talk to unbelievers, his minions had told her at the hotel. She might have gritted her teeth and pretended to accept his faith if that would let her in, but then she realized how little that was likely to achieve. She needed more than the old man's story to confront him with. She'd driven to the library in Sheffield and spent a day poring over books. She'd come away with a great deal of information and a sense that parts of it could be put together to prove all sorts of things, the way you could claim to show that God came from space or that the end of the world was near. Take Guy Fawkes' Night, which it had been illegal not to celebrate in Britain until 1859. Of course, it celebrated the failure of the gunpowder plot to blow up the Houses of Parliament, but the bonfires people lit to celebrate were at least as old as Samhain. That was the Druid festival marking the death of the sun, and it is known as Halloween now. Their other major festival was Beltane, May Eve, Walpurgisnacht, the date of Hitler's death. Beltane had celebrated the return of the sun with huge bonfires and human sacrifices. Men had passed firebrands from person to person, and whoever was holding the brand when it went out had had to go down on all fours and have his back piled with rubbish. That reminded Diana of the man in the moon with sticks on his back, just as the guy on top of the bonfires sounded like the man who wasn't a man who'd been burned at the cave. Even man couldn't stamp out Guy Fawkes' night, she told herself. As for the moon, it had always meant magic, often black. Worshipping the moon had been condemned as evil at least as far back as the Book of Job— Lunacy, lycanthropy, and moon calves, inhuman things that grew in the womb, were all blamed on the moon. 
Hecate, goddess of the witches, had originally been a moon goddess with three faces, who had been accompanied by a pack of infernal dogs. Witchcraft was supposed to be the remains of shamanism, and apparently the druids had been shamans, wearing pelts to communicate with those species of animal. Shamans were led away by dreams into the wilderness to meditate and experience many lives, life out of the body, visions, ecstasy. The Satan of the witches was identified with Cernanus, god of the druid underworld. It seemed odd that his name was so like Cerberus, guardian of the Roman underworld, a dog with three heads, three being the magic number of the druids. The pentacle had been involved in druid magic, which was why it was nicknamed the druid's foot. How far might the druidic influence extend? Perhaps it had something to do with the three wishes in fairy tales, but surely not the three persons of God or the three victims on Calvary. There were too many questions and glimmering connections. She felt stifled, unable to think. She stepped out of her cottage to breathe. Patchy clouds lumbered across the sun. The sky flickered like a smoky fire. The broken promises of brightness made Diana feel frustrated, impatient to do something. But what? A phrase of a hymn drifted down from the moor, together with a smell of ash. It wasn't worth her trying to confront man now. She ought to be visiting the booths to reassure them that someone didn't believe the nonsense they were being accused of. Nothing but a sluggish breeze moved in the high street. Windows of shops and cottages gleamed emptily at her. A pig's plastic head stared at her from the butchers. With nobody about to disapprove of her, she felt a touch of that sense of homecoming she'd experienced the first time she'd seen Moonwell, yet she felt as if she'd forgotten why she was needed here, or didn't even know. The street seemed to ache with the absence of children, the silence where there should be shouts, the sounds of play. It didn't matter what they were led to believe, so long as they were happy, she tried to tell herself. They'd grow out of it, some of them anyway. But she wasn't convinced they were happy, didn't want to imagine how school might be for them now. Her thoughts shut off the streets from her, and so she was halfway across the town square before she noticed she was being watched. It was the sound that alerted her, a faint soft tearing mingled with snarling. She couldn't locate it in the square or the empty streets. The hotel and the ponderous clouds stood over her. She took another step, and then she happened to glance past the side of the hotel, down the alley that sloped steeply past the kitchen. Six eyes met hers. She saw the eyes and teeth first, the jaws ripping at a piece of meat as red and bloody as the lolling tongues. There must be three stray dogs in the alley. Alsatians with matted fur and dangerous reddened eyes, but she could see only the heads watching her over the slope of the alley. If she moved, she thought, they would come leaping, and she would see if they really had three bodies or only one. The thought was so absurd that she stepped toward the alley to see. As soon as she moved, the three heads began to snarl in unison, bearing their gums like charred gray plastic, their stained yellow teeth. She mustn't back away or they would attack. She'd halted, willing them to slink away so that she could watch. When the clouds parted overhead, instinct made her step forward as the sun blazed straight in their eyes. They flinched back, whimpering, and fled down the alley. Diana reached the alley in time to see them turn the corner, three stray dogs. She'd known all along that they were, she told herself, but her chest was tight, her heart was jumping. Maybe she'd be able to laugh at herself when she reached the bookshop. Cheer up, Geraldine and Jeremy. She hoped they would be there. Moonwell felt like a ghost town just now, forgotten by the world. The thought stopped her breath for a moment. My God, she whispered, staring along the empty high street, wondering which way to run, who to tell. It was true, then. It was happening again, and nobody had noticed. Perhaps she had realized too late. 23. That Sunday evening, Vera was leaping through a will when she said, Something's wrong. Craig put down the telegraph and reached for his pipe. I thought it seemed like a straightforward legacy. I don't mean this, I mean Hazel. I feel something's wrong. He bent over his pipe and thumbed tobacco into it, feeling as if someone had pinched his stomach. 
Go ahead and call her. She won't want to hear from me. You know she does, Vera said fiercely and hurried to the phone. She must be anxious because she hadn't spoken to Hazel since they'd left Moonwell. If she blamed Craig for that, she was concealing it well, but he wished he'd never had that argument at Benedict's. He'd come away disliking not only Benedict, but his own daughter. At breakfast on his last day in Moonwell, Hazel had turned on Craig, accusing him of leading Benedict to expect a loan and then letting him down, of doing so because he didn't care for Benedict and his faith. Faith that we'll bail him out, you mean? Faith that people won't have heard about his shoddy workmanship? Craig had managed not to say, but the sight of Benedict looking injured yet forgiving had proved too much for him. Hazel was just looking for a substitute father, wasn't that so? Someone to tell her what to do, forgive her when she confessed she'd done wrong, make her feel safe from the world. If that's the kind of father you want, you're welcome to him, he'd growled, stalking upstairs for the luggage. Only when she wouldn't look at him as he climbed into Benedict's van had he realized how he'd injured her, and the worst of it was that he'd experienced no surge of love for his hurt child. He disliked her for not being able to cope with the truth. It wasn't up to him to judge her. They'd always encouraged her to be herself, and now she was. She wasn't their little girl any longer. After she was married, her room had felt like a wound in their house that had taken months to heal. And when Benedict was courting her, Craig had grown impotent with Vera. Fathers often went through that, apparently. But they'd adjusted to all that, or thought they had. Now parenthood seemed to have all the anxieties with none of the rewards, and he hated himself for taking out his feelings on Hazel. Vera was dialing. When she'd failed three times to make the connection, she called the operator. Moonwell, she explained, and had to repeat it twice. Look, never mind the place. I've given you the area code. Don't try to tell me there's no such place. She beckoned Craig, her voice shaking. You speak to him. But when Craig took the receiver, the phone at the other end was ringing. As Vera sank into her chair, one hand over her eyes, a voice said, Peak home care. Hello, Benedict. Is Hazel there? Her mother would like to speak to her. Not just now. Craig tried to keep the stiffness out of his voice. Will she be home soon? Could you ask her to call then? She won't be home till late. She's out praying. For a moment, Craig heard that as playing, as if Hazel were indeed a child again. They're holding a prayer meeting at the shop, Benedict went on. I wouldn't be surprised if they go on all night. Praying for what? Oh, there's always plenty to pray for, though I don't suppose you'd think so. Yes, but they don't usually go on all night, do they? Why now? I'm afraid you wouldn't believe me if I told you. His smugness infuriated Craig. Well, if you won't tell me what's going on and Hazel's mother can't talk to her, it sounds as if we'll have to come and see you. Vera nodded vigorously, smiling. It wouldn't be possible just now, Benedict said. I've had to move all the alarms into the spare room and store the rest of my materials in the shed. I can't afford to rent space any longer. I'm glad you found a way to cut your costs. We can always stay at the hotel. Don't be surprised if you see us soon. The hotel's full, Benedict said, too readily. Craig dropped the receiver into its cradle. What do you think, he said to Vera. Shall we go and see what's up? Oh, yes, please. Shall I call Lionel or will you? I'm sure he won't mind holding the fort for a couple of days. Lionel was their partner who would take over the practice if they moved. I didn't mean right now, Craig protested. I was thinking more of the weekend. I don't want to wait until then to find out what's wrong. You think something is too, I can tell. But it may not be serious by our standards. Anyway, it's really up to Lionel when we can go. Lionel said he would be happy to fit in with whatever plans they made. Go tomorrow if you like. When Craig found the phone number of the Moonwell Hotel in the AA book, having searched so hard his eyes began to ache, the receptionist told him somewhat reluctantly that a reservation hadn't been taken up. We'll take it, Craig said, and immediately felt dubious. Hazel may not thank us for this, you know, he pointed out to Vera. I'll chance it. She needs me. I can feel it. Let's hope she realizes she does, Craig said, earning himself a reproachful look. Later, he tried to make love to Vera. At the end of half an hour, his arms were trembling from supporting himself on the bed. He felt as if age had withered his penis.
Never mind, Vera said, stroking his sweaty forehead as he abandoned the task. We'll pretend we aren't married when we're staying at the hotel. He slept eventually and wakened refreshed. That lasted until they were a few miles out of Sheffield and he had to slow down on the tortuous road. A reservoir glared in his eyes. A sports car edged up behind him until their bumpers were almost touching, then swung round him and at once was braked so sharply at a bend that Craig almost rammed it. There wasn't a bus to Moonwell on Mondays, but he spent the rest of the journey wishing he'd insisted that they take the bus tomorrow. The sky turned gray as the road climbed through the wild fields toward Moonwell. Tension and lack of sleep must be catching up with him, for as the Peugeot coasted up the long slopes of the moors, he felt as if each crest concealed a drop. The feeling was uncomfortably reminiscent of his childhood fall into the mine shaft. Damn Benedict for making him feel this way. Even the sight of the blank sky above Moonwell gave him a twinge of panic. He willed himself to stay aware of the road. By the time they reached the hotel, his head was throbbing so much he could barely see. Their room was cramped under the eaves, its window protruding through. Craig sank on the bed, which exuded a faint smell of detergent, and closed his eyes. Vera drew the curtains and went out to the chemist's, while Craig lay listening to the quiet of the town, hardly the sound of a car. When Vera came back, she gave him a glass of water and a brace of paracetamol tablets. Then she said, Of all the people I could have done without, I bumped into Mel and Ursula. Remind me, Craig said, trying to relax so as to give the painkillers a chance. Benedict's holy friends. They've gone to warn Hazel we're here. Five minutes later, the lift came creaking to the top of the hotel, and Hazel knocked at their door. Oh, Mommy, why have you come back now? I'm sorry we did, if that's how you feel. I thought you might even have been glad, but I obviously don't know much. Mommy, I am glad. I never would have wanted us to part the way we did, but Godwin's called a special rally for tomorrow, and I'll be busied until then. What you mean is unbelievers aren't welcome. I just mean you'll have the town almost to yourselves and nothing to do, Hazel said unconvincingly. We'll be going nowhere while I feel like this, Craig growled, resting one arm in his closed eyes. What's wrong with Daddy? He doesn't like driving on these roads, that's all. Just leave him alone and he'll be all right. We'll be in the bar, she told him, and when Hazel demurred, I want a drink, even if you don't. We've got to talk. Craig heard their voices, swallowed by the creaking of the lift. Then the hush closed round him. He took two more pills as soon as he dared and reached for the controls of the bedside radio. He'd forgotten the evangelical station, but in fact even that wasn't coming through. All he could hear until he turned off the radio and lay back was static that sounded unpleasantly like dry, inhuman laughter. Twenty-four. Monday was half over before Diana managed to contact Nick. He sounded delighted to hear from her. Are you in town? Free for dinner? How are things in that town of yours with a strange name? What name is that, she said, trying to sound casual. To tell you the truth, I can't remember. Blame last night's heavy drinking. I remember you, though. I was sorry you had to dash off last time. So was I, Nick. But listen, you asked how were things here. I'm afraid they're getting worse. In what way? She closed her eyes and took a breath and willed him not to be incredulous. Moonwell's supposed to be a tourist town, a center for hikers, right? But the only visitors the town has had for months are the people who Godwin Mann sent ahead, and what worries me even more is that nobody seems to have noticed. Moonwell, that's the name, of course. So are you saying this is Mann's fault somehow? What else could she claim that he might even consider trying to slip into print? It sounds that way, doesn't it? Even I didn't notice until yesterday. Whatever's happening is getting to me, too. Some kind of mass hypnosis, religious hysteria, that kind of thing, you mean? If you're being affected by it, you should get out straight away. I can put you up if you like. He was making a play for her. In other circumstances, she might have responded— I can't just leave all those children in the midst of it, with nobody to care how it may be affecting them, she said, and suppressed the thought, which would neither define itself nor go away, that she was here for another purpose entirely. 
If she left, she might forget the town just as Nick had forgotten the name. She mustn't brood about staying and being forgotten. I have to see what happens tomorrow. Man's going to do what he came to do, she said. Let me know what happens, or if you change your mind about leaving, he said, and she realized he was more anxious about her than eager for a story. I wish I could promise you some coverage. Aren't you still in touch with that radio station? They closed it down last week. He was silent. Then he said, If you're as worried as you sound and won't leave, I should at least come and take a look. Oh, would you? Perhaps he'd notice the effect that had on him. When? I'll have to let you know. Not for a few days, but soon. It's your turn to buy dinner, he said. And more seriously, remember, call me any time you feel you need to. At least someone else knew now, she told herself, even if she'd had to blame man in order to convince him. Being alone in her knowledge had dismayed her, especially when the Booths had told her they were moving to Wales. If only she could talk to someone less skeptical than Nick. And then, slapping herself on the forehead, she realized that she could. She went out at once to the church. Sunlight flickered on the thick walls and seemed to shrink the gargoyles. Mistletoe gleamed like scales on the trunk of an oak among the headstones. Father O'Connell was praying silently in front of the altar. When he stood up, dusting the knees of his cassock, she went along the aisle to him. Why, it's Diana, he said, and took her hands. Have you come to swell my dwindling flock? Not exactly, Father O'Connell, I'm afraid. I just wanted a word with you. Always glad to see you. And listen, call me Bob, so you don't have to put on such a glum, respectful face. Come with me now, and we'll have ourselves a pot of the Earl Grey you like so much. He ushered her across the high street to the presbytery, a cottage where an Alsatian dozed on the hall carpet and pricked up her ears as the door opened. Are fewer people coming to church then, Diana said? Fewer of my congregation since I told them what I thought of what happened at the bookshop. Some of man's flocks stray in now and again, but they always seem to find it wanting. He patted the dog absent-mindedly. Good girl, Kelly. Still, if I'm to tell the truth, maybe they've reason to have their doubts about the church. Seems as if it may have a bit of a Celtic fort in its foundations. I thought you believed taking over traditions was one of the strengths of your church. Yes, but there's traditions and traditions. I found out that when they built the fort, they may have buried a child in the foundations. Supposed to make it impregnable, you see. But you don't want to hear such things about children. Go in the front now and sit down, and when I've made tea, we'll talk. Diana sat in the front room and glanced about at Irish landscapes, a family album on a table next to the electric fire, a Morris West novel sprawled on a chair. Kelly padded in and laid her head on Diana's lap, nuzzled her hand until Diana stroked her. By the time the priest wheeled in the trolley, Diana was impatient to talk. I've been looking into our traditions, too, she said. She told him how Lutadorum had vanished from the map, how the same was beginning to happen to Moonwell. When I first came here, the streets were full of hikers and tourists like myself. But where are they this year? The streets are full of new faces, and maybe that's one reason we didn't notice. But they aren't tourists. His eyes were telling her to go on, and so she said, I think Godwin Man has stirred it up whatever's making the outside world forget about us. And another thing it can do is prevent us from noticing. Well, he said, and the doorbell rang. Excuse me a minute, he said. She could have wept for having been interrupted when she was almost sure he'd been sympathetic. He came back along the hall with someone and put his head round the door. You can stay a few more minutes, can't you? I'd like to hear what else you have to say. She'd said all she could. Presumably he'd gone up to his study to counsel one of his parishioners, and what she'd told him might fade from his mind. Quite soon, however, she heard him and his visitor on the stairs again. They halted outside the front door, and Father O'Connell pushed the door open. Diana, I think you ought to hear this. His visitor, a thin, pale, awkward man in his thirties, sidled timidly past him into the room. Diana had seen him before. In the lobby of the hotel, she realized— he looked on the edge of fleeing, even when the priest said, Miss Kramer shares your doubts. I'd like you to tell her what you just told me. The pinched man only stared at her. 
Delbert here has been watching over the cave on Godwin Mann's behalf, the priest explained. I think you meant to say, Delbert, that he is more worried about what he's up against than he lets on. I didn't mean to say that. Delbert dragged his chapped fingers through his graying hair. He believes he can do anything. He thinks he's been called here as God's champion. He thinks his father playing Satan in that film was a sign to him that he had to stand for God. He's high on faith, gets that way at the rallies. He's even having visions now. Then you're saying, the priest said with a hint of nervousness, you don't think he's equal to whatever task he's set himself. Didn't I already say so? Oh, you want her to hear as if any of us can do anything now. He gave Diana a mistrustful sidelong glance. I know about these things. I was a Satanist in California until they put me in the bug house and Godwin brought me out. I'm telling you, what's down there in the cave is older than Satan. It's what cavemen were afraid of in the dark, and it'll turn us into cavemen if he stirs it up. It'll have us how it wants us. Something dark pressed against the window, molded to it like a snail, the shadow of a cloud. Does anyone else feel the way you do, Diana said, and found her voice was stiff. They'd rather believe Godwin will save us all, but I'm telling you, I looked down into that cave last night, and I heard something laughing. It's ready for him. It's eager to meet him. Maybe it even put the thought in his head to come here in the first place. I told them what I heard down there, and he figured Satan was making me tell him to try to phase him. So now he's even more set on going down there tomorrow. If people could be convinced in time that it's dangerous, Delbert interrupted her. The more opposition he runs into now, the more he'll be convinced he's right. I told you, there's not a thing anyone can do. Deep down she felt he was wrong, but that wasn't reassuring either. You said he'd had a vision, Father O'Connell prompted. That's the worst part. He believes everything's a sign he's going to win on God's behalf. He glared out at the clouds looming behind clouds and muttered, He told me he dreams every night of a calendar with a devil's face, a calendar for June. And after tomorrow's date, the calendar is dead blank. 25. Someone was knocking at the front door. Brian forced his sticky eyes open and threw off the humid sheets. It must be the police, and all he felt was relief that they'd found out what he'd done to Godwin and the hiker. He swung himself out of bed and stumbled, blinking, to the window. He pulled the curtains open and levered up the sash with the heels of his hands. As the sunlight struck his hands, they felt as if they were shrinking. He leaned out of the window, his shoulders bumping the sash. The two people on the path weren't policemen. They were Godwin's messengers. June was closing the front door. The rattle of the sash made the messengers look up. Nearly time, they called to Brian, smiling brightly, and trotted to the next house to spread the good news. Godwin wasn't dead then. Brian had only dreamed of disguising the flaw in one of the ropes he'd brought back from Sheffield, and you couldn't be held responsible for dreams. In the bathroom, he bathed and shaved, cutting himself twice because the light over the mirror stung his eyes and skin. Surely it was guilt that made him feel like this, gave him a feverish impression that his body was no longer quite his. Perhaps Godwin wouldn't find the hiker. Perhaps she'd fallen farther than Godwin could climb. It wouldn't be fair if helping God and Godwin caused Brian to be found out, to betray himself. When he was dressed, he ventured downstairs, nervous of encountering Miss Ingham, Andrew's teacher, who was lodging with him now. But she'd gone ahead to help at the cave, leaving June flapping her duster at corners of the front room. He'd never known such a spidery summer, nor had he ever seen five pointed webs before. June half turned toward him as he came into the room. How are you feeling? We were going to let you sleep. What do you mean? There's nothing much wrong with me, as I know of. You were tossing and turning half the night. Once I woke up and you weren't even in bed. I'd have come looking for you, but you'd got me so exhausted I just went back to sleep. I must have gone to the toilet, he said hastily, rather than admit that he couldn't remember getting out of bed at all. That's where you'd better go now, Andrew, and then we'll be off. June went back to peering into corners of the room. Her back to Brian, she murmured, You seem very eager to go. 
Shouldn't I be? She couldn't know about the cave. There wasn't much to know. I thought you'd be glad I'm helping Godwin. Of course I'm glad. But then she looked straight at him. I just wonder why you're suddenly so anxious to please him. Who says I'm anxious? I didn't ask to help, you know. He asked me. Thank God it was Andrew to save him from further awkwardness. Hurry up, son. You're going to see Godwin Man climb down the cave. You're not to go anywhere near, Andrew, do you hear? You just keep hold of my hand while we're up there, son, Brian said with a touch of defiance, and took one clammy hand, thrusting his fingers between Andrew's, so that the boy's ragged, bitten fingernails couldn't scratch his skin. The high street was crowded with people converging on the paths up to the moor. June caught up with Hazel as they climbed the nearest path, the limestone houses huddling together as the town fell away. Hazel chatted brightly, though she seemed preoccupied, while Benedict wondered aloud if Brian might like a security check at the house or the shop. God had enough to look after without keeping burglars away. He had to raise his voice to be heard over the sound of hammering ahead, and he fell silent as they stepped over the edge of the stone bowl. Several of man's followers were standing just above the cave, by two pitons driven into the rock. Man was going to abseil down, Brian thought and felt proud of himself for having helped. He smiled at the sky masked by clouds. He'd already told the police about the hiker, he reminded himself to quell his waves of nervousness. Whatever Godwin found down there, surely it needn't trouble Brian. All the same, Brian flinched as the crowd in the bowl began cheering. Godwin had arrived. He stood for a few moments on the edge of the stone bowl, hands spread on either side of him. Perhaps they were meant to deprecate the cheers, but they gave him the look of Christ blessing a multitude. Some of the older people in the gathering dabbed at their eyes. The cheering intensified as he came down into the bowl, the gold cross stitched on the front of his overall, catching the muffled sunlight, a whistle dangling from a string around his neck. In the midst of the cheers, the screech of a bird somewhere on the moors sounded like laughter. The cheering faded as man reached the pitons, he knelt above the cave and closed his eyes. A wind stirred the ash on the blackened slopes, setting charred stumps of heather trembling. Sunlight fluttered over the landscape and made the mouth of the cave appear to shift, stone lips working. Brian saw June grip Andrew's hand with both of hers. Man crossed himself eventually and stood up. I want to thank you all on God's behalf for coming here today. I guess he thinks of you the same way I do. You're a living act of faith. I can feel your faith giving me the strength to do what I was called here to do. Brian willed himself to believe with his entire being. He was sure he could feel what the evangelist felt, the energy of a faith that was urging Godwin to succeed. Brian couldn't be singled out in the midst of that. It couldn't be directed at him to make him speak. Perhaps it was just his restless night that was making him still feel nervous. The wind caught man's voice, swelling it like a voice that was being tuned on a radio. You'll pray for me, won't you? I know God wouldn't have sent me here if he didn't think I could do it. But right now, deep down, I'm scared. I know I won't be scared if I can hear you all praying and singing God's praises while I climb. His voice grew thin as the wind rose. Today God will heal this festering wound in the earth, he said, unfolding one fist toward the cave. And then I believe this whole country will begin to turn away from superstition and the occult back to God when it hears what I'll have to tell. Several of his followers brought him his equipment and helped him put it on. A miner's helmet, a kit bag loaded with rope and metal that clinked, Two of them fixed the ropes for him to opzile. He stood on the edge of the cave and glanced up as the sun burst through the clouds. I think God wants us to know something, he said, smiling, and swung himself out over the edge, began to walk straight down the wall of rock. It didn't feel like a good omen to Brian. The light seemed to make the cave gape wider, brought the charred slopes lurching forward as if the low, swollen clouds were forcing them. He's going down to pray, June murmured to Andrew, to make this into a holy place. Why? Because bad people used to use it for evil things. They didn't know any better. They weren't like us. They weren't civilized. 
Like ape men, mummy? Something like that. Nobody had told them about God, she murmured, sharing a smile with Hazel and Benedict at his questions. Brian willed her to shut up so that he could think. Why was the sight of the ropes jerking as Godwin climbed down, making him so nervous? Godwin had obviously learned how to climb in preparation for his task, and Brian had put aside the faulty rope. The sun glared down on him like a lamp in an interrogation room. He'd only dreamed of disguising the dangerous rope. He'd actually put it... He drew in his breath, a gasp that made his mouth taste ashen. He couldn't recall putting it anywhere. He stepped forward inadvertently, bumping into two people in front of him. The rope jerked beneath the clouding sky, and every jerk might worsen the flaw in the rope. Let's pray, one of man's watchers by the piton said. Brian stepped back, trying to pretend he hadn't moved. As the prayers began, he joined in fiercely, almost shouting, and then he glanced sideways at June. His body stiffened, prickling, although the sun had clouded over. If he hadn't glanced at her like that, she might have told herself that he'd only stumbled, but now he was sure that she knew. 26. Late that afternoon, Diana found she could no longer bear the waiting. She'd walked the length of the empty town twice, listening to hymns that drifted from the moor, telling herself that as long as the rally was singing, nothing could be wrong. She'd looked into the church and rung the presbytery bell, but there was no sign of Father O'Connell. She rather hoped he'd thought of someone in the church hierarchy to consult, though she suspected he felt bound to stay to see what happened. It seemed that Delbert's warning had come too late. Delbert had left them with man's vision of the calendar and sidled out of the presbytery, glancing fearfully about to make sure that nobody saw him. He did say he'd needed psychiatric treatment, Diana had commented, but she'd seen in the priest's eyes that he didn't think the warning could be explained away so simply any more than she did. All we can do for now is keep watch, he'd said. Her frustration dogged her through the deserted town and sent her at last toward the moor. The hell was being told to stay away. She couldn't bear not to know what was happening. The ashen sky was growing darker. Clouds like veils of sooty cobweb drifted across the gray, seemed to cling overhead. Above the path, the sun was a blurred patch of white, a spider's cocoon embedded in the clouds. Wind flaked ash from charred stumps of heather. She was intensely aware of the moors, the unchanging lonely slopes stretching beyond the horizon to the roads where traffic might be passing, unaware of Moonwell. Perhaps nobody knew it was here any longer. She wished she'd called Nick to remind him. Surely it would still be here tomorrow. The charred path was trampled black as oil. The closer she came to the sound of praying, the more of an outcast she felt. Couldn't they all be right and Diana mistaken? After all, there was a word for people like her who were convinced they knew some truth that nobody else could see. But the trouble was that she would be happy to be proved wrong. Hardly the attitude of a schizophrenic. She crept up to the edge of the stone bowl and peered in. Though you walk through the valley of darkness, you needn't fear any evil. The crowd that surrounded the cave was praying. Diana glanced about for man, hoping that she couldn't locate him because he hadn't arrived yet. And then she saw the ropes hanging slackly into the dark. The sight dismayed her even more than she could have predicted. If it was so easy to climb down there, why had nobody done it before? Surely not because climbers had been turned away until the time was right. Yet the sight of the cave growing darker under the darkening sky filled her with a sense of dreadful imminence until she could hardly breathe. The crowd, the children especially, looked vulnerable, too close to the edge, too close to flee if anything rose from the dark. Her panic sent her around the bowl, craning her neck to see more of the ropes of the gaping cave. She didn't realize how visible she was until the crowd turned on her. Their hostility felt like a blast from the cave. The children's faces were the worst, all of them wishing her away as if she had no right to be there. Even Sally blinking through her precarious spectacles at her. Even Ronnie, who'd clasped his hands together as if he'd rather hide them in his pockets. Perhaps she really shouldn't be there, she thought, retreating awkwardly toward the path. Perhaps all she was doing was undermining their prayers. It was St. John the Baptist's day, she reminded herself, not Harry Mooney's.
and then she remembered what John the Baptist's fate had been. She stared about at the blackened, lifeless slopes and realized something that she needed desperately to feel. She wasn't entirely alone. There was still Nathaniel Needham. She left the burned slopes behind as quickly as she could, but that wasn't especially reassuring. Green slopes glowed sullenly around her beneath the stifled sky, and she was uncomfortably aware of the dozens of abandoned mine shafts, the maze through which she was picking her way. They led her thoughts straight to the cave through which man was venturing. She could almost see the dripping walls, shifting as the light from his helmet swayed. She could almost feel how his feet slithered on the mud that coated the floor of the passage. She let out a gasp of relief at the sight of Needham's cottage. He was standing in the doorway, his knuckly hands gripping the stick that supported him. His long, wizened face was upturned, listening. As she approached, it swung toward her, his stick pointing at her like a dowser's rod. Who's there, he cried. It's Diana Kramer, Mr. Needham. Did you come past the cave? What are they doing there? Praying and singing hymns, she said, and with an effort, waiting for Godwin Man to come back up. He's done it then, has he? The damned fool! What kind of a preacher is he if he doesn't even realize he's putting his own soul at risk? Who does he think he is? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Didn't I tell you one reason the Druids feared the moon so much was that anyone they sacrificed to it would never go on to the afterlife? Didn't I tell you they'd be part of that thing down there forever? Well, no, you didn't, Diana murmured, rather wishing that he hadn't now. But then he's not a sacrifice. Needham gazed blankly at her. If she could read terror in his eyes, perhaps it was her own. Just about everyone in town is up there praying for him, she said. That must count for something. Needham's eyes flickered nervously. Not enough. A phrase of a hymn came drifting, blurred as mist across the slopes. Nothing could have changed yet at the cave, but the sound, thin and lonely on the moor, made her shiver. I wish I knew what he was doing, she blurted. Then you should be there watching, not bothering me. Man doesn't want anyone there who isn't totally for him. They'll blame you anyway, Needham said with a doleful smile. Are they all up there? Hasn't anyone gone down with him? No, it's just him and his miner's helmet and all the faith he can carry. Thinks that's enough, does he? Happen he thinks he's God, Needham said with a furious contempt that she thought concealed fear. Or perhaps she was projecting her own fear because she was wondering how she could know man was alone or what he was wearing. At least I imagine he's on his own, she said, reminding herself that it was just the impression she'd had on her way across the moor. The trouble was that the more she tried to deny it, the more real it seemed. If he gets into difficulty, I'm sure someone will go down after him. Bloody useless if they do, and they won't like what they find. What might that be? His face seemed to shrivel. I reckon we'll all see soon enough. He was making her feel worse. Well, I just came to let you know what was happening, she lied. I should be getting back. Aye, someone ought to be there who can see what's really going on. The wind had dropped. Layers of cloud that looked progressively blacker were gathering over the moors. The dimness made the green slopes appear to tremble, to start forward as if the earth were shifting. On the horizon, the mountains had begun to disappear into the clouds. It was early evening, but it felt more like dusk. She made her way between the open shafts as quickly as she could for fear of being trapped by the dark. The sky sank toward her as she descended the slope. The clouds were so dark now that she couldn't see their movement. The mass of blackness seemed to have stopped overhead, filling the sky. The lurid glow of grass and heather made her eyes ache. The restless mouths of shafts led her thoughts back to man. She couldn't help reluctantly admiring him. If she felt so vulnerable in the dark up here, how much worse must it be for him? He was alone with his light down there under the moors, the light groping toward whatever had been thrown down there, and what would happen when the light found it. She ground her knuckles into her lips, for she could see the light swaying on the roof above her, not of clouds, but of rock. She glared desperately at the dimming slopes. She had to go home, lie down. The silence and darkness might just be the threat of a storm, but 
Surely the light had been lightning. Her mouth was parched, her skull felt soft and throbbing. The moors shuddered whenever she glanced at them, as if the ancient rock were shaking off its vegetation, breaking through. Whatever happened at the rally would have to take place without her, but she was congratulating herself on having found her way between the shafts and back onto the path when she heard a shout from the direction of the cave. Over there, the clouds piled above the jagged rock were almost black. A movement bright as knives against the clouds made her start, but it was only a flight of birds, three of them above the cave. Silence held her, unable to stir, and then she heard the voice again. Are you all right down there? Someone was shouting. It was nothing to do with Diana. They told her to stay away, but she began to run toward the cave, her feet skidding on the ash. She wished she knew where the sun was behind the overcast. The stone bowl was so silent that she thought the rally had broken up. But no, the cave was still surrounded, the crowd peering down into the mouth that was even darker than the sky. Movement drew her eyes to the near edge, where several of man's followers were hauling on one of the ropes. They were pulling someone up out of the dark. The shout jerked at her heart. One of man's helpers was leaning down toward the cave so precariously that she was terrified she would see him fall. Godwin, are you all right? he shouted. The hollow croaking must have been man clearing his throat. For the next moment they heard his voice. It sounded gigantic in the cave. Never better, it called up. It's done at last. Praise God now as much as you like. Someone began to sing, Jesus Loves Me, and the crowd took up the hymn. Their voices sounded muffled by the black sky, cut off by the stone bowl. They ignored Diana, who watched man's helpers hauling on the rope, the pile of it behind them writhing slightly. There couldn't be much left to haul, she thought, just as a dark object rose into view over the edge of the cave. It was man. He was wearing an overall and boots, but nothing else that she could see. No helmet, no rucksack. How long had he been without a light down there? The front of his overall was bulging and muddy. Whatever had been stitched on it was indistinguishable. He turned his head, surveying the rally as the hymn gave way to cheers and deafening applause, and Diana saw that his eyes were almost shut. Perhaps even the darkness up here hurt them after he'd been down in the utter dark. He began to smile. She saw his teeth glint as his helpers pulled him up to the edge. And then the rope gave way. The crowd screamed. Those nearest the cave surged forward, and Diana was terrified that some of them would fall. They stumbled back to safety as they saw a man grab the edge and haul him south, lizard-like, up the last few feet of rock out of the cave. Perhaps he bruised his chest in doing so, for he was clutching it as he stalked away from the edge, gazing across the mouth to that part of the crowd where Andrew and his parents stood. Diana told herself that it was only the growing dark which made his smile look so ominous. The crowd was silent, waiting to be sure he wasn't injured. They began cheering again as soon as he said, Don't you worry about me. I'm back. 27. Some of the oaks below Moonwell were so old they had taken root more than once. Branches thick as Craig's paunch had stooped to the soil and rooted themselves. He and Vera spent the afternoon strolling through the tangled woods. They felt more like a church to him than a church would have, especially since the foliage cut off the sounds of gullibility from the moor. Eventually, he sat with Vera on a rock upholstered with moss beside a stream that ran through the roots of oaks. The calls of birds pierced the hushing of leaves. When Vera had gazed into the water for a while, he said, Remember Hazel didn't know when we were coming back? I know I shouldn't feel they were trying to make sure there wasn't room for us, but I do. They were just being Christians, taking in the homeless. Then why didn't Benedict say they had when you rang him? Maybe he realizes we wouldn't want to be reminded of his priggish friends. Mel and Ursula had been staying with the Eddingses since the fire on the moor had driven them out of their tent. Vera had learned that and other things she liked no better from Hazel yesterday. Well, Craig said, this is very pleasant, sitting here like this by the babbling brook, but it won't get our work done. I'm ready to leave whenever you are. I want to have one more good talk with them first, without anyone losing his temper. 
There has to be something to like about him, or our Hazel wouldn't have married him. He probably feels the same about us. Listen, while I was recuperating yesterday, I thought of something we might do for them. See what you think, Craig said, and told her. Vera's eyes widened in the growing dimness. We could, couldn't we? Why didn't we think of it before? Come on, let's see if they're back yet. In any case, the gathering dark would have driven them out of the woods. There must be a storm on the way, and Craig told himself that was why he felt nervous, in case lightning struck the trees anywhere near. They picked their way through the gloomy woods that were growing silent and chill. Roots that he couldn't see tripped him. He hadn't noticed on the way into the woods that so many trees were overgrown with mistletoe. He kept feeling he'd lost his way, especially since they'd strayed out of sight of the road. The soft, dim ground hindered him and Vera as they climbed between the looming trees, but surely climbing must lead them back to Moonwell. At last they emerged from under the vault of foliage, two fields distant from the road. They followed the dry stone wall to the road as soon as the aches in their legs began to ease. They climbed the road to the first sight of Moonwell, and Craig experienced a hint of the panic he'd suffered while driving. Darkness was thickening above the town, as if it were flooding there from all directions at once— it seemed to shrink the buildings, huddling them together, small and fragile under the oppressive sky. The rally was over, for they could see a crowd on the charred edge of the moor. Hazel and Benedict must have gone straight to the hotel. They were waiting in the lobby when the wilds limped in. Hazel thought you'd got lost, Benedict said reprovingly, raising his sharp chin and gazing down his long nose at them. Let's go up to your room. We don't want to be overheard. They all stood in the lift and watched the lit numbers that counted the floors. Nobody spoke until they were in the room beneath the eaves. Then Benedict said, I must say you could have chosen your time better. Things are difficult enough for us just now without Hazel being upset further. Oh, Craig said heavily, I thought Godwin Mann had put your world to rights. Craig, Vera murmured, reminding him what they'd agreed. He went over to the window, walking away from the argument as far as he could. The dark and the last of the rally were coming down from the moors. Your mother has something to say to you, Hazel, he said. Hazel, what do you want more than anything else in the world? Nothing for myself. Benedict's business to improve, I suppose. Things really aren't too good, Mummy, even though we're doing all we can. He's having to go further and further afield to find work. Going where his reputation hasn't reached, Craig thought, pressing his lips together and gazing down into the square. Here came Godwin Mann, supported by two of his followers. Perhaps you'll benefit from some of the goodwill your evangelist is spreading, Benedict, Vera said. Leaving aside business, Hazel, what do you and Benedict and, let me be honest, your father and I hope you'll have one day? Well, a baby, of course, one day. I knew it, Vera cried. We've been talking it over, and we've decided that's how we want to help you financially. We'll draw up a deed, and we'll buy things for the little one as soon as we know it's on its way. It must be the overall that made man look bulkier than his two helpers as they progressed along the line of street lamps which were lit despite the early hour. Craig turned away from the window. We certainly will if you'll let us. What do you say? Will you accept this as our peace offering? You ought to know you don't need to offer us anything except not being angry with us, Hazel said, and pulled him away from the window so that she could hug them both. We're very grateful, Benedict said hastily. Craig disengaged himself from the women and went over to him, shook the man's limp, clammy hand. That's settled then, Craig said. You must come home tonight and eat with us, Hazel cried. We'd better hurry home and tell Ursula. She's making the dinner. By now her tone was apologetic. I don't think she and Mel will be staying much longer now Godwin's done what he came to do. Craig heard the lift. Here he comes now. He hadn't meant to stop them talking. He wanted to ask what precisely man was supposed to have achieved. They listened as the doors of the lift creaked open, as the three came slowly down the carpeted hall past the wilds' room. Man's door closed, and his helpers took the lift down. We'll see you in about an hour, Hazel said then. Craig wished there were more lights in the room. The idea that Hazel had been nervous about talking while Man was in the corridor annoyed him, made him uneasy when, damn it, there was no reason to be. He shaved in front of the mirror above the washbowl, changed his clothes, and lay on the bed. But he couldn't relax. 
All he could do was resolve to have a good time, for Hazel's and Vera's sakes. He was glad to reach the cottage, even though the cloned Christ was waiting over the hearth. He was glad to be out of the thick gloom under the sooty sky, when by rights it shouldn't even be dusk for hours. He made appreciative noises over Ursula's cooking, spaghetti of various consistencies heaped with charred or almost raw lumps of indeterminate meat. He managed to smile when Mel clapped his hands at the news that Hazel meant to have a baby, cried another life for Christ, and insisted on leading prayers for the birth. When Craig raised the question of the rally, he couldn't get a satisfactory answer. Godwin was super, just wondrous, Ursula told him, ladling out a second helping of spaghetti despite his protests. He carried God down into the cave, and God drove out the evil. There'll be some changes round here yet, and that can only be good news. Craig caught Hazel's eye just then and was rewarded with a grimace of sympathy at the way his plate was being loaded. Maybe there was hope for her sense of humor after all. When he and Vera left hours later, Hazel gave him an impulsive kiss over the garden gate. He remembered how she'd had to stand on tiptoe to kiss him all those years ago. The impression lingered as he made his way back to the hotel, gripping Vera's hand for fear of being separated from her in the dark that was thicker than ever, breathless as the approach of a storm, even between the street lamps. He hoped the storm would break and relieve the sense of imminence that set his skin crawling. He felt a little better once he was in bed with Vera, one arm around her waist as she fell asleep, and yet he had the notion that if he slept, the storm would waken him, or something would. He needed rest before he drove home tomorrow. At least man was inaudible. On his trip down the corridor to the bathroom, Craig had passed man's room and heard a low sound that must have been the evangelist's voice, no doubt thanking God for the day's work. For a moment, Craig had thought the moon had risen, but it had only been the light from man's room. 28. The radio alarm wakened Eustace with static. He forced his eyes open and peered into the dark that was hissing at him, and eventually found the clock. Go on, you might as well go wrong, he snarled at it. Everything else has. He was burrowing under the tumbled sheets, away from the panicky sense of not knowing what he'd said on Sunday in front of the crowd, when through the open window he heard the rattle as an awning was pulled out. Someone was opening a shop. He squirmed unenthusiastically out of bed and groped his way to the window. The chilly dark felt heavier than sleep. He pushed the halves of the window wider and craned his neck to see the clock above the assembly rooms. The lit face was dim as a smoldering fire, and he had to strain his eyes to convince himself of what it said. Though the hour felt like four in the morning, the clock out there agreed with his that it was half-past six. Stare all you like, he muttered at himself. That won't make it go away. Reality's right and you're wrong. He withdrew his head, feeling like a tortoise, sluggish and crusty, and collided his way across the room to the light switch. The light here and in the bathroom was muffled, brownish. Breakfast could wait. The sooner he finished at the sorting office, the fewer people he'd encounter on his rounds. He shivered as he stepped out of the cottage, for the street felt dank as mist. The unbroken clouds overhead looked like a starless night sky. Bedrooms and kitchens were lighting up, but they and the street lamps on their pedestals of light seemed isolated by the dark. He kept his head down as he hurried to the sorting office. It was a small room behind the post office. Usually the driver of the delivery van from Sheffield would let himself in by the back entrance and leave the sacks of mail. But today the room was bare. Eustace sat on his stool and closed his eyes. Staring at the pigeonholes under the fluorescent tubes made him feel he hadn't slept enough. The dark gave him the impression that no time was passing, but when he next glanced at his watch, it was almost eight o'clock. He couldn't get through to Sheffield. Though the phone wasn't dead, he checked that by dialing to make it ring itself, he could reach nothing but a hollow stillness that made his ear tingle. He was still trying when the postmistress looked in from the shop. She lowered her round head as if she were preparing to butt him with her curly, sheep-like scalp. What's holding you up? Not a thing. I'm self-supporting. Aloud, he said. There's been no delivery, and I can't raise Sheffield. Ridiculous, she said, as if she meant him. She dialed Sheffield and thrust the earpiece up beneath her white curls, took it away from her face to glare at it for not responding. She tried the phone in the shop and came back looking unhappier with him than ever. 
It must be something in the atmosphere. No wonder it's so dark, she said, a connection he failed to grasp. But that's no excuse for lateness, no excuse at all. She'd had little time for excuses even before she'd stood up for man. Since he'd said whatever dreadful things he'd said in front of them all on Sunday, she'd missed no opportunity to show her contempt for him. Next week he had to take her assistant from the counter on his rounds, obviously to train the burly youth as a replacement for himself. Well, what are you going to do now, she demanded. Maybe I should go over to Sheffield and find out what's wrong. And how will you get there, may I ask? There's no bus on Wednesdays. I've been thinking for a while that what your job needs is someone who can drive. At least I can go down to the main road in case the van's broken down. And maybe he could hitch a lift and never come back. They'd be glad enough of him yesterday when he'd made his rounds instead of going up to the cave, but now they wanted to see the back of him. Maybe that was one prayer of theirs he could make sure was answered. The high street was crowded now, people going to work or to the shops or taking the children to school. Everyone was complaining about the weather. Which damned fool called this midsummer? Eustace heard someone say in a voice like Mr. Gloom's. He rushed himself past Phoebe Wainwright's street, past the thought of telling her he meant to leave or at least apologizing for having delivered the anonymous letter. He had a sudden panicky notion that whatever he'd said at the rally had been about her. He didn't want to think about that just now. He wanted to be out of Moonwell, out of the town's disapproval and the dark. Past the bookshop, which was lit but closed, the lamps gave out as the road climbed toward the ridge that overlooked the woods. He hoped that when he reached the ridge he could see sunlight on the horizon. As he made his way upward, keeping to the middle of the dim road, the tiers of street lamps fell away behind and below him, toward the playing field where the goalposts looked like matchsticks now. When he made the ridge, he couldn't help sighing. Behind him, the lights of Moonwell huddled together under the black sky. Around him, the dark extended as far as he could see. He couldn't even distinguish the sky from the edge of the moor. He was seized by a yearning to go back to Moonwell, where at least there was company, however reluctant. He was going to look pretty odd to any drivers on the main road, a hitchhiking postman in uniform. Maybe that was how he should go on stage give himself another chance where he might be appreciated. Maybe that's just what I've been looking for. But don't tell anyone, will you, he said loudly, the dark closing in his voice, and stepped down toward the woods. Two steps and the slope cut off the lights of Moonwell. There was only the dark and the trees, still as fossils. Masses of foliage hung silently over the road, which grew much darker as soon as it led into the woods. The sooner he was through the woods, the sooner he'd be on his way but he faltered to a standstill as he came abreast of the trees. He had to go on. The other road out of the peaks was miles beyond the town, across the moors. The woods were the same old woods, he told himself. The dark was only another sunless day in the peaks, even if unusually so. But the stillness of the woods made him struggle to breathe, and he could imagine how the road in there must sink into blind dark. What's up, he growled at himself, afraid of a few falls in the ditch? He lurched forward, but a shudder halted him. Nobody in his right mind would venture in there. Not without a flashlight, anyway. It wouldn't take him long to go back for one. He tried to ignore how relieved he felt as he turned away from the woods, told himself he was only in a hurry to get the flashlight. But he hadn't reached the top of the slope when he heard a car on the road. The dark disoriented him. At first he thought the car was coming through the woods. When the headlights appeared above him, he dodged hastily out of the way, forgetting to stick out his thumb. Nevertheless, the car jolted to a halt. Want a lift? the driver called. He was a man in his sixties with large ears, pouchy eyes, a few strands of gray combed over his skull in memory of his hair. His wife looked younger, jet black hair, dark eyes, and a face like china, but perhaps she wasn't. We saw you on stage at the pub, she said to Eustace, pushing the passenger seat forward so that he could climb in the back. We liked your act, didn't we, Craig? Definitely, the driver said with a reminiscent laugh. Hop in if you're bound for Sheffield. That'll do me. He ought at least to find out what was hindering the mail. He tripped over the woman's seat belt and almost ripped it out of its housing as he tried to disentangle himself. 
She and her husband watched with faint, encouraging smiles that seemed to say they appreciated his inventiveness, but would rather savor it under more appropriate circumstances. By the time he managed to tumble himself into the back, he felt like hiding under the seat. The car coasted forward under the cavernous arch of the oaks, and Eustace was disconcerted to find that he didn't feel much more at ease with venturing into the woods this way, trapped in the car his eyes straining to see beyond the headlight beams as they poked jerkily at the dark. As soon as the beams passed the mouth of the woods, the trees on either side of the opening seemed to lurch forward. The chill of the dark settled into the car, and he saw that the driver was shivering as he craned over the wheel, staring at the rising banks that constricted the road as it grew steeper. Suddenly the car skidded to a halt, slewed across the road. I can't go this way, the driver muttered. We'll take the other road. He turned his head to see where he was reversing, and Eustace was dismayed by the hint of panic in his eyes. The car bumped into the yielding bank at the side of the road. Grass and ferns scraped the paintwork, and then the car was screeching back the way they'd come. Though the car was going faster, it seemed to take longer to drive out of the woods than it had to come in. The car raced up to the ridge, Moonwell glimmering ahead. The driver dragged at the handbrake and leaned over the steering wheel, one shaky hand covering his eyes. I'm sorry I get like that sometimes. I thought I'd grown out of it. Sorry. Eventually, he straightened up, breathing deeply. You don't mind if we go the long way, do you? I'd like to get a newspaper to see what the weather's up to. His wife massaged his shoulders as he drove down into Moonwell. Eustace might have cracked a joke to cheer them up if he'd been able to think of one. He felt redundant and shyer than ever. At least the driver seemed happier once they reached the lit streets. He parked by the first news agents he saw and hurried in. Moments later he reappeared, frowning. I might as well not have bothered. No papers were delivered anywhere in town today. And nobody knows why. 29. There had been a moment when Craig thought they would never be out of the woods. He wouldn't be able to turn the car. He'd drive in search of a lay-by as the road grew steeper until the car went off the road in the dark, off a sheer edge, and they would be falling, falling. It had just been his old fear, he told himself as he went into the newsagents. It ought to leave him once he was out of this wretched local weather. The proprietor's pipe-stained smile faded as he watched Craig survey the counter. If it's a paper you want, you're out of luck. Buggers who deliver them are on strike, more than likely, only we can't check because the phones and radios don't work. We're used to freak weather around here, but never anything like this. So you don't know how long it's likely to continue, I imagine. All I can tell you is, if there's going to be a storm, the sooner we get it done with, the happier I'll be. Craig went back to the car and announced the news to Vera and the comedian dressed as a postman. Eustace, that was his name. Behind the wheel again, he switched on the radio in hope that he could prove the newsagent wrong. But when he tuned across the dial, there wasn't even static. Just a silence so hollow it felt capable of swallowing all sound. He drove past people gossiping in the light from shop fronts. The long, thin windows of the church shone through the trees. Beyond the chain of street lamps, Hazel's house was dark. Craig wondered what she was doing. Living her own life, that was all he needed to know so long as it was hers, and not just Benedict's. A few yards past the cottage, a sign indicated the end of the town's speed limit, a white disc crossed by a black bar like the pupil of a sheep's eye. The car climbed between ferns, still as photographs, to a ridge that overlooked the moors. Ahead, the road meandered over slopes so smudged by the dark that he couldn't tell which was grass, which heather. The thought that this was late morning of a midsummer day weighed on him, made him feel desperate to be out from under the dark sky that seemed almost to touch the moors. Never mind, Vera murmured, it can't go on forever, and at that moment he thought he saw the faintest glimmer several slopes ahead. He sent the car forward as fast as he dared, not least because the sight of the headlights finding nothing but the road made him feel the dark was closing in. Tussocks blazed at the edge of the ditch, a sheep stared with yellow eyes. The road sloped up. The car raced over the crest, and Craig braked. There was sunlight on the farthest slope. It was only a strip on the horizon, as if the curtain of dark had been lowered all but an inch. That thought made Craig feel microscopic under the enormous blackness. The edge of the far slope shone green as new wet grass, so luminous it appeared to start forward from the dark, beckoning him. 
That's what we're looking for, Eustace said, and coughed as though he'd spoken out of turn. It certainly is, Craig said, smiling at him in the mirror as the car gathered speed down the slope, past a sheep that was staring over the edge of the ditch, its chin resting on a tussock. The next upward slope was longer. He braked instinctively at the crest. For a moment, as the headlight beams jerked over the edge, he'd felt he was racing straight for an unfenced drop. The distant strip of light looked thinner. Never mind, it was only the edge of the sunlight, the promise of sunlit fields and roads and houses beyond the bleak, dark slopes. The splayed beams wobbled downward. Were they failing, or was there mist ahead? Certainly a chill was seeping into the car. He eased off the accelerator, and it seemed to take far too long for them to gain the top of the next slope, as if they were caught in a marsh of darkness. But when the car lurched over the rise and the moors opened around them— there was no sign of sunlight at all. Good night, Eustace muttered, presumably as a joke. Vera laughed, whether politely or nervously, Craig couldn't tell. Either this rise wasn't as high as the others, or the storm clouds, or whatever they were, had advanced a little farther, he told himself. He made himself press the pedal, though as soon as the car nosed downward, the headlight beams appeared to shrink. It wasn't missed, and he didn't think it was his vision. Best to drive as fast as he dared to recharge the battery. He would rather not get out of the car up here on the dark moors. Never mind that each jerk of the beams made him think he was driving off the road, over a sudden drop. He wasn't going that fast, not quite. The beams wavered up from the roadway and flashed the face of another sheep, peering over the edge of the roadside ditch. Vera stifled a cry. Surely it had only been the unexpectedness, Craig thought fiercely, hoping she hadn't noticed that the jaw was resting on the tarmac, the bulging yellow eyes not moving as the light swept across them. The sheep must have died in the ditch. The body must have been down there out of sight. The other sheep hadn't moved either, he remembered, and all he'd seen of it had been its head at the edge of the road. Maybe there was a killer dog loose on the moors, he shoved his foot down on the pedal and the headlight beam scooped at the bare road, then shot over the top. His whole body jolted and he dragged at the wheel, trod with all his weight on the brake. There was nothing beyond the crest of the road but dark. There must be. A road couldn't just stop in midair. It must be a sharp bend, unmarked or divested of its warning sign. He rolled his window down and craned out to look. Then he made himself open his door and lean his shaky body out into the hollow stillness, the chilly dark. He could still see nothing beyond the small lit patch of road and the dim tussocky banks on either side of it, but darkness that looked solid as black ice. He slammed the door and pressed himself against the driver's seat as if that would make the car more real, make his panic give way to reality. Perhaps if he switched off the headlights, they might be able to see what really lay ahead— he was reaching tremulously for the switch when Vera said in a pinched voice, You're running the battery down. Let's go back. He let the car coast backward down the slope at once, before he tried to turn it. He was dismayed to realize how welcome the excuse was that Vera had offered him. He glanced at her, then he looked over his shoulder while he reversed toward the ditch. As soon as he caught sight of Eustace, his panic flooded back. Eustace was as scared as Craig knew Vera was, as he was himself. This time it wasn't just his childhood fear that he was retreating from. Whatever was out there, they had seen it too. 30. Throughout that morning, Diana felt as if she hadn't woken up. However many lights she switched on in the cottage, it still seemed too dark. The lights could neither drive away the thoughts that had kept her awake half the night, nor clarify them. When she opened the front door, hoping that fresh air would clear her head, the darkness settled over her like a fall of dirty cobwebs. She went back to the percolator in case coffee might free her from her prickly stupor, her sense of being unable to organize her thoughts. The first black gulp seared her throat, but that was all. Perhaps she needed her yoga techniques to help her sleep. The trouble was that when she'd tried them in the early hours, she'd felt on the edge of something much larger than relaxation— much larger than the glimpses she'd had of man in the cave. Nathaniel Needham had hinted that he'd experienced visions, but could Diana be that Celtic just because of her ancestry? She felt in danger of coming face to face with something she dreaded without knowing what it was. The shrilling of the doorbell almost jerked the mug out of her hand. 
Jeremy Booth was outside, shading his eyes with one hand as if to ward off the dark. What do you think about this, then, he said, rolling his eyes to indicate the sky. I don't know what to think about it, Diana said, more certain every moment that she did. Time for a coffee? I've been drinking alone all morning. When she brought him a mug in the front room, he was gazing at the children's paintings, months old now. So what will you be doing when the summer's over, he said. She wished the question didn't seem so ominous. I still haven't decided. I want to see how the kids are. You don't mind staying, then. Somebody has to. We would if there were anything to stay for, Jeremy said, obviously feeling rebuked. But between ourselves, I don't like the way things have been affecting Geraldine. It was starting to get through to me as well. In what way? My youthful excesses catching up with me, I think. He gave a token laugh. My psychedelic past. I'd have thought it would have worked itself out of my system by now, but it must have been the pressures we've been under. I started to see things. Do you mind if I ask you what sorts of things? I'd rather not talk about it, Diana. He drained the mug and stood up. Don't think me rude if I scoot away. I don't like leaving her alone while it's like this. It's making her nervous. Were you here for a reason? Well, yes. Jerry tells me you'll be staying for a while, and we both admire you for it. If we leave you the key, would you mind keeping an eye on the shop? We're going up to Wales to look at some new premises. Now? Tomorrow, but I thought I'd better ask you now in case you'd rather not. There's nobody else if I don't, is there? To be honest, I don't think there is. Committing herself to staying on behalf of one more person hardly mattered. She'd already been singled out by her ability to see more than the townsfolk could, and there was no point in resenting having been chosen like that without being asked. Leave me an address where I can get in touch with you if I need to, she said. She watched him as far as the lamplit corner. The moors loomed above the town as if the black sky were solidifying. The massive blackness overhead took her breath away, made her body shudder with a frustrated urge to tear the blackness open. A line of Needham's song ran through her head and let the chill seep into her, but she was damned if she'd hide in her cottage. She grabbed a coat and made for the shops. Not blaming Godwin Mann for that as well, are you? The news agent growled when she wanted to know why there were no papers. She was tempted to say that she was, but she went out to the hotel instead. At least she wasn't totally alone in what she suspected. She had to know the worst, she told herself, before she could begin to plan. She was crossing the lobby to the reception desk when a beaming young woman headed her off. Godwin knows you want to see him. He'll come to you as soon as he can. Diana suppressed the nervousness that made her feel. Do you know someone called Delbert, a thin guy, Californian? Oh, yes, we all know Delbert. The smile didn't change, yet it suddenly looked smug. Did you want a word with him? If he's here, he'll be where he's lodging. He's been a bit excited since yesterday. Godwin thought he needed to stay with someone who could take care of him. So he's staying with Mr. and Mrs. Scragg. Surely the Scraggs wouldn't refuse Father O'Connell access to him. She left the lobby where the dark seemed to turn the ceiling into a void above the chandeliers and headed for the church. As she passed the school, the children were singing a hymn. The sound brought tears to her eyes, but at the same time it made her uneasy. Were they celebrating man's triumph or singing to make the darkness go away? People had halted under street lamps and were smiling toward the school— and Diana felt more outcast than ever. The lit church was deserted. The interior felt cold and stony. She couldn't help faltering as she came out of the porch. The graveyard, steeped in darkness, seemed larger. The gravestones looked like rocks sprouting jaggedly from the unkempt grass. The children's voices drifted to her along the high street, but the line from Needham's song was louder in her head, the night's in the sun, the voice repeated as she hurried across the road between the meager street lamps. Her footsteps sounded small and flat as she went up the path to the presbytery and rang the doorbell. Something thudded against the other side of the door, scratching at the wood, snarling. Of course, it was Kelly, the priest's Alsatian dog. She stepped forward from where she'd flinched back, heart lurching. No wonder the dog was on edge with the dark. Could Father O'Connell be asleep? The noise the dog was making should wake him. She glanced round in the hope of seeing him on his way to the church or the presbytery, and as she did so, she glimpsed a light on the moor. 
She ran to the gate for a clearer view, cupped a hand next to her eye to block off the glow of the street lamp. She was beginning to think she'd imagined the light out there when it flared again, nearer. It was a car. Surely it was coming from beyond the dark, which meant the dark had an end, and she could ask the driver where. She opened the gate and waited for the car. It swung into view at the top of the slope above the church and came racing down, too fast. When she stepped onto the pavement and waved urgently, the brake screeched. The car slewed across the road toward her. She dodged back into the presbytery garden as the tires scraped along the curb with a tearing sound and a stench of rubber, and then the passenger window was rolled down. What is it, Miss Kramer? Why did you want us? It was Eustace Gift. His small mouth under his large nose was screwed smaller, but he didn't mean her to laugh. Where have you just come from, Diana said. His eyes went blank. You'd better ask the driver. The driver, a balding man, climbed out of the car and rested his folded arms on the roof. Diana saw that his arms were trembling. I don't know where we got to, he muttered. A couple of miles or so. The road's blocked somehow. No way through. His companion, a woman with a delicate face, went round the car to him. It's something to do with this dark, she said defiantly. Blocked? How? Diana said, glancing at each of them in turn. Nobody seemed to want to answer. Eustace looked away from her as she glanced at him. You've left the door open, he said. Diana looked back. The presbytery door was ajar. The dog must have clawed it open, she realized. That's the priest's house, is it? I wouldn't mind a word with him, the driver said, and strode up the path. Be careful, Craig, his wife called, and ran after him, Diana at her heels. Eustace came up to them just as the driver eased the door open and dodged aside, pulling his wife with him. Careful, Eustace stammered. Look at its eyes. He meant the dog. It was cowering in the hall, glaring terrified out at the dark, its raw tongue lolling between its teeth. Come on, boy, Craig said, stepping forward minutely, and then the dog leaped past him, fled whimpering along the path as Diana shoved Eustace out of its way. She saw it clear the fence and race toward the moor and felt as if it had infected her with its panic. She made for the lit hall of the presbytery so as to be out of the dark. She was the first to see what the dog had done to Father O'Connell, but it was the driver's wife who began to scream. 31. When the hymn ended, Andrew went on singing by mistake. Some of the children giggled, not the ones who'd come to Moonwell just last month. Miss Ingham gave him a smile, the one that stayed on her face, whatever she was saying. Let's kneel down now and talk to God, she said. Andrew squeezed his eyes shut until they filled with swelling light and prayed as hard as he could, though not in the words she was using. He prayed so hard he ceased to feel the floorboards bruising his knees. He was praying that his father was cured now that Mr. Mann had made the cave into a holy place. Whatever was wrong with his father, it had something to do with the cave. He'd seen his father creeping up there in the moonlight— He'd felt his father growing tense when Mr. Mann went down the rope. His father must have been asking God to go down with him, to kill the giant or the devil that had hurt Andrew's parents the first time Mr. Mann had called everyone to the cave. If Andrew's mother hadn't spoken up that time, it wouldn't have singled out his father. But Mr. Mann had done what he'd been called to do and come back safe. He'd said so. The trouble was that since then Andrew's father had been more secretly nervous than ever. He mustn't be sure that the demon was dead. Maybe he was afraid to look over the edge of the cave to make sure, or afraid that someone would see him looking and want to know what he was doing. That was why Andrew had to go and look, to make sure it was a holy place now, so that he could tell his father. Please, God, he said, for everything to come right, and joined in as the crowded class said, Amen. God see you safely home, Miss Ingham said, which meant they could all go. Andrew thought of joining the others as they swarmed out, of inventing a reason on his way to the cave why he hadn't waited for her. But she was smiling at him, and the only way he could move was toward her big, wide face, her broad shoulders that made her look like a triangle balanced on thin legs. He still wished she were Miss Kramer. Don't forget to say your prayers before bedtime, she called after the children. Remember, God likes to look down and see you on your knees. 
I don't know how he can see anything with all this dark, Sally murmured to Jane. At least Andrew could ask the teacher one of the questions that were troubling him. As he followed her into the schoolyard, he said, The dark's the bad coming out of the cave, isn't it? Miss Singham smiled at him with a frown above her eyes. What do you mean, Andrew? Mr. Man killed the demon in the cave, didn't he? He did what God sent him here to do. Then is the dark all the bad coming out and going into the sky? Do you know? I think maybe it is. Her smile had turned generous. That's why God makes children like they are, because they can see more clearly than us sometimes, she said. And to him, and maybe people aren't praying hard enough. Tomorrow we'll all pray for a wind to blow the dark away. He hadn't quite meant that. Looking up at the black sky, which seemed lower and more solid every time he saw it, he wondered if it could really be that simple. Just a wind and all the cold, dark stillness that made the town feel like a ghost of itself would be swept away. He had a sudden sick feeling that her smile was meant to pretend that everything was all right, the way all the people he saw in the dark street seemed to be pretending. Now God had come into their lives, mustn't it be true and not a pretense? He wanted to believe that, and perhaps he could once he knew that his father was just his father again. His mother was at the shop, poking a brush at the dim corners of the ceiling. Has Andrew been good today? He's been a credit to you, Mrs. Bevan. The teacher took the orange comb that made Andrew think of a centipede out of her hair, which fell blackly over her shoulders as she dropped the comb into her canvas bag. If you give me the key, I'll take him home and start dinner. You needn't do so much for us, Miss Ingham, really. That's right, Andrew's father said, coming out from peering round the stockroom door. You've been working hard all day. We're glad to have you staying with us. You don't owe us anything. Think nothing of it. I love cooking when I'm using ingredients fresh as God made them. I really do believe it's a way of praising God. I hope it isn't a sin to open a can occasionally, Andrew's mother said, so sweetly that he winced. Oh, I'm sure God understands, the teacher said, smiling. I could show you some recipes one evening, if you'd like. Andrew looked nervously out of the window, for he felt as if they'd forgotten the dark. Maybe they preferred to behave like this so as to distract themselves, or didn't they even realize? He felt all the more nervous when he saw one of Mr. Man's helpers coming toward the shop. She was looking for Miss Ingham. The pop is going to show that video tonight, the one where Godwin's father plays the devil. You'd think they'd have something better to do, Andrew's father said loudly. Childish, that's all it is, just because they don't agree with Godwin. We want to make sure there'll be plenty of us there to show what we think of it, the woman with the cross on her front said. We'll tell some people to be there, shall we? Andrew's mother suggested. Andrew almost couldn't speak for eagerness. I will. His mother opened her mouth and glanced almost imperceptibly toward Miss Ingham. All right, seeing it's for God. Just tell the people in Roman Row and come straight back. Two streets, Andrew pleaded. She stared at him as if he were showing her up, and he was terrified she'd say he couldn't go at all, ruin his plan. Just roam and row and kill Lane, then, she said, in a voice that promised she'd have something to say to him later. But don't you dare cross the big road. Why was she anxious that he shouldn't cross the high street when there hadn't been any traffic along it for days, maybe longer? He ran out of the shop and round the corner into Roman Row and dashed from house to house. Every time a door opened, he was already on the next path and ringing the next doorbell. He called his message over the hedge or the fence and raced on. He'd rung Mrs. Wainwright's bell before he realized that she would hardly want to help Mr. Mann. He dodged next door, hoping she wouldn't appear, but her door wavered open as he rang the neighboring bell. Sorry, Mrs. Wainwright, he said, and gawked at her. She no longer just looked plump. She looked puffed up. Her cheeks were dragging her mouth down, or her body was. She peered at him as if she didn't know him in the dark, then turned away painfully, trailing the door shut behind her. He was still staring at it when the old woman whose door he'd rung poked him with a bony finger. Well, 
They're going to show a video tonight at the pub with Mr. Man's father in it, and I'm supposed to tell people who don't want them to. She pushed her lower lip over her mustache as if to show Andrew what she could do with no teeth. All right, my lad, you run along home. I'll give the street their marching orders. I'm supposed to tell them in Kill Lane, too. You leave them to me, she said, in a voice that warned him not to argue. Nothing was further from his mind. He thanked her, dashed back to the high street, and dodged into Kill Lane. In a minute, he'd run to the end of the terrace of cottages and was at the path to the moor. The light of the last street lamp didn't reach far up the path. He blinked at the looming sky and reminded himself that he was here for his father. He remembered treading on the eyeless lizard that day at the cave with Miss Kramer, remembered wishing his father could see him tread on it so that he'd know Andrew was starting to be a man. Now Andrew had to be more of one, had to let his father know there was nothing at the cave to be frightened of, nothing to make his father crazy as he'd looked the night he'd sneaked up to the cave. Andrew closed his eyes and prayed, and then he started upward. Once he was above the lamps, they showed him the edge of the path. He stayed well back as he clambered toward the unmoving sky. He felt as if it were pressing down on him, lowering itself spider-like to meet him. He grabbed the charred edge of the moor and hauled himself onto the moorland path. When he stumbled to his feet, he saw how alone he was. The ashen moors stretched around him, while below him the lights of Moonwell looked like matches stuck upright in the dark to smolder. He'd hoped to see cars on the Manchester Road, but it was out of sight beyond the woods. He felt as if the world had gone away, abandoned him on the dead moor. He was shivering, worse when he tried to stop. If it was dead, he told himself, it couldn't hurt him. All he had to do was look in the cave. How could he tell his father not to be frightened if he was scared himself? He took one faltering step along the path, a darker band through the sullen dimness that coated the slopes, and suddenly his shivering turned into running, just as uncontrollable. Heather crumbled underfoot with an unpleasant oily softness whenever he strayed from the path. He ran up the slope to the stone bowl and fell to his knees at the top. Ash crawled on his legs and scratched in his throat, made his mouth taste smoky. He rubbed his stinging eyes and peered down toward the cave. It looked just as it had since the wall had fallen in, except darker beneath the black sky. He couldn't make out more than a large dark blotch without depth at the center of the bowl— it didn't seem enough to tell his father. He had to go closer, look in. As soon as he stepped into the stony hollow, he felt he was going to slip. He sank to his knees again and began to crawl backward to the cave. As the top of the slope rose above him, the sky seemed to close down like a lid. Now he was afraid of crawling too far without noticing. He hitched himself round, trembling with the stony chill, and went down head first toward the cave. There was no sound except for the scrape of his toe caps on stone, the dragging of his body as he inched forward on his stomach. Near the cave, the slope grew steeper, too steep for him to cling to while he craned over the edge. He lurched to his feet and ran around the cave, a few feet from the edge, to where the slope was gentler and the cave went straight down. He threw himself on his stomach again, gasping and shivering, and shoved himself forward. Five shoves that bruised his chest and he was at the edge. He levered himself another few inches with his elbows and gripped the edge with both hands. Then he leaned over. There was nothing but dark below him, a dark that felt much closer than the sky and colder. He pushed himself forward a last inch to make certain. As his eyes adjusted, he made out the far wall of the cave, stretching down into blackness, it didn't feel especially like a holy place, but was he sure he knew what a holy place was supposed to feel like? Surely all that mattered was that it was empty, cleared of all the bad that filled the sky. He was raising himself on his elbows so as to inch backward when he thought he saw a movement in the cave. He craned out further, his elbows trembling with the strain. Perhaps it was just the way things sometimes seemed to move about in the dark when you couldn't see them properly. Then the movements clarified and separated, and he saw that there were three shapes, three insects crawling up the rock. 
Why should the sight of a few insects make him feel he couldn't breathe? His head was swimming by the time he realized that since the pale, thin shapes were crawling on the wall where it merged with the dark, they must really be larger than he was. He jerked forward with the shock of it and almost lost his balance. The rim of the cave cut into his hands as he saved himself barely in time. He was praying that he wasn't really seeing what was down there, but every second made them clearer. They were the color of the lizard he'd trodden on, the color of things that lived in the dark. They had long fingers they were using to climb the rock, slowly but relentlessly. Two of them were raising their smooth heads toward him in a way that made him think they had no eyes, while the one in the middle seemed to have no head. That was the sight that convulsed his body, threw him back from the edge so violently that he had no grip on the stone for a moment, almost slid down the slope and over the rim. He staggered dizzily to his feet and fled sobbing up the stone bowl. All the way along the charred path he kept glancing back in terror of seeing the pale shapes crawling after him over the dead slopes beneath the black sky. He fell several times on the path down from the moors. He had no idea how long he'd been up there how long his parents might have been waiting for him. He couldn't even tell them what he'd seen, or his mother would want to know why he'd gone up to the cave, and that would make his father worse. The cave wasn't holy. It wasn't even dead, unless the things he'd seen were breathing in it like maggots. All Mr. Man had done was drive them out. And where would they go now? He was terrified of blabbing all this to his parents because he couldn't stop himself. But when he fled along Kill Lane and into the shop, his parents weren't there. We have to stay here until your mummy and daddy come back, Miss Ingham told him. Something's happened at the priest's house, and they've gone to see if they can help. 32. Father O'Connell must have been trying to open the front door. His blood was on it and on the walls and carpet just inside the presbytery. Perhaps his dog had only leaped at him to stop him from opening the door. Perhaps she hadn't attacked him until he tried to fight her off, unless she'd been so maddened by the dark she had gone for him at once. He must have fled along the hall to grab the phone, presumably to use as a weapon, the way he was holding the receiver. If he hadn't, Diana thought with a clarity that threw the horror into sharper relief, the dog might not have come after him to finish him off. The driver's wife was digging her nails into her cheeks while she stared and screamed as if she would never stop. All right, Vera, come away now. Don't look any more, Craig said, putting his arm round his wife's shoulders as Diana coaxed her out of the presbytery, away from the sight of Father O'Connell, of the remains of his hand that had clung to his throat as he died, trying to hold his throat together. There's nothing we can do here, Craig murmured, and Diana felt more alone than ever. Vera balked as soon as she was out of the presbytery. She stared at the sky and began to shake, gripping her hands together. She was moaning now, small, distressed sounds. When Craig murmured, Let's get you to a doctor, she gazed at him with icy contempt. There's only one place in this town I want to go. I'll get the police, Eustace said hastily. He sidled past the onlookers who were gathering outside the gate, but the dressmaker who lived in his road stepped in front of him. Not so fast. What's up? she demanded. Eustace sidestepped. Father O'Connell's dead, he threw back. The woman nudged the gate open with her stomach. His dog turned on him, Diana explained, but the woman ignored her until she'd stepped into the presbytery and seen for herself. She swung round, looking grimmer. What's it got to do with you? I found him, Diana said, which was all she intended to say except to the police. She watched as people ventured up the path to the front door and recoiled, and she was thinking of forbidding anyone else to gawk, closing the door if she had to, when the police car drew up at the gate. The inspector had a long, bony face, a thin, silvery mustache, prim, almost invisible lips like an old woman's. He gestured the onlookers back from the gate with a single precise wave. Then he marched up the path, his head lowered slightly as if he was determined not to be distracted by the blackness overhead. Please wait here, he said in a quiet, clear voice to Diana and the elderly couple, and went into the house. The crowd was drifting back toward the gate, perhaps to be near the street lamp. Diana noticed Andrew's parents frowning at her. She turned her back on them as the inspector came out of the presbytery. Which of you found the body? Technically I did, Diana said. There was a murmur from the crowd, which he ignored. What do you mean, technically? 
I was the first person into the building. As soon as Father O'Connell's dog ran out, I went in to see what had happened to him. As you saw, he... He held up one hand almost negligently, as if she ought to be alert for his cues. How did you open the door? Why was she here at all, someone in the crowd? She thought it might be Andrew's mother, said loudly. She never even goes to church. Perhaps if a few of you had kept on going to his church. Diana shouldn't have responded. She was losing the control she'd been exerting over herself ever since she'd found Father O'Connell. How did we open the door, she said to the policeman. He must have been trying to open it when the dog attacked him. It wasn't locked. Are you saying it was wide open? No, I'm saying it was ajar, and we pushed it open when we couldn't get an answer, and that was when the dog ran off. Ran where? Up there, Diana said, glancing at the moors, which loomed closer as the black sky pressed down. As Postman Gift told me, he said, as though at least the confirmation was something he could approve of, and addressed the crowd. Please don't approach Father O'Connell's dog if you should see it. I have an officer searching for it now. To Diana, he said, I think you should tell me why the four of you were coming to see the priest. She felt as if the dark were hovering closer, in case she even thought of telling. Not here, she decided. Not now. We weren't coming to see him. I heard the dog, and it sounded as if something was wrong. I'm afraid I stepped straight in front of these people's car. It was my fault it skidded. Craig was beginning to confirm her story when Vera interrupted. It isn't that simple, she cried. It was the dark. The policeman raised his eyebrows. What was the dark? She seemed to swallow what she'd meant to say, perhaps because he looked suspicious of her, not recognizing her. It made the dog attack Father O'Connell, she stammered. The dog must have been driven mad to attack him. A priest? A funny kind of priest that preached against another man of God, someone in the crowd said, just loud enough to be heard. Maybe God wouldn't have let him die that way if he'd supported Godwin. Diana swung round, glaring at the crowd. Why don't you say what you really mean, that you think he deserved to die? He was a damn sight more tolerant than any of you and a lot closer to God if anyone is. Maybe that's why you're glad to see the last of him. Vera seemed to have thought better of swallowing her words. I didn't mean only the dog, she blurted out to the policeman. We've just come back from trying to drive home to Sheffield. We couldn't get past the dark. You mean you hadn't enough petrol? Vera clenched her fists. No, I don't mean anything of the kind. We came to a place on the road where there was nothing but dark. No way to the main road. We were cut off. The policeman glanced at Craig as if for sense. That was how it seemed to me, Craig admitted. And the phones don't work, Eustace put in. We're cut off that way, too. Please keep your voices down. I'll have to have all this looked into. The policeman's lips looked even primmer as if he were offended by the complications— he went to the gate to clear a path through the crowd as the town ambulance drew up. He wanted to believe that the dark was nothing more than a freak of the weather, Diana thought. What would it take to persuade him otherwise? And everyone else? She had a sudden terrible suspicion that something soon would. I feel as if nobody knows we're here, Vera said in a choky voice. Then she rallied. Come on, Craig. I don't want to stay here. Take me back to the hotel. I'll have to find someone to fix the tires, Craig said, as if defying any of his listeners to contradict him, and ushered her away as the stretcher-bearers went into the presbytery. Eustace stayed near Diana. Please let me know if you plan to leave town, in case I need to question you further, the policeman said to her, and she heard her unspoken cry trailing away in the dark inside her skull. I can't leave, don't you understand? None of us can leave. Thirty-three. All the way back to the shop, June was growing angrier. The nerve of that Kramer woman telling us we should have gone to church. Just what did they all want with Father O'Connell? Four of them without a crumb of faith among them. The police want to question them a bit more closely, if you ask me. Ryan murmured wordlessly and nodded as he loped along beside her. He didn't know if he agreed with her or not, but her being suspicious of someone else was an enormous relief. He might be able to think over what he'd done without feeling she was watching him. Her anger with Miss Kramer and the others was almost as much of a relief as the dark. He couldn't help it. He welcomed the dark. 
What he needed to do was go up on the moors and think. Maybe he could take Andrew for a walk up there. June wouldn't like it, but she wasn't so ready to disagree with him now that Miss Ingham was lodging with them. Once he was out in the dark, he wouldn't feel as if she were still watching him, as he'd felt ever since Godwin's rope had given way. Perhaps she thought Brian had stumbled forward at the cave because he was concerned for Godwin. Perhaps she was even ashamed of having been so suspicious of him lately. But that only made Brian feel worse. She'd reason enough to suspect him. Godwin's face had made that clear when the rope had given way. He hadn't just dreamed he'd disguised the faulty rope. He couldn't just have dreamed he'd crept up behind Godwin's watcher in the moonlight, though he didn't dare think why. He was even more afraid to wonder how much Godwin knew. He averted his face as they passed the hotel. At least the woman's screams at the presbytery hadn't brought Godwin out. Since yesterday, every footstep near the shop or the house had set Brian's heart lurching. Maybe he didn't need to feel like this. Maybe Godwin had forgiven him. He'd be able to think clearly once he took Andrew up on the moor. Andrew was crouching under the fluorescent tube inside the display window, his face pressed against the pane. When he saw his parents, he dodged back into the shop, bumping into a primus stove. You were told not to go in the window, June cried. Just because we've no customers at the moment doesn't mean we can afford to have things wrecked. I think he was anxious for you, Miss Singham intervened. You got a bit nervous when you were going round the houses, didn't you, Andrew? June took a loud breath and released it as a sigh. That's the last time you go out by yourself while it's dark, Andrew. I should have known you'd end up scaring yourself. I'm not sure it was quite as simple as that, the teacher murmured. Don't think me rude, Miss Ingham, June said sweetly, but I've known him a few years longer than you have. Andrew had shrunk back against the counter. What scared you, son, Brian said, taking pity on him. Did you think you saw something? The boy stared miserably at him, then looked away. There, you see, June said. He knows perfectly well he was just being silly. The best place for you is bed, my lad, so the grown-ups can talk. I'll start dinner, Miss Ingham said. I'll come with you. June turned to Brian as she reached the door. You might as well lock up. If anyone wants anything from the shop, they know where to find us. She was going with Miss Ingham to tell her about Father O'Connell. Brian wondered if he had time to take the boy up on the moor before he followed the women home, but he wouldn't be able to think while Andrew was in such a state. It's all right, son. No need to be frightened now, he said roughly. Daddy's here. Andrew blinked at him, then ran and hid his face on Brian's chest. Brian's hands wavered near the small, hard head. He wasn't quite able to stroke the boy's hair. Andrew was hugging him fiercely, yet Brian had the fleeting impression that he was doing so in order not to flinch from his father. It started his feverish nervousness crawling, as if his skin were coming alive in an unfamiliar way. Want to tell me what happened, now that the women aren't listening, he suggested. When the boy began to mumble, Brian made to push him away so as to hear, until he realized that Andrew was praying. Brian couldn't tell for whom. We'd better be on our way home if you've nothing to say to me, Brian said, embarrassed, and had to coax the boy out of the shop. All the way home, Andrew hung onto Brian's hand, more tightly between the street lamps. Whenever they passed a road that led to a path up to the moors, Brian felt him shiver. June was mutely angry when they arrived home. Once Andrew had picked at his vegetarian dinner and been bathed and put to bed, she spoke up. Do you know what we heard while you were bringing the boy home? They're still going to show that video. At first, Brian didn't understand what the new objection was. Oh, you mean even though... I mean, even after Father O'Connell died so horribly, they're going to watch their devilish film. They're saying Father O'Connell would want them to show it. He was going to see it himself. I don't believe for a moment that's true, but if it was, it's no wonder his dog went for him. We ought to go and show them we're on Godwin's side, Brian said. You and Miss Ingham go if you like. I'll have to stay with the boy. He won't even let me switch his bedroom light off. Someone needs to stay who won't stand for his nonsense. Could she be secretly jealous because Brian was going to the pub with the teacher? He hadn't thought much about Miss Ingham except to find her presence in the house inhibiting, but when she came downstairs wearing perfume and one of her long dresses, he found her unexpectedly pleasing. The way the dress kept hinting at her body warmed his groin. Call me Letty, she said, 
and he wondered if she might agree to a stroll after the pub. The one-armed soldier was packed with Godwin's followers. Brian bought Letty an orange juice, a pint of strong ale for himself. It's a treat to see you. I thought you were dead, Eric, the landlord remarked, in a voice that carried across the room. Brian muttered as neutrally as possible and joined Letty and her friends who were talking about how Godwin had been resting in his hotel room ever since he'd braved the cave. Letty's face was why he hadn't taken much notice of her before, he realized. Her large, plain face with its permanent smile. Put a bag over her head, he thought automatically, and was restraining himself from glancing at the outline of her thighs when the teetotalers began demanding to see the film. Whatever you think of it, keep your hands off it, Eric said, slipping the cassette into the player. And don't be shy about coming to the bar. The film was called The Devil's Well. Brian wondered if that had made Godwin think of Moonwell, though it was about an industrialist who drilled for oil where he'd been warned not to. Most of the swarthy actors didn't seem to be mouthing English. From the groans and the shaking of heads around him, Brian gathered that the industrialist was played by Godwin's father. The drill dug deep into the earth, and then oil filled the screen, except it wasn't oil. It was too black, too purposeful. The industrialist turned to the camera, grinning diabolically, and everyone around Brian began to sing a hymn as demons swarmed out of the gushing muck. The dripping demons that looked like men ripped the doors off houses and killed the townsfolk, pulled handfuls out of their throats, held them up screaming, and smashed them against walls. Father O'Connell mightn't have liked this, after all, Brian thought. He wasn't sure he liked it much himself, especially when the victims came back to life and went in search of the few survivors. He especially disliked the sight of a young woman dressed in a T-shirt and denim shorts, stumbling through the town in search of her husband, although she no longer had a head. He joined in the hymn so lustily that people glanced at him. His thoughts crowded the hymn out of his head. Of course. The young woman reminded him of the hiker who'd fallen down the cave, but the sight of the headless body on the move recalled to him how he'd felt as he'd watched the hiker on the moor. God help him, he was feeling that now. The spectacle of the headless body was jerking at his groin. He felt sick with self-loathing and at the same time almost uncontrollably excited. He tried to think of June but couldn't even see her face. Letty Ingham was closer and he tried to concentrate on her to distract himself from the flickering screen that was making his eyes seem to swell. He could imagine lifting her long dress, parting her thighs, thrusting himself into her. If it wasn't for that maddening, flat-faced smile of hers, suddenly he saw the teacher and himself lit by dazzling white light, his hands closing around her head, twisting it, lifting it clear of her shoulders. He had to struggle not to seize his rampant groin under the pub table. He sang louder, almost bawling. Demons and corpses overran the town, and Godwin's father grinned out through a repetition of the title. The audience began to clap in time with their hymn. As Eric pulled the cassette out of the player, he glared at Brian as if he'd let Eric down. Thank you, people said innocently to him as the pub emptied. Brian would have liked to stay for another drink. The pub felt like a refuge from the dark— except that he would feel bound to apologize to Eric, maybe to explain too much. He followed Letty Ingham, his penis shrinking from the chill and the dark. He couldn't help thinking how satisfying it would be to have the strength he'd glimpsed, dazzled by himself and the white light. It was only a fantasy, he told himself, but it made his skin feel unstable, too alive. He averted his face as he passed the hotel, and then he realized that he couldn't hide it from June. He had even more secrets to keep from her now. Thank God she was in bed, Andrew snuggling against her, where he must have pleaded to go. Brian crawled into Andrew's bed and wondered nervously how long it would be before he betrayed his secrets. He heard Letty humming a hymn downstairs, and all at once he knew that he had things the wrong way round. No wonder he felt like this when he'd somehow managed to forget what Godwin had told them all. There was only one way to get rid of his feelings, however painful it might be. Father O'Connell was gone, but he could still confess to Godwin Mann. 34. On her way home from the presbytery, Diana felt as if the dark had won. Perhaps she was exhausted, but she had the impression of shrinking as the dark grew larger, until she and the town meant nothing at all. 
She did mean something, she told herself fiercely, but what? Maybe she would know once she'd had a good night's sleep. Something rustled on the hall floor as she unlocked the door of her cottage. Two pieces of paper. They were paintings which she recognized even before she read the children's names on them. Sally's painting showed climbers on a mountain, stick figures with beaky noses, heads the size of dimes. Jane's was of a carnival in which all the rides had to be crammed into the space left by her carousel. Both of them were paintings Diana had put up on the classroom wall. Their teacher must have given the children their paintings to take home, because it was nearly time for the summer vacation, however it looked. Diana imagined the two girls discussing what to do, Sally fiddling with her patched spectacles, Jane agreeing solemnly that they should post the paintings through Diana's letterbox. She felt like weeping. They hadn't forgotten her, but she had nearly forgotten them. No, you don't, damn you, she hissed at the dark. She made black coffee and drank it as hot as she could, walking back and forth through the cottage to try to wake herself up. When she went out, she still felt as if she hadn't wakened, as if she needed to waken so as to understand what she could do about the dark. Finding out from man what had happened at the cave must be a first step, she told herself. At least now she had an excuse to go into the hotel. The large, dim lobby under the dusty chandeliers was a relief after the streets, the dark lurking between the street lamps leading to the sunless moors. She went to the reception desk where the manager stood looking harassed, his oval forehead gleaming through what remained of his red hair. Are the couple who were in a car accident here just now? Craig and Vera, somebody? Mr. and Mrs. Wilde. He glanced about for a receptionist, then peered at the board where the keys hung. Yes, they're here. Three-fifteen. I'll go up, shall I? You may as well, he said, sweeping back his sparse hair with both hands in a despairing gesture. Top floor. When she stepped into the elevator, the doors closed, but she had to press the button twice before the lobby fell away. The elevator faltered at each level, giving her a view of deserted corridors through the small square window. At the top, the doors staggered open with a muffled squeaking. Either the central heating didn't reach up here, or it was turned off. Perhaps it was the chilly stillness that put her in mind of a cave, for the gloomy floor with its eighteen bedrooms felt larger than it should. She went quickly along the right-hand corridor and knocked on the door of 315. Craig opened the door and smiled rather shakily at her. Miss Kramer, it's good of you to look in. If you're blaming yourself for the accident, please don't. It was entirely my fault. Me and my neuroses. I thought you showed a whole lot of presence of mind. Is your wife okay now? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. Please do come in and say hello to her. We're just making coffee if you'd like some. Vera turned from staring at the electric kettle as if at some vitally important task. Miss Kramer, I don't know what you must think of me after all that fuss I made. I might have behaved that way if I'd been through all you'd been through, Diana said, probing gently. Oh, I think we just let this dark get on top of us, Vera said with an awkward laugh. I don't like it. I won't pretend I do, but that's no excuse for my carrying on that way, as if that poor policeman hadn't enough to do. I don't mind telling you, Miss Kramer, I'm ashamed of myself. We managed to find someone to fix the tires, Craig said. The car should be ready tomorrow. I hope this wretched weather will have improved by then. I thought, Diana said carefully, you thought the dark wasn't just bad weather. She was speaking to both of them, and it was Vera who responded. I told you I was ashamed, Miss Kramer. I'm not as young as you, you know. Finding that poor man's body preyed on my nerves, that's all. But you talked about the dark before you saw him, Diana thought. It was no use. She would only disturb them if she persisted. The kettle began to steam, and she stood up. Won't you have coffee, Vera said plaintively. Thanks, but I have to speak with Godwin Mann. I don't suppose you know which room he's in. Yes, I'll show you. Craig let her out of the room and pointed down the corridor. She was moving away when he cleared his throat. Our daughter Hazel was telling us you've been ousted from your job because of differences over religion. If you should feel in need of a bit of free legal advice, please don't hesitate to contact us, he murmured, and closed the door. Diana felt both touched and dismayed. 
He was talking as if life were going on as it always had, or as if pretending would make it so. Man's wasn't the only unquestioning faith, but it was man's that had caused whatever was happening to Moonwell, and now she must see what had happened to him. She started along the corridor, away from the elevator and the stairs. Craig had pointed to the room at the end, next to the bathroom. What could be more banal? Never mind that the shaded wall lamp seemed small and fewer than she would have liked. Never mind that the low corridor felt colder and more largely empty as she ventured forward. But she would have welcomed a sound or two in the total stillness. She couldn't even hear Craig and Vera, though surely they'd be talking. She resisted a crazy urge to stamp her feet on the faded brownish carpet to have at least some noise for company. She stopped in front of the door to 318. She was raising one hand to rap at a panel when her gaze wandered to the foot of the door. Whatever light man was using in there, it was unpleasantly white. Her hand was inches from the panel when she heard man's voice in the room, gentle yet penetrating, if rather forced. Don't worry, Miss Kramer. I haven't forgotten you. I'll be coming to you soon. I'm looking forward to meeting you face to face. She found she was backing away from the door as she stared at it, realizing that there was no spy hole, no way he could have seen her. She turned and walked very fast to the stairs. If she'd run, she would have lost all control. She was through the lobby, past dozens of man's aimless followers, and out of the hotel before she remembered that the elderly couple were still up on that floor. She couldn't go back now. Perhaps they would be able to leave tomorrow, allowed to leave since they were determined not to notice what was happening. No, she couldn't let them go into the dark unless the police who were investigating it managed to get through and come back. Just now it was more urgent to make sure that Jeremy and Geraldine didn't leave tomorrow unless it was safe. She ran from street lamp to street lamp, faster when she came in sight of the bookshop. She hammered on the door, but it was no use. Through a newly broken window, she could see that the shop was unlit, deserted. The van had gone already, and so had the boots.